Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jeff Dean, the head
Good morning. My name is Yifeng Guo, and I host a video series on YouTube called AI Adventures, where we explore the art, science, and tools of machine learning. I wanted to bring a little piece of that here today in person. So let's go on an AI adventure together. For the purposes of this, for the purposes of this session, Let's start with just a short definition of machine learning and use that to build up kind of a workflow and get into the tools. We'll then use that today to help us see how we can solve machine learning problems and see how we can use that to apply to your problems uh, outside of I.O. And so we'll say that machine learning is programming with data. And we'll use that data to create a system or model which is trained to do some task. And we train this model, very importantly, using data. And so everything comes back to the data. So that's really the first step of machine learning, gathering your data. It all centers and starts from there. Next, there's typically some kind of preparation needed of that data. The raw data is often uh, not so suitable for use. And so we need to prepare it a little before it's ready for your machine learning. Third, we'll need to choose a model we want to use, then train it up and evaluate its performance. Do some fine tuning, and finally, make those predictions, do those tasks. So we'll go through each of these seven steps in detail uh, over the course of this session. So first, let's see what question we are trying to use our model to address in the first place. We'll walk through kind of a simple example data set and go through these seven steps using the task to categorize some data about animals. OK? We're going to say, what kind of animal is this based on some input data? Is it a bird? Is it a mammal? Is it a reptile, fish, or amphibian, a bug, or an invertebrate? One of these seven types. And it will be based on a variety of different kind of stats about a given animal. So our model will take in this data, this structured data, and use that to try to make a prediction, one of these seven types of animals. Now that we know what kind of situation we're modeling, let's dive into each of these steps in more detail. First up is gathering data. Just because we know what problem we are trying to solve for doesn't always mean that we have the data needed to solve it. And without data, your model is going nowhere. So ask yourself this. Where does my data live? And in what format? And how can I get to it? These are oftentimes the early stumbling blocks as we kind of try to use data to solve and address our problems. And perhaps you're actually in a situation where you don't have all the data you need. You need to collect your own data. This is also a common use case. And you can get creative in solving this problem by building some systems for data collection. Perhaps you make it a game. <clears throat> One really interesting example of this is QuickDraw. QuickDraw is an online game that lets you draw a specific picture and tries to predict what you're drawing. So it tells you, draw a basketball or draw a boat. And you know, it's, it's kind of fun. People like it. And as a result, the game has generated over 1 billion doodles of hand-drawn images from around the world. And this data set is open sourced on GitHub. And there's actually an AI Adventures episode that we just put out if you want to learn more about using this data set and playing with that. But back to our steps. We've gathered our data. What's next? Well, we've got to prepare that data. Data preparation could be its own separate talk entirely. So we'll just touch on a few aspects here. Exploring your data before you do any kind of machine learning can really help you understand your data better. And this is fundamental because it gives you this intuition about your data set and can save you a ton of time and headache later on in the process. And so I really encourage folks to clean their data, to look at the data and kind of get some intuition about it. 
It helps you identify gaps, and you'll learn a lot about what you're working with along the way. And maybe you'll find that you actually need more data, or that certain pieces of data you collected weren't actually so useful after all. One tool I like to play with to do this is called Facets. We'll take a little brief detour and talk about that. Facets is an open source data visualization tool from Google Research, and it can help you give a better, get a better sense of your data distribution. And yes, there are lots of tools that enable you to do very similar things. You can write out commands and call functions, but this one kind of puts it all in one place. And because it's a UI, you won't forget to compute a particular statistic or look into some corner of the data, because it's all computed for you. It just shows up. And so you can just kind of browse it. And so here we can see facets apply to our data set of these animals from the zoo. And most of them are kind of ones and zero data sets of does it breathe, does it have a tail, does it have feathers, things like that. And so that's why we see this kind of funny distribution on zero to one. But a lot of times with numerical distributions, you'll see something far more interesting. Now let's move on to our third step of machine learning, choosing a model. And we'll discuss a little bit about model selection, how we might go about doing this using the least effort possible. And for first, let's build some intuition around what is happening when a machine learning model is working well. So here we see how the model is trying to divide up a region. Right? We're trying to say which side is blue, which side is orange, to match the data, which are the dots. So it's not the hardest example in the world, right? Everything's already kind of separated forever, so uh, separated out. But let's look at something a little more interesting. Here we see the model struggle for a little bit as it tries to find a way to draw that enclosing circle around the blue dots. And it's really neat to see that these tools are available to you today, which are sophisticated enough to handle all of the minutia for you. So you don't really need to worry about the details of how it's getting about it. It's just a matter of, is it? achieving the task. But it is fun to see. And different models can model different kinds of data and different degrees of complexity. So that's what model selection is really about. It's about seeing what model is the right fit for your particular data set and the particular problem you're trying to solve. Now, concretely, what we're going to do is use TensorFlow to achieve this, right? So there's lots of talks about TensorFlow here at I.O. this year, so I won't rehash those bits. Um, but we'll see an example, perhaps, of what it might look like to use TensorFlow to kind of do model selection, to, to actually write that code, especially if you haven't had too much hands-on experience with TensorFlow. Uh, this may be kind of a useful look at just how accessible it can be. So this is an example of a linear classifier. It's similar to the first animation we saw. It's good for kind of drawing a linear uh, line between two kind of spaces. And we can see that it's pretty straightforward. But what if we had more complex data, right? This one-line call, well, it kind of stays a one-line call when you try to uh, try it out on a different model. So we're going to replace this with a deep neural network. But it, and it only takes a few small tweaks. And in this case, we just have to add one additional argument called hidden units. This defines the structure of our network. In this case, we have three layers with 30, 20, and 10 neurons in them. And so all we needed to do is literally just change the name, just replace that text, and add one argument. You don't have to replumb your entire system. You don't have to delete everything and start from scratch. So that's really neat. And it's similar for other models you can try. A lot of them just involve one flip of the model uh, of the method call. And you can basically play around with these different uh, menu of choices. And so in that paradigm, it allows you to not have to commit to a model kind of beforehand. You can try one out, see how it does, and then come back. So these seven steps, you, know, you work through, and you can iterate back. You can always go back and cycle through. And so that brings us to our next step. We've gathered our data. We've prepared it. We've chosen a model, for now at least. And now we can do the training. Training gets a lot of attention, because in some ways, that's where the magic happens. But in practice, it's often very straightforward. You just let it run, and you wait. So let's take a look at what happens during the training, and then we can see it in code. Conceptually, when training a model, we pass in our data, 
And we ask the model right away to try to make a prediction. But the prediction will be pretty bad because our model is initialized randomly. But we make this prediction, and we take it and compare it to the true answer, the correct answer that we know. And we use that information to update the model. And so each time we go through and update the model with a new piece of data as it works its way through the training set, it allows the model to get better and better over time with each training loop. And so that's kind of what the training process looks like. But in practice, when you actually need to code it up, we take our function, we created the model, and we just call dot train on it. It's literally one line. You just need to provide it a function that gives it the training data inputs, and that's it. It's one line. And so once the training completes, you run this function, you go off, and you grab a sandwich, and you come back, and it's time to do evaluation. It's, we got to evaluate our model it's to see how accurate it is, see if it's doing a good job of performing its primary task. So we can show it some examples of things that we know the correct answers to. And the model did not see those questions in training. It didn't see that data in training. So we use this evaluation data that we set aside to measure the performance of our model. And conceptually, it looks very similar to training, right? It's still this same shape. But the important difference is that there's no arrow at the top. It's not a closed loop. The model does not get updated once we check its prediction results. And so if we did update the model, then it would be no different than training. And we'd be essentially cheating, right? So the evaluation data is kind of precious in that way. We don't use it to update the model. We hold it aside, and we reserve it for evaluating the performance of our model. In code, it's just as simple as everything else we've seen. We just call dot evaluate. You want to evaluate? You call dot evaluate. And notice that we are passing in evaluation data, right? I say eval input function. So it's not the training data. And if we were using the training data, let's say we copied that line down, we just swapped out train for evaluate, and we forgot to change the data source. Now we're evaluating the performance of our model using the training data. And that would be a big mistake, because the model has optimized itself for the training data. And so if you evaluate using that same data, what happens is you misrepresent the true performance of your model and it will likely perform poorly on real-world data once you deploy it, since it's never seen and you never measured how it does with previously unseen data. So this brings us to our next point. How can we actually improve our model then? We ran the training. We did this thing. We ran the evaluation. Now what? Do we run training some more? How can we tweak it further? We could always swap out for a new model. But what if we decided on this model, but we want to improve it as is? This is where hyperparameter tuning comes in. These models have parameters of their own. But what values should we use? And how do we pick them? Much like how you can try out different models, you can also try out lots of different model parameters. This process, called hyperparameter tuning, in some ways still remains an active area of research. But that doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of it. Conceptually, we take our training. And instead of just training one model, we'll tweak that model and create a couple of different variants. And so we'll run training on different variants of the same underlying model, but with different model parameters, and see how that affects our accuracy. So we'll train and evaluate all of these different variants of the same or similar models and then see which one performs best. That's how it informs our parameter choice. But you see, a lot of that is experimental. You've got to try them to see what works. So you might have to break out your for loop. And so yeah, the task of choosing good hyperparameters is something perhaps you've intuited this. You could probably turn into a machine learning problem itself, right? optimizing the parameters for the model that you're using for machine learning. But we'll have to save that for another talk. All right, so we've gathered our data. We've prepared it. 
chosen a model and trained it, evaluated the data, and we tuned the hyperparameters. At long last, we have reached our last step, making those predictions. This is the whole point of training up a model in the first place, right? It wasn't just to get a really good accuracy or to create heat on our server. It was to actually do something useful with it. And so making predictions, we take the model, and we deploy it somewhere, or we kind of isolate it out, and we can show the model some data that it hasn't been trained on, and then see what kind of outputs predicts. And so that's our seven steps, right? Conceptual seven steps of machine learning. But let's see what it actually looks like in practice, right? We'll turn to the tooling side of the things and look at what you use beyond just TensorFlow and how you might actually achieve these seven steps. So we're going to go and look at some code. And in particular, we'll, I'll feature a couple of tools we'll get hands on with, and I'll point you to some additional resources as well. First up is a tool called CodeLab. If you've ever worked with any sort of notebook environment or a, a REPL uh, on the web before, this is basically a way to run Python in the browser, but not just run Python. It's a whole notebook environment. You can put markdown. The code actually executes. And because it's hosted essentially on Google Drive, you can share it with other people. So let's switch over to the demo. And I can show you what it looks like to use CoLab. So here we see you know, I've loaded up CoLab. And we can run uh, various commands, right? All, all the things that we would expect. So let's see. We're still connected. And in CoLab, because it's a notebook environment, you have to upload your own files. And it connects to the internet, so you can also authenticate and pull things down. But in my case, I have our data set loaded on the machine. And so we can download that. And I've got pandas loaded here, so we can take a look at our data set. You know, as promised, it's a bunch of animals and a bunch of statistics. And at the very end, there is a class type. And so CoLab you know, really lets you just execute the code on the screen in, uh, well, in real time. And moreover, because it's all hosted on Google Drive, I don't have to spin up any machines in the background. It just works seamlessly. And you can put comments in and share your work with others and um, make There we go. And do collaborative research or just work in general. So that's really neat. And so let's see. I think we have some time. So let's actually walk through a little bit of kind of what I've ended up doing here. We took our data. And what I'm doing is shuffling it and then splitting the data. So we had a whole data set, right? This, <laughs> this whole data set happens to just be 101 different animals. So it's probably the smallest data set that uh, I've probably come across. But you still need to do the same types of best practices. In this case, I've taken it and split it into training and evaluation data. Because if I use all 101 to do training, what am I going to do to evaluate my model? So we'll split it. In this case, I chose a fraction of 60% and 40%, but that ratio can be adjusted. And so we can see we have our training data, all 60 values. And then we have our evaluation data below. And I do a little bit of pre-processing. So this is the processing your data bit. Uh, notably, the last column of the data set is the label. It is the answer, one through seven, of what the correct type of animal it is, reptile, amphibian, mammal, et cetera. The problem is the labels go from one to seven, and I need them to be zero through six in this particular case. So I just shift it by one by subtracting one, and, and that's it. So pretty simple pre-processing. I would expect that a bigger data set perhaps would do more things. And so we can see that our data, apparently I didn't make this run, run, always run your code. And our input function here is pretty straightforward. It takes our raw data. And if we want it to be shuffled, we can call shuffle on our data set. And I just let it repeat and batch into chunks as needed. And so this will just feed right into um, the training. I believe there was a talk about 
data sets specifically uh, earlier at I.O. So if you missed that, you can catch the recording or roll back the live stream. So we have our data set, our, our input function. And I think I forgot to run this cell again. And this is a little cell I have here to just kind of try out my input function to make sure it's working. Always good to test things. And so we can see that my input function is indeed returning all the data of each type, so the feathers, whether it has eggs, whether it's airborne, does it have a backbone, things like that. And so each kind of these arrays represent a batch of data. And I was also playing around with this to check out the unique values for each column just to make sure like most of them are ones and zeros. But there's a couple here that are a little bit strange. For example, there are animals with five legs, apparently. So not all data sets are perfect. And TensorFlow uses this notion of feature columns to represent the incoming data. Models are pretty generic. And so by using feature columns, it allows you to customize it for your particular data set. In our case, I just loop over all the, data, all the columns, all 17 of them, which happen to be numeric, and set that as numeric. So it's really just a configuration to let TensorFlow know how many columns and of what type are coming in. So we'll run that. And if things break, it's because I forgot to run the cell. So yell at me if that happens. And so here's that line that we saw before right? with the creating a model. So here we'll create a linear classifier and pull in those feature columns and say that there are seven different classes, seven different possible values for the animals. And I've combined the train and eval we have train and evaluate calls into a function just for convenience so that they both run together. I want to run the training on the training data, and I want to run the evaluation on the evaluation data. So wrapping this together helps make sure you don't introduce bugs as you rerun cells uh, as you go along. So let's say we run the linear model, and we just let that churn. And so this is all backed by Google servers, and apparently it is taking its sweet time. Um, while it's doing that, well, this one's done. So we got 90%, which is like, OK, right? There was only 100 rows. We took 60 of them for training and used 40 for evaluation. So it's not the most reliable metric. The idea here is that the tooling is there, the code is there. You should replace this with your own data, which will be much better than this data set, and get awesome results. So as promised, uh, the deep neural network is very similar. It's literally the same as before, but I replace it with hidden units. Uh, I guess there is one notable difference, is that I do take the old feature columns that we had from before, and we wrap it in an indicator column. So that's just a space uh, to put the linear networks data into a way that the deep neural network can represent. So it's a little bit out of scope for this talk, but it's, a, it's an adjustment just for deep neural networks that linear networks don't have to deal with. So we'll let that get created. Whoops, just created a new cell. So I guess that's also a, a good thing to, to show off here. So we can very easily create you know, code blocks and cell blocks in between. And you can have all sorts of uh, great editing kind of abilities here. And you can turn it into markdown. You execute the, the cell, and it'll, it'll be there. So with the deep network, I forget if I ran this. Maybe we'll run it again. <laughs> we can also imp like push the model further. right? The percentages here are sometimes wonky because, they are, um, because there's only 40 values in the evaluation data. This is effectively you know, something over 40 <laughs> is getting it right, and then the other ones are wrong. So in this case, it looks like that 10%, probably about four are wrong, or three or four are incorrect. So let's make some predictions and, and see what got uh, missed. TensorFlow also has a dot .predict function, just like it had dot .train and dot .evaluate. And so you can pass in. I just took the evaluation data and sliced out a couple of examples to take a look at. So we can see you know, here that when we do that, you get um, you know, the prediction and the correct answer. So in this case, those five that I arbitrarily chose happened to work out. But what if we wanted to see the exact ones that we got wrong? So this was a little experiment I ran uh, just because I was curious, you know, which ones were the linear network getting wrong and which ones were the deep network getting wrong? Uh, in this case, 
they're, they're different, right? They got the same number of incorrect uh, predictions. They all had four wrong, but they're actually different examples. And so this would be an opportunity to dig in further and play around with that. The uh, one final thing I'll add here is that Colab or Collaboratory has a GPU support. And so you can toggle on a GPU. So if you have big data sets and uh, big fancy models and you want to access that sort of stuff, go and get that GPU. And so let's switch back to the slides briefly and take a look at another tool. Aside from Colab, there is another um, tool that we have that's very similar. It's also notebook-based. And you might have heard of it. It's called Kaggle. And while Kaggle is most known for its competitions or discussion forums and data sets, it also has a feature called kernels. And kernels is really just a fancy name for notebook. And the kernels look something like this. This might start to look familiar from Colab, except it's blue. And Co kernels is different in a couple of subtle ways. Uh, firstly, I want to let's just switch over to the, the demo for Kaggle kernels, and we'll see uh, what that looks like. How is that? So I took the notebook that we had earlier in Colab, and I downloaded the uh, notebook itself as an IPython notebook file. And since Kaggle has data sets, we, we actually have a um, zoo animal classification data set. How convenient that I chose the exact uh, data set that already exists on Kaggle, right? And so we can click New Kernel. And I'm going to choose Notebook. And Kaggle kernels not only run in Python, but you can also choose to run them in R for those of you who prefer R. And what I can do is I can actually upload a notebook. Of, well, first I need to download that notebook. So let's do that. So from Colab, we will download. This is what I get for zooming in a lot. Uh, download the notebook. And then once it's downloaded, we can upload that notebook back into Kaggle kernels. And so boom, we have that same notebook now in kernels. There is one small tweak. Because we had to upload a file for, uh, from the local drive uh, for Colab, we're going to get rid of that. And the only other tweak is that in Kaggle kernels, the data lives in one directory up called input. And so if I run the first cell, and then we'll work our way down, we'll see that the data lives in input, and it's the same kind of thing. And since we already saw the rest of the notebook, it's literally uh, the same thing. What is interesting, though, is that in the kernels, we can let's see. Let's give it a name. And we can commit that notebook. And what Kaggle Kernels does is it will run your notebook in a new, fresh environment, separate from the session that you're in. This will generate a notebook with all of the outputs that we've been seeing in a kind of nice view-only format, which is really useful for sharing. Because what if you want to share your notebook as well as how it was executed to others? You want reproducible notebooks. And so that's kind of what we see here. So we, we ran the notebook. It's done. And we can view that snapshot. And so it's kind of like a GitHub model of like you can commit versions of your notebook. And so by default, your notebooks are private. And we can see here that things ran. The outputs are shown. And I didn't have to go through and run these one by one. Right? And if I ran these cells out of order manually earlier to yield my results, Running them top to bottom like this will help catch those kinds of bugs that would help would uh, make it hard to reproduce my uh, performance down the road when I come back to this next week or next month. And if you share your notebooks, you can then fork them. Uh, you can fork them. You can also get others to fork your notebooks, as well as uh, add collaborators to your notebooks. You can add users to join you on the same notebook rather than just forking them. So there's a lot of great collaboration models across Colab and Kaggle, depending on your particular use case. And I guess it would be good to also just briefly mention that, like Colab, we can um, also enable GPUs in Kaggle kernels as well. So don't let that be a deciding factor for you. 
So that's Kaggle kernels. Let's switch back over to the slides and talk about just a few other little kind of tools and tips and tricks uh, before we kind of wrap things up. And if we could switch back to the slides, awesome. So let's say you don't want notebooks. Let's say you tried notebooks and they just weren't for you, or you have a bigger workload. You need to run a long running job, right? It's got to run for hours. Or you have a really big data set and it doesn't fit in Kaggle kernels or it doesn't fit on your local directory, so you're not going to upload it to Drive manually. Then you can use something like Cloud Machine Learning Engine, where you can kick off a job to run a long running job that maybe runs across a set of distributed machines, all of them potentially with GPUs attached. And once you're done, you might want to serve your model. right? You want to make those predictions. But perhaps you want to do it at scale. You're building an app, you train a model, and you want to create a REST endpoint that can serve predictions to the world. And so Machine Learning Engine also includes an auto-scaling prediction service. You can literally just take your TensorFlow model, give it a name, and be done. Literally point to the file and give it a name. There, there aren't any other steps, because there, you can't do anything else in terms of creating a model to serve, which is really neat. And if you're working with things like scikit-learn or XGBoost and you want to serve those as well, we'll take those too. And so then you don't have to deal with the ops aspect of machine learning. You can just play with your data, tweak your model, train it, and deploy with ease. And I think most, not most, but many of you uh, are also perhaps aware of the machine learning uh, APIs that are also available. These are pre-trained APIs for doing various tasks. They're a little more canned, right? You don't provide your own data, but it does mean that everything just works out of the box. You need something, you need a picture to be turned into a description. You need audio to be turned into text. It just works. And so that's kind of nice. But the limitations, of course, are that you can't customize it for your specific use case. That is still something we'll, you'll have to just wait a little bit longer for, uh, with the one notable exception of vision. So the um, AutoML vision is available right now in alpha, and so you can apply for that and supply your own data sets to train and customize your own vision API. So that's kind of like a neat side tangent. The animations that we saw earlier that I uh, showed with the orange and blue dots came from the TensorFlow Playground. So if you want to play around with uh, a neural network in your browser and just like toggle things on and off and just mess around, head over to playground.tensorflow.org, and you can do that right there. And don't worry, you can't break it. It's just your browser. You can only break your own machine. <laughs> and so what's next? The code that we just saw is I made it public. It's on Kaggle. So it's at kaggle.com slash yufangg slash zoo demo. If you want to learn more about TensorFlow, head on over to tensorflow.org. And thirdly, there's a machine learning crash course that Google released recently. And so if you want to learn, really dive into the concepts of machine learning, go further than what we've talked about here today, head over there. There's basically a whole curriculum of uh, videos and kind of assignments that you can do and really build up your machine learning knowledge. And finally, if you're interested in doing machine learning in the cloud, you can head over to the cloud dome, uh, the white tent next to the Google Assistant dome, and, or head on over to cloud.google.com slash machine learning, or slash ML. As I mentioned at the beginning, I host a video series by the same name as this session, AI Adventures. We explore some interesting nugget in each episode of, about machine learning and try to do some hands-on demos once in a while and do some interviews with uh, interesting folks. So hopefully, you'll check it out and subscribe. So I want to thank you for joining me in this session. And we really, you know, I really appreciate you know, feedback on the session, the information. So please head on over to the schedule, and you can log in and uh, give some feedback. So thanks a lot. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session. 
If you've registered for the next session in this room, we ask that you please clear the room and return via the registration line outside. Thank you. It's our third and final day of our Developer Festival. Now there are still so many great sessions and sandbox demos ahead, so let's get to it. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to talk more about new capabilities we're releasing, as well as the improvements we're making to the platforms and tools you use every day. Today, we are excited to announce the new app model for Android. Using the Android App Bundle, a new publishing format, you can dramatically reduce app size. We're announcing Android Jetpack, the next generation of Android APIs to accelerate Android development. Jetpack is a set of libraries and tools. Jetpack's APIs are integrated with the IDE2. For instance, Android Studio now includes a navigation editor, which works with the library. You told us, work on emulator boot time. Ready? Set, go. I was not cheating. It was not running in the background. Slices are a cool new way to drive re-engagement. We wanted these to be easy to build. So you'll find templates that are rich and flexible. And because it's Jetpack, slices work on 95% of devices. And starting today, you can deeply customize the appearance of your action. First, we're making it even easier for you to promote your action with something new we call action links. Right there at the bottom, these are hyperlinks that you can use from anywhere that point directly into your action. Once users opt in, action notifications gives you a way to connect with them about new features and content. These notifications work on the phone even if users don't have your Android app installed and you'll be able to re-engage with your users on speakers, smart displays, and other assistant-enabled devices. After somebody engages with your action, you can prompt them to add your action to their routine with just a couple of taps. And we're incredibly excited that Service Worker, the underlying new API that makes PWAs possible, is now supported on all major browsers including recently Edge on Windows and Safari on both desktop and mobile. This is probably the most important leap forward for the web in the last decade. Today, we're launching Lighthouse 3.0, which makes Lighthouse's performance metrics even more precise and its guidance even more actionable. I'm happy to share that AMP is evolving in some big ways. Now, all AMP content benefits from a fast, free, privacy-preserving cache that optimizes page loads. But they've had these Google.com URLs. So we're fixing that with a new standard called web packaging. We're expanding Chrome OS to support developers with the ability to securely run Linux apps on Chrome OS. So this means that many of your favorite tools, editors, and IDEs now work on Chromebooks. We're proud to announce Material theming, a major update to the material design system. Today, we're also releasing two new tools to make it faster to go from design to implementation. Material theme editor. This plugin for the popular application Sketch helps designers create and customize a unique material theme. This is the tool used by product teams at Google to review and comment on design iterations to make material yours, get started at material.io. Cloud TPUs are now available to everyone, and getting started is as simple as following this link. We've released the MO Kit in beta, an SDK that brings Google's machine learning capabilities to mobile developers through Firebase. We believe success in AI should be determined by your imagination, not your infrastructure. Predictions applies ML to your analytics data and predicts the future behavior of your users so you can take proactive actions to optimize your app. For example, you can lower the difficulty of your game for users who are likely to abandon it or send special offers to users who are likely to spend. We're bringing together Google's 
machine learning technologies from across Google and making that available to every mobile developer working on Android and iOS. And since MLKit is available through Firebase, it's easy for you to take advantage of the broader Firebase platform. We're rolling out a major update to AR Core to help you create even richer, more immersive and interactive experiences. That's why we've created SceneForm, a brand new 3D framework that makes it easy for Java developers to create AR Core applications. Today, we're introducing Augmented Images, a new capability in AR Core that makes it possible to attach AR content and experiences to the physical images in the real world. With Cloud Anchors, we actually allow multiple devices to generate a shared, synchronized understanding of the world so that multiple phones can see and interact with the exact same digital content in the same place at the same time. Good morning and welcome back to IO Live. It's our third and final day of our developer festival. Now there are still so many great sessions and sandbox demos ahead, so let's get to it. Good afternoon everyone. We're going to talk more about new capabilities we're releasing, as well as the improvements we're making to the platforms and tools you use every day. Today, we are excited to announce the new app model for Android. Using the Android App Bundle, a new publishing format, you can dramatically reduce app size. We're announcing Android Jetpack, the next generation of Android APIs to accelerate Android development. Jetpack is a set of libraries and tools. Jetpack's APIs are integrated with the IDE2. For instance, Android Studio now includes a navigation editor, which works with the library. You told us, work on emulator boot time. Ready? Set, go. I was not cheating. It was not running in the background. Slices are a cool new way to drive re-engagement. We wanted these to be easy to build. So you'll find templates that are rich and flexible. And because it's Jetpack, slices work on 95% of devices. And starting today, you can deeply customize the appearance of your action. First, we're making it even easier for you to promote your action with something new we call action links. Right there at the bottom, these are hyperlinks that you can use from anywhere that point directly into your action. Once users opt in, action notifications gives you a way to connect with them about new features and content. These notifications work on the phone even if users don't have your Android app installed, and you'll be able to re-engage with your users on speakers, smart displays, and other assistant-enabled devices. After somebody engages with your action, 
you can prompt them to add your action to their routine with just a couple of taps. And we're incredibly excited that Service Worker, the underlying new API that makes PWAs possible, is now supported on all major browsers, including recently Edge on Windows and Safari on both desktop and mobile. This is probably the most important leap forward for the web in the last decade. Today, we're launching Lighthouse 3.0, which makes Lighthouse's performance metrics even more precise and its guidance even more actionable. I'm happy to share that AMP is evolving in some big ways. Now, all AMP content benefits from a fast, free, privacy-preserving cache that optimizes page loads. But they've had these Google.com URLs. So we're fixing that with a new standard called web packaging. We're expanding Chrome OS to support developers with the ability to securely run Linux apps on Chrome OS. So this means that many of your favorite tools, editors, and IDEs now work on Chromebooks. We're proud to announce Material Theming, a major update to the Material Design system. Today, we're also releasing two new tools to make it faster to go from design to implementation. Material Theme Editor. This plugin for the popular application Sketch helps designers create and customize a unique material theme. This is the tool used by product teams at Google to review and comment on design iterations to make material yours, get started at material.io. Cloud TPUs are now available to everyone, and getting started is as simple as following this link. We've released the MO kit in beta, an SDK that brings Google's machine learning capabilities to mobile developers through Firebase. We believe success in AI should be determined by your imagination, not your infrastructure. Predictions applies ML to your analytics data and predicts the future behavior of your users so you can take proactive actions to optimize your app. For example, you can lower the difficulty of your game for users who are likely to abandon it or send special offers to users who are likely to spend. We're bringing together Google's machine learning technologies from across Google and making that available to every mobile developer working on Android and iOS. And since MLKit is available through Firebase, it's easy for you to take advantage of the broader Firebase platform. We're rolling out a major update to AR Core to help you create even richer, more immersive and interactive experiences. That's why we've created SceneForm, a brand new 3D framework that makes it easy for Java developers to create AR Core applications. Today, we're introducing Augmented Images, a new capability in AR Core that makes it possible to attach AR content and experiences to the physical images in the real world. With Cloud Anchors, we actually allow multiple devices to generate a shared, synchronized understanding of the world so that multiple phones can see and interact with the exact same digital content in the same place at the same time.
Hello, and good morning. Seems like the mic is not on. Hello. 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 The mic's not on. Hello. This is better. Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. My name is James, and I'm part of the Kotlin team at Google. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing a very special guest from JetBrains, who really requires no introduction. Now, all of you know that Kotlin is now one of the most loved programming languages in the world. And at Google I.O., it's very rare for us to have external speakers. But this person was here last year, and we invited him back because we couldn't think of anybody else to better to teach Kotlin other than one of the people who invented it. So please help me welcome the lead language designer for Kotlin, Andre Breslov. Thank you, James. Thanks for a great introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to see you here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, what can it be, Kotlin, I guess. And uh, I really i am going to do a live demo, so please bring my uh, demo on. Uh, so the reason why I have this horrible code in the slides uh, is that we are all learning, and uh, our old habits sometimes get in the way. So. I'll be presenting today uh, on the topic of how you get uh, out of, of your Java habits and get to uh, your Kotlin habits. So we all come from different backgrounds, of course. And uh, many of us started with the Java programming language and uh, built up our knowledge of programming through this. So we remember many things. And uh, the thing is, Kotlin has been inspired by many languages, including the Java programming language. So you can uh, reproduce many of the Java constructs in Kotlin, and it will work. Like you can uh, get your job done this way, but it can be, in many cases, improved dramatically. So uh, this particular example is about declaring classes. And uh, you can see here that I have a Kotlin class on the left and the Java class on the right. And they look very similar, but this is definitely not how we write Kotlin code. So what you are actually supposed to do is like remove all the unnecessary stuff. What I have to say here is two properties, one class, that's it, right? So I can uh, try to transform it by hand, but I'll actually want to show off a nice tool and simply copy and paste the code from the Java side to the Kotlin side uh, so it will use the uh, Java to Kotlin converter built into the IDE and uh, uh, do it for me. So boom, there it is. Uh, a single line that's actually all you needed uh, to declare one class, two properties, and that's it. Well, all I have here is a class with a primary constructor. So it has two parameters. Both of them are properties. That's all you wanted to say. So this is um, one of the things that demonstrates how cheap declaring classes is uh, in Kotlin. And uh, there is a consequence to this. So look at this code. Um, here, it's obviously not how you're supposed to write code in any language, actually. I wanted to parse a full name into a first name and a last name. And uh, so that's what I'm doing here. But how do I pack the result? to uh, put it out of the function. Uh, I don't have a way of returning two things from a function. I have to put it into one object. And I'm abusing a list here, just um, then awkwardly taking out one and the other uh, to make a first name and a last name. Don't do this in any language. But there is a kind of psychological reason uh, to doing this, at least in our old habits, because declaring classes is, is expensive, right? You have to uh, create a new file, put a lot of code in it. Uh, it's kind of awkward. But in Kotlin, you don't have to do this. All you need to say, my class full name with first and last names as properties. And then uh, all I need to do here is just return that. right? Uh, so my full name, here it goes. And now instead of uh, indices, I can say first and last right here. So that's the idea. Uh, Classes being cheap is not only saving you like time at the declaration site. It's saving you mental effort. You can 
um, represent your multiple return as a class, and it doesn't cost you anything. So if you run this, uh, you'll see that uh, my equals doesn't work, obviously, because that's a single line class. Uh, and so now I'll go to uh, declare equals there, right? And then a hash code there, and so on and so forth. It's so verbose, but I really don't need to do this in Kotlin because uh, you probably know that there is something called data classes, right? Who knows data classes? Uh, many people. Good. So, so you know that I simply put this single keyword there, and the compiler generates many things for me. It's equals, it's hash code, it's to string, and many other uh, convenient methods. So that's it. Uh, change your mind about how expensive a class is. Uh, you can use it easily uh, in all your uh, abstractions. So more or less done with the uh, warm up. Let's look at something else, uh, properties. So we talked about classes. We'll go through properties and then go over to functions. So here is a property done the way you shouldn't do it in Kotlin again. Uh, so the properties I showed you before uh, were kind of one-liners one where both getter and setter is trivial. Uh, if you want a custom setter, you definitely don't define functions for that. Uh, you have your custom setter syntax, as you probably know. If you know data classes, you know that. So inside a custom setter, you have field to uh, not file, but field uh, to write to your backend storage. But that's it. You uh, don't need to introduce extra names and anything else. So that's straightforward, right? But then uh, look at this code. So here is already some sensible logic. I have two properties, one of them private and nullable and mutable. And uh, on my first access, I'm checking if that's null, and then I compute a value and write into it, and then I output uh, return it from my getter. So what is it? It's a lazy property, right? I personally wrote dozens and dozens of those in Java and many other languages. Uh, so I got kind of bored by that. And that's why Kotlin has an abstraction mechanism called delegation uh, for properties. So de delegated properties let you get rid of all the repetition of this lazy logic. All you care about is this expression here. So let's just do it. Uh, imp implement my um, property by just lazy of all this. This is it. So uh, what I'm having now, I'm saying my property is not simply um, initialized by something. It's delegated to this lazy thing here. And upon first access, this Lambda will be executed, and then the rest will be stored by the uh, library. So lazy is not a language construct. It's just a library function. You can define your own. And uh, the library provides you with many other things. So the takeaway here is that um, if you have a common uh, kind of property, like uh, observable, for example, when you need to uh, be notified that something was modified, use a library or write your own. So here, delegates.observable uh, does the job from the standard library. But uh, if you like, you don't have to write code like this uh, when you have one property, and then the other property, and the other doing uh, the same the same thing over and over again. All you need to do is this, actually. Declare a single class uh, that encapsulates the logic of your property, like your generic getter and generic setter. And that's it. You can uh, now simply refer to this class in many properties and uh, get your business logic, database access, all kinds of validation, anything you like uh, can be abstracted as a library um, and uh, then reused across your project. Does it make sense? Who uses this already? I don't know so many people. You actually should. I'm sure you can benefit from this. Um, so. This is uh, more or less it about properties. And now let's get to functions. Functions are very important, right? So again, this is very horrible code. Don't write code like this in Kotlin, please. This is very much inspired by our habits in the Java programming language when I have to put everything into a class, right? So string util. Does your project has its own string util class? Oh, if it doesn't, it's just a very new project, right? <laughs> so, so any of my projects have them. Um, but the thing is, in Kotlin, it's a little different. You don't have to use a class. Well, first of all, uh, a Kotlin classes don't have statics. So to use these functions from this class, you have to say a string util uh, parentheses, which makes 
a new object, right? I don't want a new object every time. I want it like this, so I turn this class into an object. Um, it's a little bit of an improvement in, in my insanity, right? So I was creating an object every time I wanted to call a function. That's crazy. Um, but really, in Kotlin, I don't need an, any enclosing container at all because I have top-level functions. Um, so this may seem obvious, like functions, what are they? They're just declarations, right? But some languages, you know, have them only in classes. And many people learn this and rely on this. Um, so this is a lot more of a Kotlin way, but it's still not great uh, in, in terms of um, what you can achieve with Kotlin, because here you have two overloads, right? So get first word is supposed to uh, parse a string, uh, find a first space, and take the first word and return, right? Uh, but what if the sep separator is not a space, but a comma or something? Um, so here is a more um, full-featured version, and then this is how you call it actually in most contexts, right? Uh, so what I wanted to express here is just a default value. In Java, we are used to using overloads for this, and also some people use uh, nullable parameters like pass and null here, and I'll give you a default value. Don't do this in Kotlin. You don't need to. So all you need to do actually is simply specify your default. My default is space here. That's it. Right, so, so there is no need to uh, emulate defaults. They are built into the language. And same for um, when you have many, many default parameters with uh, different values, like multiple Booleans, so on and so forth, uh, you can just use named parameter syntax to express which of them you actually need, and all of, them, all of the rest will be used by default. Um, so this makes functions fewer in the first place and then uh, a lot more expressive. Uh, OK. Good with functions, right? Well, actually, this is kind of uh, this function is kind of midway between the like the Kotlin style and the uh, Java style, because uh, it's actually working on strings, right? Very much uh, a good idea to put this into a string class, only it's not, because the string class is not controlled by you. You can put everything into the string class, and you, you really want to keep the string API minimal. Uh, so what I would really like to do is something like this where I can say uh, my string get first word, and that's it. Right? So it looks like a method. Uh, it's called an extension function, actually. Uh, it's not sitting in the string class. I didn't go into the JDK and alter the class I can't control. Uh, but still, it works like this. So uh, this is the mechanism uh, you can use. I'll do it manually to illustrate uh, how it works here. So I have a receiver of type string. Now I don't need this parameter anymore. And I can say this dot here and uh, uh, use my this here or omit all of this on the left hand side. So now I'll be able to use it this way. Makes sense? I can do the same with the property. Actually, it uh, would be very nice to do it this way. Uh, just uh, have first word as a property name. And you can have an extension property. Uh, of course, there will be no customization for the separator, but otherwise, you're good to go. Uh, yep, I'll just need to put a space here. And that's it. So extension functions, extension properties. It's actually a very important idea. It's not only just convenience. Uh, it allows you to keep your classes really minimal. So look at the string class in Kotlin. It's only five methods. If you compare that to Java, it will be screens and screens of declarations. So you can keep your API minimal, and uh, all the utility functions can be extensions, can sit in different libraries, can be modularized like this. And that's a very important um, tool for designing APIs. Do you have questions? OK. I couldn't take them anyway. <laughs> OK. Now, let's have a look at this. Uh, here, I'm doing something very typical in traversing a hierarchy. So I have containers and leaf elements. Uh, containers can be nested in one another. Leaf elements sit there. All leaf elements uh, hold text. And I want to extract all the text from this hierarchy. Pretty straightforward. So uh, my classes are three lines of code. Not much. There's an element. There's a container with the uh, list of children. There is a text. Uh, now I'm traversing this. So I'm using extension functions. I'm using top-level functions, everything, as I told you. Uh, so it's, it's all right, but I don't like this code. Why well, don't like it? Uh, here, to traverse a hierarchy, I need recursion. 
right? So, so I need to uh, pass the string builder down the stack and add to it as I'm going down the uh, tree. But then I end up with a top level function that's only needed by this one here, right? So this one is not really needed anywhere but inside this function. So what I'd really like to do is just put it inside. Just uh, go here and make it a local function. So it's, um, again, it's just expressing that nobody else needs this. You don't need private helpers anymore a look for uh, local helpers. And this can be improved a little bit. You uh, can actually make use of closure. So I can create my string builder right here uh, and get rid of all this. So I don't need uh, to return or take parameters here. Uh, all I need here is uh, use whatever is declared above. And then I just do extract text of E right here and return string builder to string. Uh, extract text. Oh, sorry. It's an extension function, right? No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so here it has, uh, how it goes. Like, uh, you can turn something into a local function and leverage closure. So this variable is declared outside my function. It's not accessible to anyone outside the outer. And I'm using it here, and that's it. Now, uh, local functions, extension functions, top level functions, default parameters, use these. They will make your code nicer. Now let's look at what's uh, still there. Do you see gray code? Uh, gray code is useless. Uh, the ID in the compiler show you that something is not needed there. And it actually isn't. This cast is redundant because we have uh, this is check here, right? So you simply can remove this. And I don't know if you see it. Oh, yeah, you do. But the text variable has gone green. Why it's green? It's because the compiler can figure out the cast for you. It's actually much safer. It's not only convenient. I'm, I'm really annoyed at my casts all, uh, all over the place, right? So I know it's text. Why don't you know? Well, now it knows. And actually, you don't need this variable either, because uh, it's the only usage, right? Uh, the same thing here. And then my container can be in line as well. So here it is. You can use smart casts. Uh, it makes your code safer, more concise. And actually, it makes all the casts that still are in your program meaningful. So when you see an as operator in Kotlin now, you know it means something. It's not just a useless complement, a complement to the uh, is check above. Also, this thing here is kind of stupid because um, what I'm doing, I'm just applying the same function to everything, and it's a single function. So what, what I want to do is something like this. Uh, it's a little bit nicer looking. And then let's look at what we have. We're traversing a hierarchy. I have my leaves. I have my containers. And uh, that's what I want to express, right? I'm checking different cases. So to do that, it's a lot nicer to use a when, when statement. Uh, when can uh, switch in types right here. But there is an annoying thing about it. And it's, uh, again, coming from my old habits. I'm declaring a closed hierarchy. I have only containers and text, right? I don't have anything else. Uh, but now I have this pretty annoying else case right here. Why? Because the compiler has no idea. I don't have anything but containers and text. It's just an abstract class, and I have some uh, cases there. But uh, you can actually express this in Kotlin with sealed. I can have a seal class, which means all the subclasses are known. You can declare them outside this file. And this way, the ID and the compiler know that this else is useless. So we went from like almost two screens of code to less than one, uh, simply applying the idioms of Kotlin to this code. Do you have questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, so now let's uh, just continue with this exercise and, and look at some, some more examples of expressions that are written like with old habits in mind, and we'll try to transform them into something better. So first thing that really stands out here is var. I can't say never use var. Vars are useful. Mutable variables can be used for many uh, nice things. but. Uh, it's kind of discouraged. If you need a var, you need a very good reason. Here is no good reason um, using eval, definitely. Then here, let's look at these three. 
it's repetition. Repetition is ugly. Repetition is error prone, especially if uh, this was not a single name, but many things uh, chained. So I would like to get rid of this repetition. Uh, what I can do is say with x. Uh, does anyone remember Pascal? Pascal, anyone? Oh, good. Good. I started in Pascal almost. So it had this with thing, which was a built-in construct. And Colin, it's a function. Um, we can use it, and here we can get rid of all the x things here, just like this. And now it looks even more stupid, right? I'm just assigning to the same variables. Don't do that. Um, OK. So now I have a print line with string plus something, string plus something, string plus something. It's awkward. Most languages now have string interpolation. Colin has that as well. So what you actually need here is this. OK. Done with this one, uh, import things into your scope with with, use string interpolation. It's nice. Now here, I'm creating a map uh, the old way. I can kind of make it a little nicer like this by using my operators. But it's really much nicer if I uh, just use a builder function. Uh, so what I can do here is replace all my uh, map put things with pairs. Not pairs, but pair. Sorry. Typing when, when talking is difficult. Yeah, so, so a map can be constructed of pairs, right? Map is only a set of pairs from uh, key to value. Well, actually, pairs are uh, kind of redundant in this. Uh, so we're usually us using the to function here. It's not a built in operator, just a library function here. So this is how you create a map. And when you want to traverse the map, you can say, uh, here, key and value, and just uh, have your variables like this, uh, which makes for loops a lot more concise. Well, this example of code with uh, my if statement is something I really hate about my, my code in Java. Uh, because it's uh, like these assignments here, uh, they all fall apart so easily. So I really like to do uh, things like this in Kotlin. So if and many other things are actually expressions. This is something pretty unfamiliar uh, for the C language family. Uh, we are used to dividing our code into statements and expressions, right? Statements are things that have effects. Expressions are things that have values. So you ex assign expressions to variables and write statements to assign things to things. Uh, so Kotlin is halfway between the, this procedural tradition and the functional tradition. So we have a lot more expressions than uh, you're used to in other languages. So you can do this here. And of course, you don't have to uh, use a var. You don't have to. Uh, make it a different line, and you can assign it right away. So if expression, uh, make it nicer. By the way, the result of the expression is the uh, last thing in the block. So the same for when. Uh, when is not simply switch get case on steroids. It's uh, largely, importantly, an expression. Uh, so you can uh, also do it like this, right? So not many returns here, but one return here will be a lot nicer. Also, you don't have to repeat yourself, of course, this much. And you can say even this. By the way, if you want to check if something is odd and even, don't do it like me. It's only for demo purposes. Don't try this at home. It will hurt. Yeah, so um, this one can be further simplified like this. So again, uh, you're trying to remove the noise. When, when you see code like this, just try to get rid of the noise. Noise is harmful uh, for your brain. Uh, last thing, just a quick demo of uh, what you do with nullability. So these question marks, who is familiar with nullable types in Kotlin? How many people? I'll go really, really quick. So you can have nullable types, and compiler makes you uh, do things like this. So um, it's an error now. String is nullable. You can uh, dereference it. You can either do this, which says just safely dereference me, which you, by the way, can do here as well, right? So you don't have to uh, write an if around it. Uh, and you can actually simplify it like this. Uh, another nice thing is that you can uh, use a, an Elvis operator like this. Um, so to, to simplify your like, longer if statements into something. And this is kind of curious, because 
this is definitely an expression position, right? So how Elvis works. Elvis takes an expression on the left-hand side of string, asks, are you a null really nicely? And then if it's a null, it evaluates the right-hand side. But the right-hand side has to be an expression, right? It's basically, it's supposed to be a default. So like, if you are null on the left-hand side, like, use a default on the right-hand side. But your default can be just a return. What, which means that you don't compute any value there. You just jump out of the function. That's a quite interesting thing from the type system standpoint, but I'm not giving a lecture here. I'm doing a demo. Um, OK, we're good with expressions. Let's look at some functional style. So people very often refer to Kotlin as a functional language. Uh, I don't think it is, actually. I think Kotlin is a multi-paradigm language that supports functional style. You don't have to write functional in Kotlin, uh, but it's oftentimes very nice to do it. So let's have a look at this. Uh, so in, uh, in my Java old days in mind, I wrote this um, code, which uh, just goes over a list of numbers and picks those that are divi uh, divisible by 16 and then converts them to hex. Right? So, so what it actually does is filter map, right? Map uh, is uh, this one, and filter is this one. So what I can do, even with the help of my ID, I can do this. Uh, so newer versions of all programming languages have something like this. Uh, you can definitely leverage this. Uh, so this filter is a function. This lambda is a function value. You don't have, by the way, to declare it uh, as a variable. It just get, can get rid of it. Uh, so that's a lambda parameter. Kotlin has some uh, nice semi-functional semi things. Like you, know, you can say anywhere in your code. You can say also. You have this value. Also, do this for me, please. Like print um, this list for me. And then proceed with what you were doing. Like never mind this. It's just de debug output or some side effect I want to insert here. Side effects are not very functional on the one hand. On the other hand, this is very handy for debugging. You don't have to break your chain apart, and so on and so forth. So use also, use let, um, use run, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is one very deep thing about uh, functional abstractions in uh, non-functional languages. When I do something like this, I have my repeat function right here, right? So, so, uh, so what it does, it takes a number of times I want to repeat something, and this something is a function. By the way, you don't have to invent your own function interface every time. Uh, just use the function types here. It's a function that takes an int, returns a unit. Unit is something you don't care about. Then it simply repeats it, right? Um, so when I say repeat, I'm always very much conscious about uh, like what it's going to cost me, right? Uh, so it's a function. It takes a lambda as a parameter. So it's actually just another parameter. Um, the Kotlin custom is to write it outside the parentheses because it looks more like a language construct like this. But then, OK, I'm running this. I have to create a Lambda object, right? Uh, I have to create a Lambda object every time I do anything like this. So there is a cost to this abstraction. It's nice code. I can reuse things. I can uh, raise level of abstraction in my code. But uh, there is a toll on that. Uh, actually, in Kotlin, you can very often uh, get rid of the toll of creating uh, lambdas, lambda objects for you, but just using inline functions. When I say inline, my code doesn't change, right? Uh, so here, nothing happened at the call site <clears throat> that I can see. But if I say uh, show Kotlin bytecode and just decompile this into Java, just to scare you a little bit, it was much, yeah of an easy talk so far. So if I do this, here it goes. It's a simple for loop. Uh, where did my lambda go? Well, the compiler simply optimizes it away. You don't need a lambda. Right? So if you, uh, if you simply have your loop here and you inline everything, you end up with a loop. That's it. So the big difference in the mindset when you go from the Java programming language to the Kotlin programming language is that you still use lambdas, but some of your lambdas are really free. And by the way, these all are free too. So many, many lambdas in the standard library are free abstractions. You don't have to pay for calling them. It's just code generated for you. So functional in Kotlin is not only convenient, but also quite cheap. 
Uh, speaking of cheap, by the way, let's look at this example. So here I'm trying to do a parallel computation. Well, it's, it's a stupid sample. Nobody does parallel computations in bare threads, so on and so forth. But I want to illustrate a point. So what I'm doing here is, again, with my old habits in mind, I'm creating uh, 100,000 threads. Uh, 100,000 threads, each of which does some work, actually sleeps for one second and just prints a number. And then I have to join uh, all these threads to my main thread. So if I run this, oh, 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 there was an exception. What was that? The Java laying out of memory error. Uh, basically, what it's telling me, hey, you cannot create 100,000 threads. Are you crazy there? It's 100,000 stacks. It doesn't fit into memory. Just get reasonable. And that's fair. Like, uh, OS threads are not cheap. Uh, you have to allocate resources for threads. So you don't do such silly things with threads. But I have this example done through coroutines. Who knows about coroutines in Kotlin? Oh, good. Who uses them in production? OK, soon enough. You all will be using them, I'm sure. So have a look here. It's very much the same code. So I'll just uh, put it side by side here. Very much the same code. But instead of uh, threads here, I'm creating async uh, tasks, which are uh, using coroutines underneath. Uh, so I'm still waiting for one second and printing. And if I run this, there is no out of memory. It's printing all the numbers, and I'm good. So again. Colin introduced coroutines as a means of making your asynchronous computations nicer. And that works. But uh, what's the cost of that? So the cost of that is at least cheaper than having a thread per each computation. Of course, nobody does that exactly. But still, like, coroutines are very cheap. You can uh, spin off like 100,000 coroutines, a million coroutines, and it doesn't cost you nearly as much as uh, anything like th that of threads. Let me illustrate something uh, coroutines are really good for uh, right here. So here is a legacy interface. Uh, or I don't know, or a modern interface, whatever. So uh, what we very often have to do to make things asynchronous or uh, make things uh, like reverse our dependencies, so on and so forth, is callbacks. Right? So uh, just ask me to do something. I'll do it for you, and I'll let you know when I'm done. So here I have my mock service a request and a callback function that's um, passed to it. So when the work in the comments are done, uh, I'm uh, calling the uh, callback and just passing my answer there. Right? So that's, that's all right. It's working for, for everyone, right? Um, but this is what the code looks like when I want to exchange messages between two services. So I just want to basically uh, send two messages in sequence. And uh, here's what I have to, go have to do. Uh, first, request, then a callback. This is the result of the request. I print it. Then next request inside that callback, and then print inside. So you, you see the staircase right here, right? One step. Oh, sorry. One step, two steps, three steps. And you can actually get quite deep down this staircase, which is not nice. Uh, so what I would really love to do is something a lot more straightforward. But so this is kind of tolerable. But what if, just imagine, what if you needed to do like n calls? Just a number, like make a list of calls. So this is the code I came up with, which isn't nice at all. So I definitely need recursion there, because I have to nest a callback inside a callback inside a callback, right? So I need recursion. Uh, this is the shortest code I could come up with. It copies, arrays, don't do that. It's wasteful in terms of memory, wasteful, wasteful in terms of time. It's quadratic. But basically, you have to come up with something like this, like nest callbacks into callbacks into callbacks. And uh, so you can't just say, OK, repeat this five times. right? So what I really want to do, to be able to do, is something like this. Where I just say, OK, send one request, wait for results, send the other request. Uh, and then if I want to repeat something, just repeat it with a for loop. Right? So this code here is actually using the same callbacks. Only the coroutine abstractions are disagreeing this away from me. So 
actually, you can take any callback-based API you have now and turn it into this, like make it straightforward uh, with uh, just a few lines of code. I'll show you. So this is calling the same services because I have this function right here. So what I'm doing, I'm just turning the request into a suspension function uh, through this simple construct. It's an extension function of my callback service. I say the first thing I say there is suspend my coroutine. So I must, I'm assuming I'm in a coroutine. I suspend it right away. I get my continuation. And I do my request. That's it. I'm suspended. I'm waiting for a request. So there it is. And when the request uh, is done, I just say resume to my coroutine. That's it. So this simple lines of code turns your callback-based API into a coroutine API and makes, so makes this, oh, sorry, makes this code into this, which is a lot more readable to my sense. How do you like it? <laughs> OK, I see some nods in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, if you want to, do, uh, to be a lot um, more um, prudent here, and uh, I'm sure you want to, you need to catch exceptions. Mm, so you know, catching, um, uh, handling your exceptions is very important. And that's as easy as this. Just catch your exception. Whatever happens on the, oh, not, so sorry, not, not here, of course. Whatever happens with your, um, with your request, just catch it and uh, resume with exception. So this will propagate exceptions through your coroutines very nicely, and you, you'll be able to write try catch around here, like surround this with uh, try catch. Oh, sorry, whatever, um, and uh, catch exceptions there as if it was sequ sequential code. But underneath, it's all asynchronous. You can do HTTP requests like this, async I/O uh, file systems. Uh, you can do background threads. Everything you need. So isn't it nice? Uh, and I guess the last example I'll be showing you today is this one. It's just another uh, show off for how coroutines can help you. Take a look. So what I want to do is um, to create an infinite stream of numbers. Who likes infinite streams of numbers? I eat them for breakfast. OK. Um, so I want just a Fibonacci sequence uh, to be generated here. Uh, and then I can take 20 of them here, just a sequence of 20. I can take 200. 2,000. I can filter, map, slice, whatever. Uh, so this build sequence function is a uh, library function in the Colin standard library. And it's actually uh, based on the same mechanism as coroutines. It doesn't do any background processing. It's all in the same thread. What it does, uh, it takes all the yield statements from here and just puts them in a sequence. So if I want to yield something here, I just do it. Like I insert two into my. Uh, sequence. If I want to uh, say if TMP is greater than 10, continue, I can skip pieces of my uh, logic. So that's as straightforward as any coroutine. It gives you um, a lazy sequence. OK, so takeaways classes are cheap, functions are top level or, or local, no overloading to emulate your uh, default values. Use properties, use delegated properties, use coroutines, uh, have a nice cotton. And uh, I want to uh, advertise some more activities today. Uh, so uh, if you ha still have questions that I couldn't take, uh, you can come over to an office hour we ha we're having um, at 12.30. You can come over to the sandbox area C, uh, where we're uh, at the Kotlin booth, um, some of the day at least. And uh, right after my talk, there will be a talk by Jake Wharton about Android KDX, which is very exciting. Uh, I believe it's on stage two. So welcome there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session.
directly on device is important and how it's different than what you may do on the server. Second, we'll walk you through what we have built with TensorFlow Lite. And lastly, we'll show you how you can use TensorFlow Lite in your own apps. So first, let's talk about devices for a bit. What do we mean when we say a device? Well, usually a mobile device, basically our phones. So our phones are with us all the time. We interact with them so many times during the day. And modern phones come with a large number of sensors on them, which give us really rich data about the physical world around us. Another category of devices is what we call edge devices. And this industry has seen a huge explosion in the last few years. So some examples are smart speakers, smart watches, smart cameras. And as this market has grown, we see that technology, which only used to be available on more expensive devices, is now available on far cheaper ones. So now we are seeing that there is this massive growth in devices. They're becoming increasingly capable both mobile and edge. And this is opening up many opportunities for novel applications for machine learning. So I expect that many of you are already familiar with the basic idea of machine learning. But for those that aren't, I'm going to really quickly cover the core concept. So let's start with an example of something that we may want to do. Let's say classification of images. So how do we do this? So in the past, what we would have done was to write a lot of rules that were hard-coded, very specific, about some specific characteristics that we expected to see in parts of the image. This was time-consuming, hard to do, and frankly didn't work all that well. And this is where machine learning comes in. We, with machine learning, we learn based on examples. So a simple way to think about machine learning is that we use algorithms to learn from data, and then we make predictions about similar data that has not been seen before. So it's a two-step process. First, the model learns, and then we use it to make predictions. The process of model learning is what we typically call training, and when the model is making predictions about data is what we call inference. This is a high-level view of what's happening during training. The model is passed in label data, that is input data, along with the associated prediction. And since in this case we know what the right answer is, we are able to calculate the error. That is, how many times is the model getting it wrong and by how much. We use these errors to improve the model. And this process is repeated many, many times until we reach the point that we think that the model is good enough or that this is the best that we can do. This involves a lot of steps and coordination, and that is why we need a framework to make this easier. And this is where TensorFlow comes in. It's Google's framework for machine learning. It makes it easy to train and build neural networks and it is cross-platform. It works on CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, as well as mobile and embedded platforms. And the mobile and embedded piece of TensorFlow, which we call TensorFlow Lite, is what we are going to be focusing on in our talk today. So now I want to talk about why would you consider doing machine learning directly on device? And there are several reasons that you may consider, but probably the most important one is latency. If the processing is happening on the device, then you're not sending data back and forth to the server. So if your use case involves real-time processing of data such as audio or video, then it's quite likely that you would consider doing this. Other reasons are that your processing can happen even when your device is not connected on to the internet. The data stays on device. This is really useful if you're working with sensitive user data, which you don't want to put on servers. It's more power efficient because your device is not spending power transmitting data back and forth. And lastly, we are in a position to take advantage of all the sensor data that's already available 
and accessible on the device. So this is all great, but there's a catch, like there always is. And the catch is that doing on-device ML is hard. Many of these devices have some pretty tight constraints. They have small batteries, tight memory, and very little computation power. TensorFlow was built for processing on the server, and it wasn't a great fit for these use cases. And that is the reason that we built TensorFlow Lite. It's a lightweight machine learning library for mobile and embedded platforms. So this is a high-level overview of the system. It consists of a converter where we convert models from TensorFlow format to TensorFlow Lite format. And for efficiency reasons, we use a format which is different. Then it consists of an interpreter which runs on device. There are a library of ops and kernels. And then we have APIs which allow us to take advantage of hardware acceleration whenever it is available. TensorFlow Lite is cross-platform, so it works on Android, iOS, Linux. And a high-level developer workflow here would be to take a trained TensorFlow model, convert it to TensorFlow Lite format, and then update your apps to use the TensorFlow Lite interpreter using the appropriate API. On iOS, developers also have the option of using CoreML instead. And what they would do here is to take their trained TensorFlow model and convert it to CoreML using the TensorFlow to CoreML converter, and then use the converted model with the CoreML runtime. So the two common questions that we get when we talk to developers about TensorFlow Lite is, is it small and is it fast? So let's talk about the first question. One of our fundamental design goals with TensorFlow Lite was to keep the memory and binary size small. And I'm happy to say that the size of our core interpreter is only 75 kilobytes. And when you include all the supported ops, this size is 400 kilobytes. So how did we do this? So first of all, we've been really careful about which dependencies we include. Secondly, TensorFlow Lite uses flat buffers, which are far more memory efficient than protocol buffers are. One other feature that I want to call out here in TensorFlow Lite is what we call selective registration. And that allows developers to only use the ops that their model needs. And thus, they can keep the footprint small. And thus, they can keep the footprint small. Now moving on to the second question, which is of speed. So we made several design choices throughout the system to enable fast startup, low latency, and high throughput. So let's start with the model file format. TensorFlow Lite uses flat buffers, like I said. And flat buffers is a cross-platform efficient serialization library. It was originally created at Google for game development and is now being used for other performance-sensitive applications. The advantage of using flat buffers is that we can directly access the data without doing parsing or unparsing of the large files which contain weights. Another thing that we do at, at the time of conversion is that we pre-fuse the activations and biases. And this leads to faster execution later at runtime. The TensorFlow Lite interpreter uses a static memory and static execution plan. This leads to faster load times. Many of the kernels that TensorFlow Lite comes with have been specially optimized to run fast on Neon on ARM CPUs. Now let's talk about hardware acceleration. As machine learning has grown in prominence, it has spurred quite a bit of innovation at the silicon layer as well. And many hardware companies are investing in building custom chips which can accelerate neural network processing. GPUs and DSPs, which have been around for some time, are also now being increasingly used to do machine learning tasks. TensorFlow Lite was designed to take advantage of hardware acceleration, whether it is through GPUs, DSPs, or custom AI chips. On Android, the recently released Android Neural Network API 
is an abstraction layer, which makes it easy for TensorFlow Lite to take advantage of the underlying acceleration. And the way this works is that hardware renders write specialized drivers or custom acceleration code for their hardware platforms and integrate with the Android NN API. TensorFlow Lite, in turn, integrates with the Android NN API via its internal delegation API. A point to note here is that developers only need to integrate their apps with TensorFlow Lite. TensorFlow Lite will take care of abstracting away the details of hardware acceleration from them. In addition to the Android NN API, we are also working on building direct GPU acceleration in TensorFlow Lite. GPUs are widely available and used. And like I said before, they are now being increasingly used for doing machine learning tasks. Similar to NN API, developers only integrate with TensorFlow Lite if they want to take advantage of the GPU acceleration. So the last bit on performance that I want to talk about is quantization. And this is a good example of an optimization which cuts across several components in our system. So first of all, what is quantization? A simple way to think about it is that it refers to techniques to store numbers and to perform calculations on numbers in formats that are more compact than 32-bit floating point representations. And why is this important? Well, for two reasons. First, model size is a concern for small devices. So the smaller the model, the better it is. Secondly, there are many processors which have specialized SIMD instruction sets which process fixed point numbers much faster than they process floating point numbers. So the next question here is, how much accuracy do we lose if we are using 8 bits or 16 bits instead of the 32 bits which are used for representing floating point numbers? Well, the answer obviously depends on which model that we are using. But in general, the learning process is robust to noise. And quantization can be thought of as a form of noise. So what we find is that the accuracies tend to be usually within acceptable thresholds. A simple way of doing quantization is to shrink the weights and biases after training. And we are shortly going to be releasing a tool which developers can use to shrink the size of their models. In addition to that, we have been actively working on doing quantization at training time. And this is an active area of ongoing research. And what we find here is that we are able to get accuracies which are comparable to the floating point models for architectures like MobileNet as well as Inception. And we recently released a tool which allows developers to use this. And we are working on adding support for more models in this. OK, so I talked about a bunch of performance optimizations. Now let's talk about what does it translate to in terms of numbers. So we benchmarked two models, MobileNet and Inception v3 on the Pixel 2. And as you can see here, we are getting speed ups of more than three times. When we compare quantized models running on TensorFlow Lite versus floating point models running on TensorFlow. I'll point out here that these numbers do not include any hardware acceleration. We've done some initial benchmarking with hardware acceleration, and we see additional speed ups of three to four times with that, which is really promising and exciting. So stay tuned in the next few months to hear more on that. Now that I've talked about the design of TensorFlow and performance, I want to show you what TensorFlow Lite can do in practice. Let's please roll the video. Oh, so this is a simple demo application, which is running the mobile net classification model, which we trained on common office objects. And as you can see, it's doing a good job detecting them, even this TensorFlow logo that we trained this model on. Like I said, it's cross-platform. So it's running on iOS as well as Android. And we also are running it here on Android Things. This was a simple demo. We have more exciting demos for you later on in the talk. Now let's talk about production use cases. 
I'm happy to say that we've been working with partner teams inside Google to bring TensorFlow Lite to Google Apps. So portrait mode on Android camera, Hey Google and Google Assistant, and Smart Reply are some features which are going to be powered by TensorFlow Lite in the next few months. Additionally, TensorFlow Lite is the machine learning engine which is powering the custom model functionality in the newly announced MLKit. And for those of you that may have missed the announcement, MLKit is a machine learning SDK. It exposes both on-device and cloud-powered APIs for machine learning, as well as the ability to bring your own custom models and use them. These are some examples of apps that are already using TensorFlow Lite via MLKit. PixArt, it's a really popular photo editing and collage making app. And Visco, it's a really cool photography app. So back to TensorFlow Lite and what is currently supported. So we have support for 50 commonly used operations which developers can use in their own models. I will point out here that if you need an op which is not currently supported, you do have the option of using what we call a custom op and using that. And later on in this talk, Andrew will show you how you can do that. Op support is currently limited to inference. We will be working on adding training support in the future. We support several common popular open source models, as well as the quantized counterparts for some of them. And with this, I'm going to invite my colleague, Andrew, to talk to you about how you can use TensorFlow Lite in your own apps. Thanks, Sarah. So now that you know what TensorFlow Lite is and uh, what it can do and where it can be run, I'm sure you, know, you want to know how to use it. So we can break that up into four important steps. The first one, and probably the most important, is get a model. You need to decide what you want to do. It could be image classification. It could be object detection. Um, or it could be even speech recognition. Whatever that model is, you need to train it yourself. You can do that with TensorFlow, just like you trained any other TensorFlow model. Or you can download a pre-trained model if you're not ready to make your own model yet, or if an existing model satisfies your needs. Uh, second, you need to convert your model from TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite. And we'll show some examples of how to do that in a second. Third, if there's any custom ops that you need to write, uh, this could be because you want to spot optimize something with some special instructions you know about. Or it could be that you're using a piece of functionality that we do not yet support, like a specialized piece of signal processing. Whatever it might be, you can write your ops. This may not be necessary, of course. The last step is to write an app. And you're going to use whatever client API is appropriate for the target platform. So let's dive into some code. Converting your TensorFlow model. Uh, once you're done with a TensorFlow training, you typically have a saved model, or you might have a graph def. What you need to do first is uh, put this through the converter. So here I'm showing how to do this within Python. So if you download the normal TensorFlow tooling um, that's precompiled, like the pip, you're able to run the, uh, the converter. And it just takes a save model directory in or a frozen graph def, and it, um, you specify a file name of what TF Lite file you want. And that will output a flat buffer that's on disk that you can now ship to whatever de device you want. Now, um, how much you get it to the device? You could put it into the package. You could also, um, say, distribute it through a cloud service where you can update your model on the fly without updating your core application. Uh, whatever you want to do is possible. So next, once you've converted, well, you might actually run into some issues doing a conversion, because um, there's a couple of things that can go wrong. So the first one is you need to make sure that you have a frozen graph def or a save model. Both of these are able to get rid of the parts of the graph that are used for training. These are typically things like variable assignment, variable initialization, optimization passes. These are not strictly necessary for doing inference, that is, prediction. So you want to get rid of those out of the graph, because we don't want to support those operations right now, because we want to have the smallest uh, version of the runtime that can be uh, distributed to keep your binary size small. Uh, the second thing that you need to do is make sure that uh, you write any custom operators that you need. And now I'll go into a little bit of an example of doing that. Well, before that, let me tell you one more thing, which is we also have some visualizers to let you understand the model that you've transformed 
and the transformation process. So take a look at those. They're linked off of the documentation. So uh, let's get into writing a custom op. So what kind of op might we need? Well, here I have an example that's a little bit silly, but it's to return pi. So the important thing when you write an op is that you need to implement four C functions. So we have a C API for defining operations. And the reason we do this is that um, all of our operations are implemented in this way so they can run on devices that only support C eventually. But you can write kernels in C++. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm uh, uh, ignoring the input tensors, and I'm putting an output tensor, which is mpy. Now, if you had input tensors and you wanted to make a, uh, an output tensor, you could also read the input tensors and then say, oh, multiply by 3. And now I have a multiply by 3 operation. Uh, this is going to be application dependent. And of course, as I said before, you don't always need to do this. I'm just uh, laying this out here to show that if there's some functionality that you need, we are extensible. OK. Once you've converted your model, you need to use a client API. Let me start with the C++ API, but we have other language uh, bindings as well that I'll get to. Um, and, but in any of the bindings, it's going to follow the same basic pattern. The pattern is uh, create an interpreter and load the model, fill in your data, execute the model, and read back your data. So it's very simple. So in the C++ API, the first thing you do is create a model object. And this is given the file name of the, uh, te the TensorFlow Lite file. And it creates an object that is going to hold that model and mmap it. So as I said before, we use flat buffers. And the reason why is that we can mmap the buffers, which means that there is zero latency to start running the model effectively. OK, second, if you have any custom operations, uh, you can register them. So basically, at this phase, you're deciding which operations to include into your uh, runtime. Uh, by default, we provide a built-in op resolver that's, that includes all of our uh, default operations. You might also use selective registration that we alluded to before, where you include only a subset of the operations. In this case, you might provide a minimal resolver. And if you wanted to use the custom operation that we had before, you would create a custom resolver that would tell TensorFlow Lite how to find your custom operation. So, now we know what our ops are um, and where to get the code for them. And we know our model. Now we need to create an interpreter object. So we take the pair of model and resolver and put it together, and it returns an interpreter. This interpreter is going to be our handle for doing our execution. So the next step is we're going to uh, perform our execution. But before we can do that, we need to fill the buffer. So if you have a model like a classification model, that is something that takes an image in. Where are you going to get that image? Well, the obvious place you might get it would be from uh, your device's storage, if it's an image file name, but also commonly would be a camera. Whatever it might be, you produce a, uh, like a, a buffer. In, in this case, it's going to be a float star and an in star buffer, and you fill it into our buffer. And once you fill this buffer, you're ready to run. So we filled our buffer. Uh, TensorFlow Lite has all the information it needs to run the, the execution, and we just call invoke. Now it's going to block until that execution is done. And then we're going to be able to read the output of it in, a, an, in an analogous way to our input. So that is, we can get a float star buffer out, which could represent the class uh, numbers. And then you're free to do with that data whatever you want. So for example, in an image classification app that we showed before, you would read that index out, map it back to a string, and then put it into your uh, GUI's display. Great. So now we know how to use C++. What if you're using uh, another platform? For example, Raspberry Pi. Uh, on Raspberry Pi, the most common thing to use is probably Python. And again, it's going to follow the same basic pattern. First, we create an interpreter object. The interpreter object is now our handle. How do we feed data? Well, since it's Python, we can use NumPy arrays. And this is really convenient, because if you need to do pre-processing or post-processing, you can do it with the primitives that you're familiar with. And this is kind of a theme that goes on, that we want to keep uh, our bindings as idiomatic as possible in the language that they are and also keep it uh, performant. So in this case, we put in some NumPy array, and we take out some NumPy array. So that's Python. What if you're writing an Android app, or you want to write an Android Things application? Then you might use the Java API. Um, so in this case, it's the same thing. You, take, you build an interpreter, give it the file name of the interpreter. It might be from a resource if you're doing an Android application. And then finally, um, you're going to fill the inputs in and, and, and call run. 
So one of the things that we did for the Java API is that we know that uh, many Java programmers don't really want to deal with uh, building their own native uh, library. So in that case, you can just use our Gradle file here, which will include our pre-compiled version of TensorFlow Lite. You don't have to download our source code. Uh, and even for the tooling parts where you do the conversion from TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite, you can download the pre-compiled version of, uh, of TensorFlow, as I alluded to before. Great. So uh, what if you're doing iOS? Well, in that case, you can use the C++ API. You can also use the Objective-C API. But again, we provide a pre-compiled binary in the form of a CocoaPod. OK. So now that you know how to use TensorFlow Lite, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going to be coming up in TensorFlow Lite. Uh, one thing that we've asked, been asked for a lot is adding more operations. So the more operations that we add, the more models can be run from TensorFlow out of the box. The other thing that happens with uh, uh, machine learning that's often difficult is that researchers come up with new techniques all the time. And that means that TensorFlow is always adding operations. That means that we're going to uh, continue to, to follow TensorFlow as it adds important operations and add them into TensorFlow Lite as well. OK. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to improve the tooling, provide better documentation and uh, tutorials, and try to focus on ease of use. So it's really easy for you to understand on end-to-end -end examples how to integrate TensorFlow Lite. And the third thing, which Sarah already mentioned, but I'll mention again, is that we're excited about on-device training. On-device training is really exciting because it allows us to refine a model based on a, uh, a user's experience. It allows us to decouple that experience from going to the cloud. So if they're disconnected, we can continue improving the model. So there's a lot of requests for this. This, of course, will require more and more computation on the device, but we're excited about upcoming, upcoming uh, hardware accelerators that will make this more and more possible. OK. One more question before we get into some exciting demos. When should I use TensorFlow Lite? So as we alluded to before, we're starting to use TensorFlow Lite for our first party applications, and third party applications are also using it. That means that um, what we're doing moving forward is that we're going to make TensorFlow Lite our standard solution for running ML on small devices and mobile devices. TensorFlow Lite currently supports a subset of TensorFlow Ops. This means that our recommendation is that you should use TensorFlow Lite if you can, and let us know. And let us know about any missing functionality you need. It's not quite done. You probably want to see our demos. So, with that, I want to show you a video um, of retrained models. We showed you that TensorFlow logo, be logo being re recognized. This is a common theme that we get, which is. People like our pre-trained examples, like MobileNet, but they may not have an application where they need to tell the difference between five dog breeds and many zoo animals. They might have an office scenario where they have markers and whiteboards. And in fact, as we were testing the app, we found we had this issue too. It's like we don't have uh, the classes that are in these pre-trained models. So one of the great things that um, one of our other TensorFlow members created was something called TensorFlow for Poets. And there was a code lab about that, and it's available online as well. And it basically allows you to take a pre-trained image model that has really good detector ability and put your own classes into it. And I want to show you a demo app that we created uh, that runs on the PC and creates TensorFlow Lite models for you. So can we go to the video? OK, so we showed you before. Can we recognize scissors and post-it notes? Well, let's try it out. We always want to try these models, check. OK, the scissors looks good, right? OK, great. Post-it notes also looks good. But what if we had another object, an object that's you know, more common, more important, like this metal TensorFlow logo? This happens in everyday life, right? OK. Let's go take a look at how this does. Well, it's labeled as other. That's not very good. But the great thing about machine learning is that we can fix this. And the way we fix it is we add data. So we have our application. We've gone to our training tab now. And now we're going to define a class called TensorFlow. And this is basically short for TensorFlow logo. And now from our webcam, we're going to click Capture. And we're going to capture a couple of different perspectives, as many as we can. And ideally, you would take it on different backgrounds so it doesn't associate the background with it being a TensorFlow logo. And then I click the Train button. And right now, it's using TensorFlow to train the model. And you can see it's converging to a good validation accuracy. It's going to reload the model. And we're testing it in TensorFlow Lite, running on the PC right now. And we see that it's recognizing TensorFlow correctly. So it's that fast and easy. 
But also, we can take that model and we can move to Android and iOS and use the exact same model and update it. So thanks. Now let's move to a live demo. So I'm going to go over here to the podium. All right. OK, so classification, what I just showed you is kind of this idea that you have an image in and you put an image out, and you put classifications out. But what if you have multiple objects in the scene, or you have something in a corner of an object? You also want to know where in, the, uh, where in the scene that object is. And that enters this model uh, called single shot detection. It's a type of model. And uh, it turns out that our friends in uh, TensorFlow Research released a package called object detection as part of the TensorFlow models. And that basically allows you to uh, use their pre-trained model that recognizes many classes. So what I've done is I want to load that onto a small device. In this case, we had talk, we've shown you a lot of things about mobile devices. I want to show you another small device. This is a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is a really cool um, example of a device because it's very cheap and easy to get. So any high school student can have one of these. You can have many of these and just use them for a dedicated project. But the other great thing about them is not only are they relatively powerful, but they're also able to interface with other hardware. They have GPIO pins. Um, and uh, this, this can be capitalized in a number of different ways. But one way is to run Linux, and that's what we're doing here. But you can also use Android Things, which you can see one of the cool sand, uh, the, the sandbox uh, has many examples of doing that. So you could also do this with Android Things. So in this case, I have the system, um, the system board right here, and it's connected to a motor controller. And this motor controller is just a microcontroller that interfaces to um, servo motors. These servo motors can go up and down, left and right, and they can basically aim the camera. So now what we're going to do is we're going to load our object detection model onto this um, device, and we're going to actually run it in order to recognize um, different objects. So let's go to the demo feed, please. And we can see my app. You can tell by the uh, beautiful nature of this app that I'm not a great app developer. But this is what I can do on a weekend. So give me a, a little bit of slack. OK. So here, if we hold up the apple, it's recognizing the apple, and it's telling us you know, what probability and where the object is. Now, that's all good and fine. But when we couple it with the ability to move, where I'm going to turn on the motors now, and now I'm going to bring back the apple. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the apple in the, in the screen, and it's going to try to keep it centered. So as I move this apple, it's basically going to try to keep it centered. So it's like a little virtual camera person. And this works on other objects, like this banana here, hopefully. Oh, there we go. Um, and it's going to keep that centered. And if you put two objects in the, in the screen, it's going to try to keep them both in. OK, so, so we get a little bit of false detections. But basically, it's going to try to keep them both centered. So this is really uh, a fun application. And I bet you can come up with many different applications that are really exciting to do with this type of application. So can we go back to the slides again? And I'll get my clicker. So I, like I said, this is uh, basically what I can do in a weekend. But I imagine great app developers and people with a lot of uh, creativity about uh, connecting devices and connecting software can do many interesting things. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to tell you in summary, TensorFlow Lite, you've seen a lot about it. Basically, we feel it, it, TensorFlow Lite makes on-device ML small, fast, and easy. And we think that you're going to find it very useful in all of your applications. Uh, and we're excited to, to see what you build. Come talk to us. I'm going to be in office hours at uh, 1230. You can come talk to me. Uh, in addition, you can come to our sandbox if you haven't already. And we have, uh, of course, the examples that I showed you here. We have the, uh, um, the, the tracking camera. We also have the object classification on mobile device. But another cool thing that we have is um, the donkey cars. And this was done by a group outside of Google. And we converted them over to TensorFlow Lite. And we are excited to say that um, their application works really well with TensorFlow Lite as well. So with that, I hope you check these things out. Um, I want to tell you that if you want to get started, you can go to our documentation page. You can go to the tensorflow.org page, and there is a TF Lite page where you can find more information about it. In addition, our code is all open source. You can get it on GitHub. You can download it, modify it, submit a pull request, 
um, and of course, uh, file any issues that you have while using it. In addition, if you want to talk about TensorFlow Lite, talk about your applications, ask us about feature requests, please send to our mailing list. Um, this community is really exciting. We found that in open sourcing TensorFlow, we got a lot of excitement, we got a lot of interest, and we made it a much better piece of software to use for everyone, both people inside Google and outside Google. And we hope that you'll engage TensorFlow Lite in the same way that TensorFlow has been engaged. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention, uh, for coming to I.O., for listening to uh, our talk about TensorFlow Lite. I also want to thank you, uh, thank our Google partners. This product didn't come out of isolation. It came from all of our experience building mobile apps with machine intelligence. Uh, as we gained experience, we found that there was a common need, and that was the genesis of TensorFlow Lite. So all of our partners provided application, provided feedback, even provided code um, and help with, with our models. So thank you so much to you and to them, and enjoy the rest of I.O. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session. If you've registered for the next session in this room, we ask that you please clear the room and return via the registration line outside. Thank you. All point? All right. All right, that'll be available next year. Wow, that was fun. All right, so I have one last question for you. Um, what time is it? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my last question is, if I'm a developer and I want to find out more about uh, building something cool on Wear OS, where would I go? Uh, so now, developers can build actions on Google for the assistant and just keep the watch in mind and make sure you test on watches. And of course, everyone should come check us out at wearos.google.com to learn about the platform and everything it has to offer. All right, so there you go, actions on Google and wearos.google.com. And hey, did you like this video? Want to see something just like it or kind of close to it? Head on over to g.co slash io slash guide for more videos like this. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Hello, and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, and I'm here with Chet Haas, the Android Toolkit Lead. Hi, Chet. Hello, Florina. Tell me, Chet, what's new in Android P? Oh, are there new things? Let me think. Uh, yes, in fact, there are. Um, so there's a few new things. Um, one of the important ones uh, that we heard about in the keynote, too, was about dynamic app bundles. But I think there's another video on that. So I'm going to lead people to do their own research on that. Um, something else that was big was slices and actions. So both of these are ways of propagating intents that your application can take care of um, deeply in other applications. So you can propagate this information in a way that maybe the assistant or search can take advantage of that and perform that action uh, via like a button, right? So it can say, oh, I can, I can handle this. You put it in an actions.xml file and then search or some application, assistant, whatever, can uh, propagate a button into the UI so the user can click on that to perform that deep action. Slices is kind of like that. It allows you to perform these actions but with a, a much richer UI. Basically, it's a way for an application to propagate rich UI to perform all kinds of things in another process. Um, you can think of it as related to remote views, but way better. Uh, so that's, that, sorry, that's, that's exposed in limited ways right now, but we'll probably be building on that in, in more interesting ways. And there's APIs for developers to take advantage of that. How about the battery? Is there anything else finally for battery? How about that battery? Well, we are all power users, unfortunately, which means we need to keep working on things that we can do at a, at a platform level to preserve battery for users to get longer battery life. A couple of the things that are interesting that are going on in this release uh, includes app standby buckets. Um, so we determine the level of activity that a user has with an application, and based on that activity level, 
we expose capabilities of the platform to that application or not. It may not be appropriate for an application that the user hasn't actually run for a while to be taking up CPU and battery doing this thing in the background that probably the user didn't want them to be doing. Uh, so that's one thing. Another is uh, background restrictions. So if we notice that applications have bad behavior characteristics, things like holding wake locks for a very long period, which means the, the system can't go to sleep, or waking up frequently, or using services when they're not on power that they shouldn't be as frequently as they are, then they'll be propagated into a list that the user can see through settings and then disable background capabilities for that app to make sure that the user has control of how much battery is being used. Okay, cool. So we covered slices, battery, anything else exciting in P? Uh, well, there's exciting and there's necessary. Um, one of the necessary things that's there is that we're preventing applications from calling private APIs. Uh, it is possible now to call APIs which are not in the public platform, but through Reflection or J and I, you can get to these methods anyway. And we allow that because we didn't have a way to really stop that. You can sort of query this and go for it. Well, now in the ART runtime, we can detect that you are calling these methods from an application when they shouldn't be and we can prevent that. So in the preview release, which we encourage everybody to pick up and play with, we have these methods in a light gray or dark gray list, uh, which means that you're gonna get either a warning in the log or a toast popping up on the screen. So if your application is calling these and shouldn't be, you're gonna get a warning about it. But when that release comes out, it'll be on a blacklist and we'll simply stop it from being called. So the call to action would be Go run with the preview release for key and make sure that your application is safe from these. Um, and if it's not, then either fix your application or if it is some facility that you absolutely need, then maybe it's something that we can work on and we can put it on a whitelist instead. But you need to tell us that information, which is why we have the preview. So give us that feedback. Okay, great. There's this Android no, 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 no. there. there. No, 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 no. no? That, that's a totally different object. I think we need to talk oh. about text. Yeah. So what about text, text? Text happened in, in my larger toolkit team, so I understand that. Uh, in fact, you understand that. I want to ask you about text. So what happened in text? So in text, we released a few new APIs. Um, now you can pre-measure text. So this means that you can move all of that measuring work that takes quite a lot of time um, from rendering a character to a background thread. And, and why is that helpful? Well, because then the text is displayed faster. So faster rendering means less frames skipped. Sure. So it, it's also good because like, it, if it's time for you to display the text and then you have to measure it, it's not very helpful. But a lot of times you know ahead of time when you're going to need that. So you can actually ahead of time shove it off to a background thread so that by the time you need it, then you can display the text, which is awesome. What else we got? <laughs> We added a new feature for the user, the magnifier, yep. and we also added an API for that. So we now have three methods, uh, magnifier, show, update, and I think this miss. And this means that if you're developing your own custom views that also display text, you can also show that magnifier in your custom view. Also, it's not limited to text. That's the cool thing is we are using it for text because we wanted to make it easier for people to manipulate the cursor. But you can use it for whatever you want. If you need a zoomed in view, that API is general purpose. Okay, that's great. And I think we also added some more improvements on uh, Smart Linkify. Do you know more about that? I do. Smart Linkify is like Linkify, except it's smarter. Uh, so we already have the ability to uh, create links in a block of text for you if we detect things like phone numbers and addresses. That's been there forever. But now through machine learning models that we have on the system, which are used for things like smart text selection, we can detect more complex entities there. Uh, like you may select a word, which is part of a larger phrase, which we detect because of this entity detection in the model. Um, you can ask Linkify to detect those as, uh, as entity links as well. Can I now go back to this? Because oh, it feels right. like it's looking over our shoulder. Ah, yes. OK. So, so what's with the Android with a jetpack? Um, well, that would be Android Jetpack. So Android Jetpack is a set of components, as well as architectural guidance for helping developers build better Android applications. Uh, most, I would say all Android developers are familiar with a lot, of, a lot of what is in Android Jetpack already because we have taken all the goodness of support library and put it under this banner 
and we are going to continue to add to that, specifically with the intent of making Android development better and easier. So, I'll give you some examples. One of the big ones, one of my favorite things about Sephora Library is AppCompat and the way that we baked in the uh, releases for certain APIs into the package names. So now we have package names like V4 and V9 with some of the APIs. We don't even support those releases anymore. So I think all of the existing developers don't even think about it. That's just noise at the top of their at, at the top of their file, right? It's one of those imports they never look at. But I think if you're new to Android or if you're looking at the documentation, I think it's terribly confusing. So we're doing a major refactor where we turn all those package names into Android X dot whatever to be a little more sensible. Major effort. Um, it will require refactoring on our side, a lot of it, um, but also on developers' sides, but we're giving tools in Android Studio to help with that. Um, the other part of it is uh, the existing architecture components are a big piece of it, things like lifecycle support and room, view model, uh, all of that stuff is good. Also the new paging library, which went uh, 1.0 this week, uh, paging and recycler view, and we have two new things. Actually, they're, they're to our sides here at the demo table. We have navigation controller and we have work manager. Navigation controller makes it easier to create the links of the flow of your application. Um, it, it makes things like up versus back easier. And we also have a tool in Android Studio where you can visualize this and create those links. Um, so it's sort of an integration of the APIs as well as the tool uh, for making this complex application flow a lot easier to develop. And then Work Manager is about an easier way for creating and executing background tasks. Um, so before we would recommend, well, Job Scheduler is really good for scheduling things at particular times, you know, when Wi-Fi is there, when you're charging, whatever. Um, and that works really well if you're on KitKat and above. What if you're on an earlier release? Well, we also have Job Dispatcher, uh, which is in the Play Services APIs. Well, what if you're on a device that doesn't have Play Services? Well, then you're probably rolling your own solution. So applications would need to do all three of these. Work Manager is an attempt to have a simpler, more elegant, fluent API for doing all this stuff that handles all of that for you. Okay, right, so lots of new things, both in uh, Android, but also with Jetpack. Jetpack. So check out all the videos that we have uh, from, from Google I.O. And also check out the documentation on developer.android.com. Thank you, Chet. Thank you, Florino. Android Jetpack is here to accelerate Android development by facilitating a modern app architecture, eliminating boilerplate code, simplifying complex tasks, and providing robust backwards compatibility. Jetpack consists of architectural guidance supported by a set of libraries and tools in four key areas of Android development, architecture, UI, behavior, and foundation. Each Jetpack component is individually adoptable, but are built to work well together. Jetpack builds on the popular architecture components we introduced last year. These components facilitate a highly testable, robust app architecture while individually addressing developer pain points, such as lifecycle management or data persistence. We've also added three new architecture components, Paging, Navigation, and Work Manager. Paging facilitates gradual on-demand data loading from a local or network data source, allowing apps to work with large data sets, including support for Recyclerview. Navigation provides a framework to build app flows that comply with Android design guidelines, with proper behavior for up and back buttons, support for deep linking, automated fragment transactions, support for the overflow menu, navigation drawer, and bottom navigation. This is combined with a powerful graphical editor included in Android Studio to allow you to visualize, design, and test app navigation graphs. Work Manager makes it easy to schedule one-off or periodic asynchronous tasks. Tasks can execute in order, in parallel, or in even more complex configurations. It's also easy to query for the state of tasks and to provide constraints, such as requiring unmetered network or charging. Perhaps most importantly, Work Manager takes care of compatibility issues, so you know that no matter what platform the user is on, tasks are scheduled efficiently and with system-wide health in mind. UI components like animation, transitions, layouts such as constraint layout, text, emoji, and fragments, along with the TV leanback library, the where UI library, and the auto library are now part of Jetpack. Behavior includes support for evolving Android areas such as notifications, permissions, and sharing. 
Jetpack add support for slices, which allow your app to expose templatized pieces of itself to integrate with other apps, such as Google Search and Assistant. Foundation includes AppCompat, libraries for automated testing, and new Android KTX Kotlin extensions, which make Android development with Kotlin more concise, idiomatic, and modern. And we're just getting started with Android Jetpack. We have a roadmap of useful libraries and tools in development to help your Android projects take flight. To get started, check out developer.android.com slash jetpack.
Afternoon, morning, lunch-ish. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to talk about battery. Uh, so it's another year, and I'm here again to talk to you about, about power. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing, ongoing project. And as you probably saw from the keynote, uh, Dave talked about Maslow's or his own version of the pyramid. And I think it's actually like a lot is, is in this image. Uh, battery is, is foundational to everything you're doing on your phone. right? If you don't have power, you don't really have any of the cool features. You don't have the camera. You don't have the assistant. Um, battery exists to power all the other things. Battery exists to power all the other things. And it's a, it's a struggle for us, and a struggle, I think, for all of you as well, is you want to do awesome things for users. And you also want to save power so they can do those things for longer. And battery is actually a really easy problem to solve. You just take, just kill everything. Fixed, I'll take my promotion. Um, it's, it's great. Uh, the, the problem is it's obviously much more nuanced than that. And that is a struggle that we have internally every day talking about power and what are the right trade-offs uh, for users. And that's always a really hard question. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and some of the things that we're building uh, into Android P to, to make it a lot easier. And so the, the first thing I want to talk about is where, where, is it, where is it going? And this is like a, a horrifically simplified. I'm sure some of the engineers out there are like, oh my god, he's showing this. But you have hardware. Things even like how much RAM you have in your device um, cause a persistent drain on what's happening there. So what hardware the OEM has selected, what hardware you're using, how big your screen is, how bright your screen is, all play into that, that effect. You have the OS itself. Is the kernel being really efficient? Is it waking up a lot? Is it doing, has it, does it have a lot of overhead? Um, is, do you have disk encryption? Is that disk encryption in software or hardware? Um, those things all affect then your overall power profile that's happening under the hood. The next thing is apps and services. And this is where we're going to spend a, bunch of, a bit of time talking today. Um, obviously, what apps you have on your phone and the services running on that phone drive power substantially, largely through the CPU and through network connectivity. And then the last one is the user's interaction with the device itself, how they behave, what applications they use, how quickly they respond to notifications or don't, um, all impact uh, the overall picture of where a battery ends up. Really complicated topic. We're going to talk largely about the bottom, uh, bottom left corner today. But the, uh, the thing I wanted just to give is, before we get into that is, what, what other things have we done, and how does the stuff we're going to talk about in P uh, affect the overall strategy? So we started out with Lollipop with uh, Job Scheduler. And Job Scheduler was a very powerful tool to avoid uh, apps just having to hang out on services all the time, processing in the background. But you could schedule a piece of work and have that piece of work done in a finite amount of time. And the OS could then have some variability on when to schedule it. Next, we did Doze. And Doze was largely targeted at cases where you have your, your tablet or a phone. You put it down. You're not using it. You put it in a drawer, and you forget about it. And hopefully, when you pull it back out and use it again a few days later, it still has a battery. And Doze was really trying to, to target that problem and was largely successful at, at dealing with that. We, didn't, we had to go further, though, and that was with uh, Doze on the go, or Doze Lite, as we tend to call it internally because it's just faster, is that was targeted at phones. And like I have my phone hanging out in my pocket. I'm not using it right now, but I'm moving around, so I'm not in a drawer. That is then the next like, step was how do we get that to be a good scenario. And Doze on the go is trying to look at that scenario of your phone screen is off, you're maybe moving around, so you're probably not wanting all your apps to be quite as severely restricted as full Doze, but you still need to be a little bit backed off normal scenarios where the screen is on. We still needed to do more and go deeper. The next thing was looking at uh, background limits. And this was largely targeted at background services as a whole. Now we'd had jobs around for quite a while. We also were looking at background limits for location and trying to figure out what's the right balance of applications looking at location in the background versus the foreground, and should there be different thresholds of what is appropriate. Really good effect with that. Um, the only, do only downside, if you will, to what we did with Oreo was we needed apps to target the Oreo SDK. And I'll talk about that in a moment in order to support this. And then P, obviously, since we're here, we're going to talk about some more stuff um, that we've been, we've been working on. The, the one thing I wanted to take a moment, because we're mostly going to talk about really cool ML and other exciting things, is there was a lot of just brute force optimization that the engineering team has also done. Um, this was looking at F2FS file system work. This was looking at how do we choose between whether a process should be on a small core or a big core, looking at when we should do CPU boost so that you have nice buttery smooth sliding, but you're not just burning power when the screen is on in anticipation that the user might interact with the screen. 
And these were all a bunch of things that have been done over the years. This is a set that we just did on, on P. Um, and there's probably still more that we're trying to get done. And then the, the, the thing is, there's still some, some of those big, big challenges that are, that are remaining. And this is what we're going to talk about today, is what we noticed was battery drain was roughly proportional to the number of apps you had on the phone, not the number of apps you were using, but how many you had installed. And I, obviously, that's not ideal. And so we wanted to try and remedy that. We also saw a lot of scenarios where apps are accidentally making mistakes. Like if you're working with wake locks, you're kind of playing with fire. And what happens when a mistake happens? And usually, the battery would suffer. Also, some developers would be really aggressive with, with, with their use case and trying to be like, oh, I must be there all the time, ready to go at a moment's notice. And sometimes that might take an awful lot of battery to achieve that. And is that really in the interest of the user? And how can we help, help balance that back out? And Because the last part is, even when an, an app was aggressive or an app had a mistake, it wasn't obvious to the user as to what to do. They didn't know. Is the battery menu going to help me? Does it tell me everything? Does it catch all the cases, some of the cases, none of the cases? Um, and even when you saw a high battery value, now what? Do I uninstall? Do I live with it? Do I call up the developer and send them a nasty gram? And so that's something else we wanted to really look into. And then the very last one that I mentioned before is the Oreo SDK, having apps targeting that SDK to say, I understand how the background limits work. I understand how I can use jobs and use alarms instead of using services. Um, as you probably saw, there was an announcement uh, late last year talking about uh, targeting requirements for applications on the Play Store. If you haven't seen that, please go Google that and find out about it. Um, you should be looking at it because those requirements are kicking in later this year. And that's going to ensure that then on P, the majority of the apps on your phone are now running the Oreo SDK. And all these features we're talking about work. So the, the High level thing we're going to talk about here is a feature called Adaptive Battery, which uh, I think was been talked about in a few different talks already. Talk about Battery Saver and trying to make Battery Saver better. And then also additional restrictions around background processing that we've been, been looking at. And this is also how to help users understand when can I make it stop? Can I have another choice other than uninstall? Something in the middle between live with it and remove it. Uh, and that's like this that kind of pyramid trying to articulate here is we all want good power efficiency. Right? We like batteries that last a long time. We want really cool apps. And we don't want the user to have to manage between these things. Like, do I want cool apps or do I want power efficiency? Um, no one wants to have to be forced to make that choice. It's, hor it's horri horrifically difficult. I don't want to make it. No one wants to make it. We want it just to work. And that's what this uh, whole project has been all about. And so with that, I'm going to invite uh, James up here to talk about uh, adaptive battery. Thanks. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm James. I'm uh, representing the DeepMind team today. Just wanted to say that we're really pleased to be here and working with Android um, and excited about what uh, we've built together. So as a user, you shouldn't have to closely manage how your apps behave on your device. A modern, intelligent operating system should just take care of it. And that's where machine learning can help. We've co-developed this feature with Android called Adaptive Battery. It intelligently aligns app power consumption with app usage. Apps can still run in the background when they need to, and users don't need to micromanage. So Adaptive Battery uses the concept of app standby buckets. Every app on the device is assigned to one of these buckets. Each bucket has different limits on background activity. And there are four buckets, ranging from active to rare. Apps in the rare bucket will have the most restrictions. And we use the ML model to assign apps to buckets based on their predicted usage. So for example, apps that are predicted to be open in the next few hours. I'm here at I.O., so I might be using the I.O. app. So the I.O. app is going to be in the active bucket. But in a few days' time, when I'm back at home, Adaptive Battery is going to automatically determine that I'm unlikely to be using this app and put it into the rare bucket so it's not unnecessarily consuming resources like battery. So what are the restrictions that are applied? Jobs, alarms, Firebase cloud messaging, and network are all restricted in Android P 
depending on which bucket the app is in. Apps in the active bucket have no restrictions, just like it is today. Working set has some restrictions on jobs and alarms. And frequent and rare buckets introduce restrictions on the number of high priority Firebase cloud messages. Messages beyond that cap will be treated as normal priority so they'll be batched together with other messages to save battery. Generally, as developers, you should assume the background activity will be deferred and ensure that your app can work under those conditions. But one thing to remember is that once you, this device is plugged into power, all of the restrictions are lifted. There are ADB commands that you can use to test your app in each bucket to make sure that it performs as expected. You can also use new framework APIs to get your app's current bucket at runtime. Most apps should be fine if they are already following best practices, such as using jobs for background work and targeting recent API levels like Android Oreo. As Ben just said, this is going to be a requirement for app updates on the Play Store later this year. So please make sure you're targeting the latest SDK versions. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. The model was built by Android and DeepMind to predict which apps go into which bucket. Now, we could have done this with simple heuristics, or we could have even just used past behavior on the device. But we found that machine learning allows us to capture the nuance of how users behave with their apps. And I'll go into some detail on how we built the model in a second. For those of you who are interested uh, in the architecture of the model, we're using a two-layer deep convolutional neural net with a feed-forward neural net on top. And this is used to predict the probability that an app will be opened in a given interval. You might have heard of convolutional neural nets before, particularly they're quite common in image classifiers. But we've used them here to measure higher, levels, higher level patterns of app usage over time. It turns out they're pretty good at that. Now, all of this is happening on device using TensorFlow. And that's actually a first for DeepMind. We've never deployed production models on the compute power of a single device. And a single mobile device with the limited compute power that's available is a particular set of challenges. And of course, we're building this machine learning model with the intention of attempting to save power. And if we are doing machine learning on device, we have to be careful that we're not spending more power than we are saving. We're going to be making this model available to all device manufacturers so they can take it if they wish for their devices on Android P, or they can implement their own, or they can take an Android open source version of it as well. So the model. We trained the model on millions of sequences of app opens and transitions to discover the patterns of how users behave. So an example would be, if you use an app at 8 o'clock in the morning every morning, you're probably quite likely to open it tomorrow at 8 o'clock as well. But if you only use a certain app on weekends, like a game or a travel app, then you're probably not going to open it on Monday morning. And the model is able to capture this nuance. The model looks at the user's behavior and outputs a probability of when you're next going to open a particular app. The model compares the usage to the patterns we've observed in the data. And the behavior on device will influence the predictions given by the model. So we've also built this model with certain principles in mind. We've tried to make it fair. There is no favoritism of one app over another. If you use one particular app in exactly the same way that I use a different app, then the model will output the same predictions. And they will be assigned to the same buckets. It's privacy sensitive. There is no personally identifiable information used by the model, both when it's trained and when it runs on the device. The model only compares the app usage on device to our known sequences of millions of app transitions. And it predicts when you're next going to use that app. 
So if you combine the app standby buckets and their restrictions with this model that predicts when you're next going to open the apps, that's the adaptive battery feature. It's a system that adapts the phone to you. The output of the model is used to personalize the OS's behavior to adapt it to how you use the phone. So the apps that you use get to run in the background, and the apps that you don't, don't. We hope this will create a more consistent battery experience for users. I'm now going to pass over to Medan, who's a product manager on Android, to talk about the battery saver features. Thanks very much. Good job. There you go, man. Good. Thank you, James. So let's talk about battery saver. Uh, many of us actually run through the day. And as we end towards the day, we realize that, oh, I won't be able to actually make it. And Battery Saver is there to actually save you. Remember those red bars when our animations that were janky in Oreo? Who liked those? So we got rid of them. We also actually turn off location that helps battery. In addition to that, Many device-specific features, like ambient display as an example, are also turned off. All of these add up in order to save battery and prolong the device battery so that you can go back and charge the device. We have also made some changes in the UI so that you can live on this mode for longer. Now you have a slider that you can actually increase all the way to the right, which probably allows you to stay on this mode if you choose to. But what's also interesting is, what we found is, if an app is being used by the user in this mode, having a dark theme really helps. Our internal tests show that apps using dark theme save power compared with the ones that don't. So if you are a developer that already supports dark theme, please do think about switching to dark theme when you detect that the device is in battery saver. There are a few commands that you can use through ADB to force the, force the device into battery saver and test them. And for those of you who already support dark mode, there are APIs like ease power save mode and a broadcast that you can use to switch your device, your uh, app theme to dark. So let's jump into the battery settings itself. We think when a user actually goes into a battery settings, probably they are having a bad battery day. You want to make the user very easy to take actions. You want to keep the UI simplified. And we will tell you exactly what applications might be causing their battery drain. So we'll be much more opinionated about these things. And in addition to that, as you scroll down, we'll also be able to see how long your battery will last. And that number is also powered by an ML model. So let's jump into that opinionated background restrictions. So we have some principles upon which we have built this particular feature. User asks for controls. They want to know like, which app is doing what so that they can take a quick action on them. We also want to make sure that apps that don't necessarily target Oreo are also be well managed by the user. And lastly, our goal is to make sure that apps don't get restricted in the first place. So that way, apps fundamentally are a better battery citizens. So with P, we will actually launch this feature with two specific criteria. The first one is if your app is still not targeting Oreo and has a background service. The second one is if an app holds wake locks, or what we call as stuck wake locks, for more than an hour in the background. Both of these are very well understood causes for battery drain. There are more such reasons. We today present those reasons within Play Developer Console, and we call them Android Vitals. 
So we are, in the future, going to be looking at many such signals in order to incorporate into coming up with new rules for background restrictions. So what does it mean for your app in case if the user decides to restrict them? As James talked about jobs, alarms, services, and network, the apps will not be able to do any of those in the background. There are some explicit intents, for example, location, will not be delivered to those applications. So we're trying to minimize the reasons why an app should be able to use device resources when it is in the background. And lastly, if an app is in the background and restricted, it won't be able to use foreground services. So as I spoke earlier, I hope many of you are already familiar with Android Vitals. If not, I would strongly recommend you to go take a look into what signals do we actually show uh, in there today and how your app is behaving. We have heard many success stories of application developers using this data in order to improve their applications. And we, in fact, use some of these signals internally also to make OS better, trying to figure out like, what kind of changes we could be making in order to have the right guardrails within the OS to make sure that app necessarily don't accidentally drain battery. There was a session about it. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to listen to those, please take a look at the recording. So we made the UI simplify, but there might be several of you who would fall into as power users. So you do like graphs, and you do like number or percentages. So we do have it in the overflow menu. Now the graph is improved via better predictions. And the user can take action from this screen if you see any app that is not necessarily that surprises you as being consuming more battery. So from here, you can directly preemptively restrict applications or unrestrict them. This is a good user control uh, for users to have. So how do you test for this? Again, there is ADB commands that you can use to put your app to a restricted state or unrestrict them and test them while uh, they are in the state. Note that even an app that has been restricted could still be used by the user by launching them explicitly. So you want to make sure that they still work. So we have gone through some of the key features in P. And what does it mean for you as an app developer to continue to actually deliver your uh, features using various affordances that the OS offers, like jobs, alarms, and so on and so forth? What does it mean for you to do a background work? You might have actually seen this flowchart before Ben presented last year. It literally went through what is it that you want to do and offered some choices. We want to simplify our recommendation. And thanks to Jetpack, in it we have a great tool. So it's extremely simplified now, hopefully. So if you want to think about doing anything in the background, we highly recommend you to actually evaluate Work Manager as a go-to thing. And if you think it is something that is really important and must happen now, of course, you have the ability to use foreground services. But note that if you use foreground services, you have to tell the user why you are using it for, because there will be a notification. And you'll have to justify yourself as to why you think it is important. And now, because of that, if you change your mind, Go back to Work Manager. So if none of this work, think about actually doing the work when the app actually is launched and being actively used by the user. So the choices are, hopefully, very simplified. All of this really help us manage battery better, and that will lead to having a better battery life. There have been some sessions that have already happened, so I want to call uh, 
shout out to Jet Jetpack, which talks about Work Manager. Uh, there was also a session on Android Vitals, and there is a DevByte video. There is a detailed documentation of the features that we talked about. Uh, please head over to d.android.com slash power. And finally, since we won't be taking any questions, uh, please do find us. All the three of us will be in the office hours at uh, 2.30 to 3.30 in the office hours space. Look for Android Framework uh, office hours. And finally, uh, if you have any feedback, uh, here is a URL. And thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session. If you've registered for the next session in this room, we ask that you please clear the room and return via the registration line outside. Thank you. who we're, we're raising in the world for the, for the future. Because for, I know I'm going to be relying on my young child to take care of me. <laughs> and I want him to know some things. So, you know, that's, it's always on my mind, and it's something that I, I think I'm now more than ever driven to do and include as part of my design aesthetic. Yeah, it's almost like if you can see it, you can be it. Absolutely. Um, and I've been watching, you know, I watch all the videos on Twitter. People will send me stuff of teachers teaching 
um, about the sort of, you know, things that we did, you know, I, I did a deep dive, but it was sort of a, a lighter dive into uh, the technology in Black Panther and the science in Black Panther. And, and teachers are coming up with a way to teach their class using Black Panther as an example of sort of our, our vibranium and our, uh, you know, sound science that we use in the movie. And, and to see that being a coming part of like a curriculum and kids getting excited about it because they see themselves and yeah, I can, I can do this is, I mean, you can't ask for anything more. And so, I, you know, I, I've always thought like, what can I do to better the world as one individual? And I didn't really know ever what that was until I think after Black Panther and I saw the response of um, young kids and it was all about the representation. And so, you know, that does become a design, a design choice. And uh, it's something that I think that I'm just gonna do now forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that a little bit more because uh, you're on record as saying that when you were working on Black Panther, you were just focusing on it being good, yeah. right? <laughs> and, but then afterwards, looking back on how big a deal this is for how many people? How has your perspective changed? I mean, it, it hugely, because it was just, you're kind of in it, you know, and you can't, like you were saying, see the forest through the trees. So you're just wanting to make sure it's good and it's right and that people are gonna be happy and proud and that, you know, you did the right thing, you made the right choices, because at the end of the day, it was a lot of responsibility in some aspects. So I, you know, and then after when I saw it, I was like, I mean, my eyes were, cause I did a little bit of the VFX. I was there for a little bit, but I didn't see the final, final edit. I saw one of the cuts. So when I was there in the theater with everybody else, I was blown away. I was like, this is insane. I can't believe I did this. <laughs> and, and seeing the response is, it's just on another level. It's just, you know, it's really hard to put into words or articulate in a way that others can understand because it really is it made me speechless in a sense. Um, there hasn't been the words made yet to describe what that's like, but it was certainly always about making a good movie with a great story and uh, hopefully everything else sort of fell in line. And then we had other great filmmakers, Ruth Carter, who is uh, Oscar nominated costume designer who I worked with really intensively to make sure that what we did matched up, you know, because a lot of what she did in the foreground on the characters defined who they were um, on screen. So that also gave back to the representation of powerful women who had their own agency about them and could make their own decisions and stand up for themselves and could think quick on their feet. That's a whole nother sense of representation and a social aspect for young kids, young girls, um, and the men who, you know, uh, treated them on this uh, equal playing field. There was no, uh, uh, like, oh, we need to make it easy for the girls. You know, you saw the door fight. You saw the king treat them as if they were, when they were the most powerful, uh, you know, guards in, uh, in Wakanda. So it's, it's all of those things mixed together. Then you talk about the technology on top of that. You're giving a, a new generation, old generations, my generation, a whole nother narrative than the one that we've sort of heard for the last how many ever decades. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology, but not go away from the human aspects that you're talking about. And I think one of the things that's always really interested me in technology is not how to make tech just sort of better on its own um, and then teach people how to use it, but rather teach technology how to be better for people. Absolutely. And I, th and I think that you've really captured in this film um, an intersection with culture and people and technology. How did you approach that? Oh, that's heavy, man. <laughs> um, you know, very carefully, because it's really trying to understand community, what the needs of community are, and then how do we envelop the technology, just what you said. And I know for Ryan, community was really important. So, it, and I talked to a lot of experts. It wasn't just me sort of coming up with things. I talked to a lot of people who really knew nanotechnologists, neuroscientists, archeologists, geologists, geographers, um, on a daily basis to understand how to fold that in. And I think one of the biggest things that I did was I tried to find, a lot of the tech was based on biomimetics. So I tried to find in nature and in the different cultures what the use of something was and then the evolution of it. 
Because at the end of the day, it is all about the evolution of it, how we are in society and how we are uh, advancing technologically. So it was me relating these things back in a way that represented what they are really used for and how they would have evolved over time. And I think technologically, oftentimes, it is the thing for the thing's sake and not here is, you know, something that has been such a, a, a big part of a tradition of any nationality, any ethnicity, any culture, religion. And this is how it becomes useful in a, in a futuristic and advanced way. Um, if that means technology, then that's the way that it would be. So that's sort of how I strung those together. And then pulling from nature. That was a huge one and thereby keeping everything organic, in a sense. So it becomes not such a scary thing, but a very organic thing, because we're so used to seeing certain things in nature, patterns, shapes, uh, you know, geometry, all of these things, math, science, it's all around us constantly. So it was really easy at some point to start just looking just into nature, because it's, it is science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is technology, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the way everything works. So looking beyond the the hardware and the finish of the hardware of it and into the or, organic nature of it all. That, that's a, like a little dive into how <laughs> it went. <laughs> it must have been a very full 14 months working on this film. Beyond. We were on three continents. We were in two states and I had a team at any given moment that were 500 strong. Um, just in my department, so we went 14 months and we went uh, hard as we could go for 14 months to get this done and, and put every last, like my whole team put every last inch of themselves. So, you know, it was a beautiful thing because we, we represented the diaspora, just our crew. So it was a micro version of the macro that we were building in Wakanda and I lived that every single day for a little over a year. All right, I want to ask you about what's next, but it doesn't have to be specific projects. But it's like, where do you go from here with everything that you've talked about, right? Like the, the production design itself, but like the bigger themes and ideas that you're working on. Uh, you know, I'm ch challenging myself, I think, to try to continue to do things that are out of my comfort zone. Something I learned from Ryan Coogler, who has taken me from Fruitvale Station to a boxing movie Creed to a comic book movie Black Panther. I want to continue the trend on my own and not just be in a place that I feel comfortable. My next project with Melina Matsuko, who is a director um, for Insecure, we're doing, I'm, I'm just working on the pilot for Why the Last Man, which is a graphic novel. Yes, I've read the entire series. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so I'm going to be designing the um, pilot. We're working on that currently. I can't really say much more than that, but it's super <laughs> exciting. The script is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and our approach to it is going to be, I think, something really cool. So I'm really super excited about that. Worked with Beyonce again. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the future is... Um, wide open and if Denis Villeneuve is uh, listening I'd love to do Dune. <laughs> yes. I throw that out every opportunity I can get, Denis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and all the work that you do. Thank you so much. It's super exciting. I'm so happy to be here and uh, I think I'm going to learn something today too. So, you know, it's all about soaking in all this greatness. So, fabulous. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. All the way up now. I can't imagine how anybody passes a problem that they know that they can fix and doesn't try to fix it. That's not some complicated thing. It's just stop talking about it and start doing it. I feel an absolute obligation to serve. I did two tours in Iraq as a helicopter pilot. I loved being part of the cavalry. But then I got injured, and that caused me to lose my ability to fly. One day you're a soldier, and then overnight they rip off that tag and slap veteran on your chest. I didn't know where to start looking for the next thing. What I do is math and engineering. So I had to find a way to apply those things in a meaningful way. 
service doesn't end when you get out of the military, it just changes. And I started reading about the research that they were doing at the Human Engineering Research Lab. And I thought, man, I gotta go be a part of that. Pearl's mission is to help people with disabilities increase independence and quality of life. I prepare the software to support the research that we do. One of the big things that I've done is help us transition to using Android tools. They make things really accessible. Anybody can sit down and start using these technologies and perform the tasks that we hope that it'll be useful for. That's the right thing to do, is to make things not just able to be used, but to be used with the same sort of joy or ease as I do. A big part of why open technology is so attractive to engineers like myself is there such an active community of people designing and innovating. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> All three of my children have a disability. The fact that my son has autism is just one little part of him. But almost his entire existence is defined by that autism. There was part of me that hoped someday I'd be able to help my son be able to live independently and give him a future. What's that? That's part of why I became an engineer. It's part of why I get into this field. There's going to be a time where someone like my son will have gotten a better opportunity, a better swing at this thing. I'm not going to sit around and wait for somebody else to fix the problem. There's not a minute to be wasted thinking about anything but the good things that we can do.
who's interested in AI? <laughs> Woo! Me too. <laughs> Me three. Okay, so I'm, I'm the moderator today. I'm Diane Green, and I'm running Google Cloud and on the Alphabet board. And I, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our really amazing guests we have here. I, I also live on this Stanford campus, so I've known one of our guests a long time because she's a neighbor. Um, so let me just introduce them. Uh, first is Fei -Fei, Dr. Fei-Fei Li, and she is the chief scientist for Google Cloud. She also runs the AI lab at Stanford University, the Vision Lab, and then she also uh, founded Sailors, which is now AI for All, which you'll hear about a little bit later. And um, is there anything you want to add to that, Feifei? I'm your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. And so then uh, the other, um, so now we have Greg Corrado, and uh, actually there's one amazing coincidence. Both Fei-Fei and Greg were undergraduate physics majors at Princeton together at the same time. And didn't really know each other that well in the 18-person class. We were, we were like, studying too no, it was. It was kind of surprising to, you know, go to undergrad together and then none, neither of us in computer science and then rejoin later, only once we were here. <laughs> All paths lead yeah. to AI and neural networks and so forth. But anyhow, so Greg is a principal scientist in the Google Brain Group. He co-founded it. And more recently, he's been doing a lot of amazing work in health with neural networks and machine learning. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford, and so he came into AI in a very interesting way. And maybe he'll talk about the similarities between the brain and what's going on in AI. Would you like to add anything else? Or? No, yeah. sounds good. Okay. So I thought, since both of them have been involved in the AI field for a while, and uh, it wasn't you know, it's recently become a really big deal, but it'd be nice to get a little perspective on the history, you know, uh, in yours in vision and yours in neuroscience about um, AI and, and, and how it was so natural to, for it to evolve to where it is now and what you're doing. And start sure. with Fei Fei. I guess I'll start. So, first of all, AI is a very nascent field in the history of science, of human civilization, this is a field of only 60 years of age. And it started with a very, very simple but fundamental quest, is can machines think? And we all know thinkers and thought leaders like Alan Turing challenged humanity with that question, can machines think? So about 60 years ago, a group of very uh, pioneering scientists, computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, started really this field. In fact, John McCarthy, who founded Stanford's AI lab, coined the very word artificial intelligence. So where do we begin to build machines that think? Humanity is best at looking inward and in ourselves and try to draw inspiration from who we are. So we started thinking about building machines that resemble human thinking. And when you think about human intelligence, you start thinking about different aspects, the ability to reason, the ability to see, the ability to hear, to speak, to move around, make decisions, manipulate. So AI started from that very core a foundational dream 60 years ago started to proliferate as a field of multiple subfield, which includes robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition. And then a very important development happened around the 80s and 90s, which is a sister field called machine learning started to blossom. And that's a field combining statistical learning statistics, statistics with computer science. And combining the quest of machine intelligence, which is 
what AI was born out of with the tools and, and the capabilities of machine learning. AI as a field went through an extremely fruitful, productive, blossoming uh, period of time. And fa fast forward to the second decade of 21st century, the latest machine learning booming that we are observing is called deep learning, which has a deep root in neuroscience, which I'll let you talk about. And uh, so combining deep learning as a powerful statistical machine learning tool with the quest of making machines more intelligent, whether it's to see or is it to um, hear or to speak, we're seeing this blossom. And last, I just want to say three critical factors converged around the, the, the uh, last decade, which is the 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, which are the three computing factors. One is the advance of hardware that enabled more powerful and capable computing. Second is the emergence of big data, powerful data that can drive the statistical learning algorithms. And I was lucky to be involved myself in some of the effort. And then the third one is the advances of machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So this convergence of three major factors brought us the AI boom that we're seeing today. And Google has been investing in all three areas, um, honestly, earlier than the curve. Most of the um, effort started even in early 2000s. And as a company, we're doing a lot of AI work from research to products. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the divergence and exploration in various academic fields and then the reconvergence as we see ideas that are aligned. So it wasn't, as Faye says, Faye says it wasn't so long ago that fields like cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even things that we don't talk about much more like cybernetics, were really all aligned in a single discipline. And then they've moved apart from each other and explored these ideas independently for a couple of decades. And then with the renaissance in artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're starting to see some reconvergence. So some of these ideas that were popular only in a small community for a couple of decades are now coming back into the mainstream of what artificial intelligence is, what statistical pattern recognition is, and has really been delightful to see. But it's not just one idea. It's actually multiple ideas that you see that were maintained for a long time in fields like cognitive science that are coming back into the fold. So another example beyond deep learning is actually reinforcement learning. So for the longest time, if you looked at a university catalog of courses and you were looking for any mention of reinforcement learning whatsoever, you were going to find it in a, in a psychology department or a cognitive science department. But today, as we all know, we look at reinforcement learning as a new opportunity, as a, something that we actually look at for the future of AI that might be something that's important to get machines to really learn in completely dynamic environments, in, uh, in environments where they have to explore entirely new stimuli. So I've been really excited to see how this convergence has happened back in the direction from those ideas into mainstream computer science. And I think that there's some hope for exchange back in the other direction. So neuroscientists and cognitive scientists today are starting to ask whether we can take the kind of computer vision models uh, that, that Fei Fei helped pioneer and use those as hypotheses for how it is that neural systems actually compute, how our own biological brains see. Um, and I think that that's a really, it's really exciting to see this kind of exchange between uh, disciplines that have been uh, separated for a little while. You know, one little piece of history I think that's also interesting is what you did, Feifei, with ImageNet, which is a nice way of expl explaining, you know, 
um, building these neural networks where you labeled all these images and then people could refine their algorithms by Go ahead and explain that just real quickly. Okay, sure. So um, about 10 years ago, that the whole community of computer vision, which is a subfield of AI, was working on a holy grail uh, problem of object recognition, which is you open your eye, you can see the world full of objects like flowers, chairs, people, you know, um, and that's a building block of visual intelligence and intelligence in general. And to crack that problem, we were building as a field different machine learning models. We're making small progress, but we're hitting a lot of walls. And uh, when my student and I started working in this problem and started thinking deeply about what is missing in the way we're approaching this problem, we recognized this important interplay between data and statistical machine learning models they really reinforce each other in very deep mathematical ways that we're not going to talk about the details here. And that realization was also inspired by human vision. If you look at how children learn, it's a lot of learning through big data experiences and exploration. So combining that, we decided to put together a pretty um, epic effort of we wanted to label all the images we can get on the internet. And of course, we Google searched a lot. And we downloaded billions of images and used crowdsourcing technology to label all the images, organize them into a data set of 15 million images uh, in, um, organized in um, 22,000 categories of objects and put that to, uh, together and that's the ImageNet project. And we democratized it to the research world and released it open source. And then we, starting 2010, we um, held an international challenge for the whole AI community called ImageNet Challenge. And one of the teams from Toronto, which is now at Google, um, won the ImageNet challenge yeah, yeah. with the uh, deep learning convolutional neural network model. Mm -hmm. And that was year 2012. And a lot yeah. of people think the combination of ImageNet and the, the deep learning model in 2012 was the onset of what we gave people yeah. a way to compare how they were doing. Exactly. And it was really yeah. good. So yeah. And so Greg, you've been doing a lot of uh, brain-inspired research, very interesting research, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of very impactful research in the health area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the ImageNet example actually sort of sets a playbook for how we can try to approach a problem. Um, the kind of machine learning uh, and AI that is most practical and most useful today is ones where machines learn through imitation. It's an imitation game where if you have examples of a task being performed correctly, the machine can learn to imitate this. And this is called supervised learning. And so what happened in the image recognition case is that by, by Feifei building an object recognition data set, we could all focus on that problem in a really concrete tractable way in order to compare different methods. And it turned out that uh, methods like deep learning and artificial neural networks were able to do something really interesting in that space that previous machine learning and artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence methods had not, which was that they were able to go directly from the data to the predictions and break the problem up into many smaller steps without having be being told exactly how to do that. So that's what we were doing before, is that we were trying to engineer features or cues, things that we could see in the stimuli that then we would do a little bit of statistical learning on to figure out how to combine these signals. But with artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're actually learning to do those things all together. And this applies not only to computer vision, but it applies to most things that you could imagine a machine imitating. And so the kinds of things that we've done, like with, um, with Google Smart Reply and now Smart Compose, 
we're taking that same approach, that if you have a lot of text data, which it turns out the internet is full of, what you can actually do is you can look at uh, the sequence of words so far in a conversation or in, in, um, a, uh, in an email exchange and try to guess what comes next. You know, and, you know I'm going to interrupt here a little bit and um, get a little more provocative here. All right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, neural inspired machine learning and so forth. And uh, so, you know, this artificial intelligence is kind of bringing into question what are we humans? And then there's this thing all there called artificial general AGI, artificial general intelligence. What do you think's going on here? Are we getting to AGI? I really don't think so. <laughs> so so uh, there's a variety of opinions in the community, but my feeling is that, okay, we've finally gotten artificial neural networks to be able to recognize photos of cats, right? That's really great. Um, uh, we, we also, it's now can... Uh, Fei, you know, Fei was that AGI when we recognized a cat? No, that's not enough yeah. to define AGI. So the kind of thing that's working well right now is this sort of pattern recognition, this immediate response where we're able to recognize something kind of reflexively. And we now have, I believe, machines can do pattern recognition every bit as well as humans can. And that's why they can recognize objects in photos, that's why they can do speech recognition, and that's why they can win at a game like Go. But that is only one small sliver, a tiny sliver, of what goes into something like intelligence. Uh, notions of memory and planning and strategy and contingencies, even emotional intelligence, these are things that are, have just, we haven't even scratched the surface. And so to me, I feel like it's really a leap too far to imagine that having finally cracked pat pattern recognition after some, some decades of trying, that we are therefore on the verge of cracking all of these other problems that go into what constitutes general intelligence. Although so, we have gone way faster than either of you ever expected us to go, I believe. Um, yes and no. H humanity has a tendency to, un um, to, to overestimate um, short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So eventually we will be achieving things that we cannot dream of. But Diane and Greg, I want to just give a simple example to define AGI. <laughs> so the definition of AGI, again, is an introspective definition of what humans and human intelligence can do. I have a two-year-old daughter who doesn't like napping. And uh, I, I thought I'm smart enough to scheme to put her in a very complicated sleeping bag that doesn't get herself out of the crib. And uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the monitor watching this kid, two-year-old, where for the first time, she, I was training her for napping for, by herself. She was very angry. So she looked around, figured out a weak spot on the crib where she might be able to climb out, figured out how to unzip her complicated sleeping bag that I thought I schemed to do really, you know, uh, to, to, to prevent that, and figured out a way to climb out of a crib that's way taller than who she is and managed to escape safely and, um, and <laughs> without breaking well, okay, her legs. Okay, how about AGI equivalent to my cat? or equivalent to, my, to a mouse? If you're shifting the definition, sure. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> but even cat, I think there are things that the cat is capable yeah. of doing that... So, uh... so I do think that if you, if you look at an organism like a cat from a behavioral level, like the, what, how cats behave and how they respond to their environments, I think that you could imagine a world where you have something like a, a toy that you know, is for entertainment purposes that approximates a cat in a bunch of ways in that the sorts of behaviors that the human observe, you're like, oh, it walks around, it doesn't bump into things, it meows at me every once in a while. I do believe that we can build a system like that. But what you can't do is you can't take that robot and then you know, uh, dump it in the forest and have it figure out what it needs to do in order to, to, to survive and make okay. things work. Okay. But, but it's a goal. It's a healthy goal. To, it's a to, healthy goal. 
And, and along the way, like, you both, at least we all three agree that AI's capacity to help us solve all our big problems is going to outweigh any kind of negative, and we're pretty excited about that, I guess. Like, like in cloud, you're kind of doing some cool things with AutoML and so forth. Yeah, so um, we talk a lot, Diane, about the belief of building benevolent technology for human use, right? Our technology reflect our values. So I personally, and I know Greg's whole team is working on um, bringing AI to the to people and to the fields that really need it to make a positive, uh, positive difference. So at Cloud, we're very lucky to be working with customers and partners from all kinds of vertical industries, from healthcare where we collaborate, to agriculture, to sustainability, to um, entertainment, to, to retail, to commerce, to finance, where our customers bring some of the toughest problems and their pain points, and we can work with them hand in hand to solve some of that. So for example, uh, recently we rolled out AutoML, and that is the recognition of the pain of entering machine learning. It's still a highly technical field, the bar is still high. Not, not enough people are trained experts in the world of machine learning. But yet, our industry already has so, many, so much need to you know, tag pictures, understand imageries, just as an example in vision. So how do we answer that call of need? So we've worked hard and thought about uh, this, this suite of pro uh, product called AutoML, where the customer, we lower the entry barrier by relieving them from coding machine learning custom models themselves. All they have to do is to give us the kind of, provide the kind of data and concept they need. Here's an example of a ramen company in Tokyo yeah. that has many shops of uh, ramens, and they want to build an app that recognizes the ramens from different uh, ramen stores. And they give us the pictures of ramens and the concepts of their store one, store two, store three. And what we do is to use a technique, a machine learning technique that Google and many others have developed called learning to learn, and then um, build a customized model for the customer that recognize ramens for their different stores. And then the customer can take that model to do what they want. You know, I can write a little C++, maybe some JavaScript. Could I do AutoML? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working with teams that uh, they don't have not even C++ experience. And the, we have a drag and drop interface, and, uh, and, and, and you can use AutoML that way. Because I really believe that you know, there are so many problems that can be solved using this technique that it's, it's critical that, that we share as much as possible about how these things work. I don't believe that these technologies should live in walled gardens, but instead we should develop tools that can be used by everyone in the community, and that's part of why we have a very aggressive open source stance to uh, our software packages, particularly uh, in, in AI. Um, and that includes things like TensorFlow that are available completely freely, and it includes the kinds of services that are available on cloud to do the kind of compute storage and model tuning and serving that you need to use these things in practice. And I think it's amazing that we, the same tools that my applied machine learning team uses to, to tackle problems that we're interested in, those same tools are accessible to all of you as well, to try to solve the same problems in the same way. And um, I've been really excited with how, how much it's, uh, how great the uptake is and how we're seeing expanding to other languages. Uh, mentioning JavaScript, quick plug for tensorflow.js is actually really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Oh, and you should probably run it on a TPU. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, it does give a nice boost, but um, so so you're doing you're building. I mean, 
with machine learning, we're bringing it to market in so many ways because we do, we have the, the tools to build your own models, the TensorFlow, we have the auto ML that brings it to any programmer. And then what's going on with all the APIs and, and how is that going to affect every industry and what do you see going on there? So cloud uh, already um, has a suite of APIs for a lot of our industry partners and customers from translate to speech to vision to... Um, which are based on models that we built. Yes, yeah. which, um, build, uh, for and example, Box is a major partner with uh, Google Cloud where uh, they recognize a tremendous need for organizing uh, customers' uh, imagery data to help customers. So they actually use Google's Vision API to yeah. do that. And, yeah. uh, and that's a, a, a model easily delivered to our customers through, through our uh, service. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Greg, how do you think that's going to uh, play out in the health industry? I know you've been yeah. thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. So, it, so healthcare is one of the problems that a bunch of people are working on at Google and a lot of people are working on outside as well because I think there's a huge opportunity to use these technologies to expand the availability and the accuracy of healthcare. And part of that is because there's, um, there's uh, doctors today are basically trying to weather an information hurricane in order to provide care. And so there's... There are, I think there are thousands of individual opportunities to make doctors work more fluid, to build tools to solve problems that they want solved, and to do things that help, um, that help patients and improve patient care. I mean, but I think I, you're, you, you were telling me that so many doctors are so unhappy because they have so much drudgery to do. Is this, is this a big breakthrough? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that there's, a, there's been a great, um, you know, when you go to a doctor, you're, you're looking for medical attention, right? And right now, a huge amount of their attention is not actually focused on the practice of medicine, but is focused on a whole bunch of other work that they have to do that, that doesn't require the kind of uh, insights and care and connection the real practice of medicine does. And so I believe that machine learning and, and AI is going to come into healthcare uh, through assistive technologies that help, help the doctors do, do what they want to do better. By understanding what they do in a system. No substitute for the human. No, the I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no substitute. Speaking of human, uh, Feifei, do you want to talk a little bit about why um, you've been so you think this humanistic AI approach is so critical? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the history of AI, we've entered phase two. The first 60 years is AI as more or less a niche technical field where we're still laying down scientific foundations. But starting this point on, AI is one of the biggest drivers of societal changes to come. So. How do we think about AI in its next phase? What is the frame of mind that should be driving us has been on top of my mind. And I think deeply about the need for human-centered AI, which in my opinion uh, includes three elements to complete the human-centered AI uh, thinking. The first element is really advancing AI to the next stage, and here we bring our collective uh, background from neuroscience, cognitive science, you know, whether we're getting to AGI tomorrow or, or, or in 50 years, there's a need for AI to be a lot more uh, flexible, nuanced, uh, learn faster in more um, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, uh, one-shot learning ways uh, to be able to understand emotion, to be able to communicate with humans, so that is the more human-centered way of advancing AI science. The second part is the human-centered AI technology and application, is that I love what you're saying, that there's no substitute for humans. This technology, like all technology, is to enhance humans, to augment humans, not to replace humans. We'll replace certain tasks. We'll replace humans out of danger or our tasks that we cannot perform. But the bottom line is we can use 
AI to help our doctors, to help our disaster relief workers, to help decision makers. So there is a lot of technology in robotics, in design, in natural language processing that is centered around human-centered AI technology and application. The third element of human-centered AI is really to combine the thinking of AI as a technology as well as the societal impact. We are so nascent in seeing the impact of this technology, but already, like Diane said, that we are seeing the impact in different ways, ways that we might not even predict. So I think it's really important and it's a responsibility of everyone from academia to industry to government to bring social scientists, philosophers, law scholars, policy makers, ethicists, and, and historians at the table and to study more deeply about AI's social and humanistic impact. And that is the uh, three elements of human-centered AI. That's, that's pretty wonderful. And, and I think we at Google here, Alphabet, are working as hard as we can to do humanistic AI. Um, you know, you mentioned a, um, you know, what we need to be careful about out there with AI and regulatory. What are some of the barriers to, you know, I think every company in the world has a use for AI in many, many ways. I mean, it's just exploding in all the verticals. But there are some impediments to adoption. For example, in financial, the financial industry, they need to have something called explainable AI. And could you just talk about some of the different barriers you see to being able to take advantage of AI? We should start yeah. with healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that there are, there are a bunch of really important things to consider. So one of the things is, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, have, have machine learning systems that are designed to fit the needs uh, of the folks that are using them and applying them. And that can often include not just giving me the answer, but telling me something about how that was um, derived. So some kind of explainability. So in the healthcare space, for example, um, we've been working on a bunch of things in medical imaging, and it's not acceptable to just tell the doctor that, oh, you know, something looks fishy in this x-ray or this pathology slide or this retinal scan. You have to tell them, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? But more importantly, you actually have to show them where in the image you think the evidence for that conclusion lies so that they can then look at it and decide whether they concur or they disagree or, oh, well, there's a speck of dust there and that's what the machine is picking up on. And the good news is that these things actually are possible. And uh, there, I think there's kind of been this unfortunate uh, mythology that AI and deep learning in particular is a, is a black box. And it really isn't. Um, uh, we didn't study how it worked because for a long time it really didn't work that well. But now that it's working well, there are a lot of tools and techniques that go into examining how these systems work. And I think explainability is a big part of it um, in, in terms of making these things uh, available for a bunch of applications. So I, in addition to explainability, I would add bias. Um, I think bias is an issue we need to address in AI. And I see bias from where I said two major kind of bias we need to address. One is the pipeline of AI development, starting from the bias of the data to the outcome of the bias. And we have here a lot, uh, heard a lot about if the machine learning algorithm is fed with data that does not represent the, 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 the problem domain in a fair way, we will introduce bias. Uh, whether it's uh, missing a group of people's data or, or uh, biasing it to a skewed distribution, um, these this are things that would have deep consequences, whether you're in the healthcare domain or finance or legal decision making. So I think that is a huge issue. Uh, very nicely that Google is already addressing that. We have a whole team at Google working on bias yeah, in, in this. That's true. And, and another bias I think it's important is the people who are developing AI, it's the human yeah. bias. And 
and the lack of diversity is also another it's bias. It's so important, and that kind of brings me to maybe our, some of our, we're getting close to the end, but um, if you, uh, you know, where is AI going? I mean, how prevalent is it going to be? I mean, we look at our universities and these machine learning classes have 800 people, 900 people. You know, there is such a demand. Every computer science graduate wants to know it. Where is it going? I mean, will every high school graduating senior be able to customize AI to their own purposes? Um, and, and how will, you know, how, wh what does it look like five, ten years from now? So, from a technology point of view, I think that there, because of the tremendous investment in resource, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector now, every, many countries are waking up to uh, invest in AI, we're going to see a huge continue um, development of AI technology. I'm mostly excited uh, either at cloud or seeing what Greg's team is doing, AI being delivered to the industries that really matter to people's lives and uh, work uh, quality and productivity. But Diane, I think you're also asking is, um, how are we educating more people in AI, right? So both making it easier to use and educating them, and, and what's it going to look like? I, you know, what do you predict? So, that's a really tough question because at the core of today's AI is still calculus, and that's not going to change. <laughs> so, so I, th I think that from the kind of from the the tech uh, the tech industry perspective or from the computer science education perspective, I think that we're going to see AI and ML become as essential as networking is, right? Like, no one really thinks about, oh, well, I'm going to write some software and it's going to be standalone on a box and it's not going to have a TCP IP connection, right? Like, we all know that you're going to have a TCP IP connection at the end of the day somewhere. And everyone understands the basics of the networking stack. And, and that's not just at the engineering of the level of engineers, that's at the level of designers, of, of, of executives, of, um, uh, of product developers and leaders. And the th same thing I think is going to happen with machine learning and AI, which is that designers are going to start to understand how can I make a, a completely revolutionary kind of product that folds in machine learning the same way that we fold in networking and internet technologies into almost everything we build. So I think we're going to see tremendous uptake and it becoming kind of a pervasive background part of the technologies. But I think that in that process, the ways that we use AI are going to evolve. So I think right now, you're seeing a lot of things where AI and machine learning adds some, some spice, some extra little coolness on a feature. And I think that what you're going to see um, over the next decade is you're going to see more of a core integration into what it means for the product to actually work. And I think that one of the great opportunities there is actually going to be the development of artificial emotional intelligence that allows products to actually have much more natural and much more fluid human interaction. We're beginning to see that in the assistant now with speech recognition, speech synthesis, understanding dialogues and exchanges. But I think that this is still in its, in its infancy. We're going to get to a point where uh, the products that we build, they interact with humans in the way that the humans find most useful, just out of the box. And I spend a lot of time with high schoolers, because I really believe in the future. You know, we always talk about AI changing the world, and I always say the question is, who is changing AI? And to me, bringing more human mission thinking into technology development and thought leadership is really important. Not only important for the future of our technology and the value we instill in our technology, but also in bringing the diverse group of students and future leaders into the development of AI. So, you know, at Stanford at Google, we all work um, a lot on this issue, and personally, I'm very involved with AI for All, which is a nonprofit that educates uh, high schoolers around the country from diverse background, whether they're uh, girls or, or students of underrepresented uh, minority groups, 
and we bring them onto AI, in, onto campus, university campus, and uh, work with them on, on AI thinking and yeah. AI studies. And, and at Google, we're just completely committed to bringing all our best technologies to everybody in the world. And we're doing that through the cloud and we're bringing these tools, we're bringing these APIs and the training and the partnering and the processors. And we're pretty excited to see what all you guys are gonna do with it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. everybody.
Hello. <laughs> okay. Hi. Who's interested in AI? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Me too. <laughs> Me three. Okay. So I'm I'm the moderator today. I'm Diane Green, and I'm running Google Cloud and on the Alphabet board. And I. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our really amazing guests we have here. I, I also live on this Stanford campus, so I've known one of our guests a long time because she's a neighbor. Um, so let me just introduce them. Uh, first is Fei -Fei, Dr. Fei-Fei Li, and she is the chief scientist for Google Cloud. She also runs the AI lab at Stanford University, the Vision Lab. And then she also uh, founded Sailors, which is now AI for All, which you'll hear about a little bit later. And um, is there anything you want to add to that, Feifei? I'm your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. And so then uh, the other, um, so now we have Greg Corrado and, uh, Actually, there's one amazing coincidence. Both Fei Fei and Greg were undergraduate physics majors at Princeton together at the same time. And didn't really know each other that well in the 18 person class. We were, we were like, studying too hard. No, it was, it was kind of surprising to you know, go to undergrad together and then none, neither of us in computer science and then rejoin later, only once we were here. <laughs> All Google. paths lead yeah. to AI and neural networks and so forth. But anyhow, so Greg is a principal scientist in the Google Brain Group. He co-founded it. And more recently, he's been doing a lot of amazing work in health with neural networks and machine learning. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford. And so he came into AI in a very interesting way. And maybe he'll talk about the similarities between the brain and what's going on in AI. Would you like to add anything else? Or? No, yeah. sounds good. OK. So I thought, since both of them have been involved in the AI field for a while, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it's recently become a really big deal. But it'd be nice to get a little perspective on the history you know, uh, yours in vision and yours in neuroscience about um, AI and, and, and how it was so natural to, for it to evolve to where it is now and what you're doing. And start sure. with Fei Fei. I guess I'll start. So first of all, AI is a very nascent field in the history of science of human civilization. This is a field of only 60 years of age. And it started with a very, very simple but fundamental quest, is can machines think? And we all know thinkers and thought leaders like Alan Turing challenged humanity with that question, can machines think? So about 60 years ago, a group of very uh, pioneering scientists, computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, started really this field. In fact, John McCarthy, who founded Stanford's AI lab, coined the very word artificial intelligence. So where do we begin to build machines that think? Humanity is best at looking inward and in ourselves and try to draw inspiration from who we are. So we started thinking about building machines that resemble human thinking. And when you think about human intelligence, you start thinking about different aspects, the ability to reason, the ability to see, the ability to hear, to speak, to move around, make decisions, manipulate. So AI started from that very core uh, foundational dream 60 years ago, started to proliferate as a field of multiple subfield, which includes robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition. And then a very important development happened around the 80s and 90s, which is a sister field called machine learning started to blossom. And that's a field combining statistical learning statistics with computer science. And 
combining the quest of machine intelligence, which is what AI was born out of, with the tools and, and the capabilities of machine learning, AI as a field went through an extremely fruitful, productive, blossoming uh, period of time. And fa fast forward to the second decade of 21st century, the latest machine learning booming that we are observing is called deep learning, which has a deep root in neuroscience, which I'll let you talk about. And uh, so combining deep learning as a powerful statistical machine learning tool with the quest of making machines more intelligent, whether it's to see or is it to um, hear or to speak, we're seeing this blossom. And last, I just want to say three critical factors converged around the, the, the uh, last decade, which is the 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, which are the three computing factors. One is the advance of hardware that enabled more powerful, capable computing. Second is the emergence of big data, powerful data that can drive the statistical learning algorithms. And I was lucky to be involved myself in some of the effort. And then the third one is the advances of machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So this convergence of three major factors brought us the AI boom that we're seeing today, and Google has been investing in all three areas, um, honestly, earlier than the curve. Most of the um, effort started even in early 2000s. And as a company, we're doing a lot of AI work from research to products. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the divergence and exploration in various academic fields, and then the reconvergence as we see ideas that are aligned. So it wasn't, as Faye says, it wasn't so long ago that fields like cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even things that we don't talk about much more like cybernetics, were really all aligned in a single discipline. And then they've moved apart from each other and explored these ideas independently for a couple of decades. And then with the renaissance in artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're starting to see some reconvergence. So some of these ideas that were popular only in a small community for a couple of decades are now coming back into the mainstream of what artificial intelligence is, what statistical pattern recognition is, and has really been delightful to see. But it's not just one idea. It's actually multiple ideas that you see that were maintained for a long time in fields like cognitive science that are coming back into the fold. So another example beyond deep learning is actually reinforcement learning. So for the longest time, if you looked at a university catalog of courses, and you were looking for any mention of reinforcement learning whatsoever, you were gonna find it in a, in a psychology department or a cognitive science department. But today, as we all know, we look at reinforcement learning as a new opportunity, as a, something that we actually look at for the future of AI that might be something that's important to get machines to really learn in completely dynamic environments, in, uh, in environments where they have to explore entirely new stimuli. So I've been really excited to see how this convergence has happened back in the direction from those ideas into mainstream computer science. And I think that there's some hope for exchange back in the other direction. So neuroscientists and cognitive scientists today are starting to ask whether we can take the kind of computer vision models uh, that, that Fei Fei helped pioneer and use those as hypotheses for how it is that neural systems actually compute, how our own biological brains see. Um, and I think that that's a really, it's really exciting to see this kind of exchange between uh, disciplines that have been uh, separated for a little while. 
you know, one little piece of history I think that's also interesting is what you did, Feifei, -Fei, with ImageNet, which is a nice way of expl explaining, you know, um, building these neural networks where you labeled all these images and then people could refine their algorithms by... Go ahead and explain that just real quickly. Okay, sure. So, um, about 10 years ago, that the whole community of computer vision, which is a subfield of AI, was working on a holy grail quest, uh, problem of object recognition, which is you open your eye, you can see the world full of objects like flowers, chairs, people, you know, um, and that's a building block of visual intelligence and intelligence in general. And to crack that problem, we were building as a field different machine learning models we're making small progress, but we're hitting a lot of walls. And uh, when my student and I started working in this problem and started thinking deeply about what is missing in the way we're approaching this problem, we recognized this important interplay between data and statistical machine learning models. They really reinforce each other in very deep mathematical ways that we're not gonna talk about the details here. And that realization was also inspired by human vision. If you look at how children learn, it's a lot of learning through big data experiences and exploration. So combining that, we decided to put together a pretty um, epic effort of we wanted to label all the images we can get on the internet. And of course, we Google searched a lot. And we downloaded billions of images and used crowdsourcing technology to label all the images, organize them into a data set of 15 million images uh, in, um, organized in um, 22,000 categories of objects and put that to, uh, together and that's the ImageNet project. And we democratized it to the research world and released it open source. And then we, starting 2010, we um, held an international challenge for the whole AI community called ImageNet Challenge. And one of the teams from Toronto, which is now at Google, um, won the ImageNet Challenge yeah, yeah. with the uh, deep learning convolutional neural network model. Mm -hmm. And that was year 2012. And a lot yeah. of people think the combination of ImageNet and the, the deep learning model in 2012 was the onset of what we Greg gave is people doing. a way to compare how they were doing. Exactly. And it was really yeah. good. So yeah. And so Greg, you've been doing a lot of uh, brain-inspired research, very interesting research, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of very impactful research in the health area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the ImageNet example actually sort of sets a playbook for how we can try to approach a problem. Um, the kind of machine learning uh, and AI that is most practical and most useful today is ones where machines learn through imitation. It's an imitation game where if you have examples of a task being performed correctly, the machine can learn to imitate this. And this is called supervised learning. And so what happened in the image recognition case is that by, by Feifei building an object recognition data set, we could all focus on that problem in a really concrete tractable way in order to compare different methods. And it turned out that uh, methods like deep learning and artificial neural networks were able to do something really interesting in that space that previous machine learning and artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence methods had not, which was that they were able to go directly from the data to the predictions and break the problem up into many smaller steps without having be being told exactly how to do that. So that's what we were doing before, is that we were trying to engineer features or cues, things that we could see in the stimuli that then we would do a little bit of statistical learning on to figure out how to combine these signals. But with artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're actually learning to do those things all together. And this applies not only to computer vision, but it applies to most things that you could imagine a machine imitating. 
And so the kinds of things that we've done, like with, um, with Google Smart Reply and now Smart Compose, we're taking that same approach, that if you have a lot of text data, which it turns out the internet is full of, what you can actually do is you can look at uh, the sequence of words so far in a conversation or in, in, um, a, uh, in an email exchange and try to guess what comes next. You know, and, you know I'm going to interrupt here a little bit and um, get a little more provocative here. All right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, neural inspired machine learning and so forth. And uh, so, you know, this artificial intelligence is kind of bringing into question what are we humans? And then there's this thing all there called artificial general AGI, artificial general intelligence. What do you think's going on here? Are we getting to AGI? I really don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, there's a variety of opinions in the community, but my feeling is that, OK, we've finally gotten artificial neural networks to be able to recognize photos of cats, right? That's really great. <laughs> um, uh, we, we also, it's now can... Uh, Fei, you know, Fei was that AGI when we recognized a cat? No, <laughs> that's not enough yeah. to define AGI. So the kind of thing that's working well right now is this sort of pattern recognition, this immediate response where we're able to recognize something kind of reflexively. And we now have, I believe, machines can do pattern recognition every bit as well as humans can. And that's why they can recognize objects in photos, that's why they can do speech recognition, and that's why they can win at a game like Go. But that is only one small sliver, a tiny sliver, of what goes into something like intelligence. Uh, notions of memory and planning and strategy and contingencies, even emotional intelligence, these are things that are, have just, we haven't even scratched the surface. And so to me, I feel like it's really a leap too far to imagine that having finally cracked pat pattern recognition after some, some decades of trying, that we are therefore on the verge of cracking all of these other problems that go into what constitutes general intelligence. Although so, we have gone way faster than either of you ever expected us to go, I believe. Um, yes and no. H humanity has a tendency to, un um, to, to overestimate uh, short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So eventually, we will be achieving things that we cannot dream of. But Diane and Greg, I want to just give a simple example to define AGI. So <laughs> the definition of AGI, again, is an introspective definition of what humans and human intelligence can do. I have a two-year-old daughter who doesn't like napping. And uh, I, I thought I'm smart enough to scheme to put her in a very complicated sleeping bag that doesn't get herself out of the crib. <laughs> and and uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the monitor watching this kid, two-year-old, where for the first time, she, I was training her for napping for, by herself. She was very angry. So she looked around, figured out a weak spot on the crib where she might be able to climb out, figured out how to unzip her complicated sleeping bag that I thought I schemed to do really, you know, uh, to, to, to prevent that, and figured out a way to climb out of a crib that's way taller than who she is, and managed to escape safely and... Um, and <laughs> without breaking well, okay, her legs. Okay, how about AGI equivalent to my cat or equivalent to, my, to a mouse? If you're shifting the definition, sure. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> but even cat, I think there are things that the cat is capable yeah. of doing. That, so, uh, so I do think that if you, if you look at an organism like a cat from a behavioral level, like the, what, how cats behave and how they respond to their environments, I think that you could imagine a world where you have something like a, a toy that you know, is for entertainment purposes that approximates a cat in a bunch of ways in that the sorts of behaviors that the human observe, you're like, oh, it walks around, it doesn't bump into things, it meows at me every once in a while. I do believe that we can build a system like that. But what you can't do is you can't take that robot and then you know, uh, dump it in the forest and have it figure out 
what it needs to do in order to, to, to survive and make okay. things work. Okay. But, but it's a goal. It's a healthy goal. To, it's a to, healthy goal. And, and along the way, like, you both, at least we all three agree that AI's capacity to help us solve all our big problems is going to outweigh any kind of negative, and we're pretty excited about that, I guess. Like, like in cloud, you're kind of doing some cool things with AutoML and so forth. Yeah, so um, we talk a lot, Diane, about the belief of building benevolent technology for human use, right? Our technology reflects our values. So I personally, and I know Greg's whole team is working on um, bringing AI to the to people and to the fields that really need it to make a positive, uh, positive difference. So at Cloud, we're very lucky to be working with customers and partners from all kinds of vertical industries, from healthcare where we collaborate, to agriculture, to sustainability, to um, entertainment, to, to retail, to commerce, to finance, where our customers bring some of the toughest problems and their pain points, and we can work with them hand in hand to solve some of that. So for example, uh, recently we rolled out AutoML, and that is the recognition of the pain of entering machine learning. It's still a highly technical field, the bar is still high, not, not enough people are trained experts in the world of machine learning. But yet, our industry already has so, many, so much need to you know, tag pictures, understand imageries, just as an example in vision. So how do we answer that call of need? So we worked hard and thought about uh, this, this suite of pro uh, product called AutoML, where the customer, we lower the entry barrier by relieving them from coding machine learning custom models themselves. All they have to do is to give us the kind of, provide the kind of data and concept they need. Here's an example of a ramen company in Tokyo yeah. that has many shops of uh, ramens, and they want to build an app that recognizes the ramens from different uh, ramen stores. And they give us the pictures of ramens and the concepts of their store one, store two, store three. And what we do is to use a technique, a machine learning technique that Google and many others have developed called learning to learn, and then um, build a customized model for the customer that recognize ramens for their different stores. And then the customer can take that model to do what they want. You know, I can write a little C++, maybe some JavaScript. Could I do AutoML? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working with teams that uh, they don't have not even C++ experience. And the, we have a drag and drop interface, and, uh, and, and, and you can use AutoML that way. Because I really believe that you know there are so many problems that can be solved using this technique that it's it's critical that that we share as much as possible about how these things work. I don't believe that these technologies should live in walled gardens, but instead we should develop tools that can be used by everyone in the community, and that's part of why we have a very aggressive open source stance to uh, our software packages, particularly uh, in in AI. Um, and that includes things like TensorFlow that are available completely freely, and it includes the kinds of services that are available on cloud to do the kind of compute storage and model tuning and serving that you need to use these things in practice. And I think it's amazing that we, the same tools that my applied machine learning team uses to, to tackle problems that we're interested in, those same tools are accessible to all of you as well, to try to solve the same problems in the same way. And um, I've been really excited with how, how much it's, uh, how great the uptake is and how we're seeing expanding to other languages. Uh, mentioning JavaScript, quick plug for tensorflow.js is actually really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Oh, and you should probably run it on a TPU. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, 
uh, it does give a nice boost. But um, so, so you're doing, you're building, I mean, with machine learning, we're bringing it to market in so many ways because we do, we have the, the tools to build your own models, the TensorFlow, we have the auto ML that brings it to any programmer. And then what's going on with all the APIs and, and how is that gonna affect every industry and what do you see going on there? So cloud uh, already um, has a suite of APIs for a lot of our industry partners and customers from translate to speech to vision to... Um, which are based on models that we built. Yes, yeah. which, um, build, uh, for and example, Box is a major partner with uh, Google Cloud where uh, they recognize a tremendous need for organizing uh, customers' uh, imagery data to help customers. So they actually use Google's Vision API to yeah. do that. And, yeah. uh, and that's a, a, a model easily delivered to our customers through, through our uh, service. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Greg, how do you think that's going to uh, play out in the health industry? I know you've been yeah. thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. So, it, so healthcare is one of the problems that a bunch of people are working on at Google and a lot of people are working on outside as well because I think there's a huge opportunity to use these technologies to expand the availability and the accuracy of healthcare. And part of that is because there's, um, there's uh, doctors today are basically trying to weather an information hurricane in order to provide care. And so there's... There are, I think there are thousands of individual opportunities to make doctors work more fluid, to build tools to solve problems that they want solved, and to do things that help, um, that help patients and improve patient care. I mean, but I think I, you're, you, you were telling me that so many doctors are so unhappy because they have so much drudgery to do. Is this, is this a big breakthrough? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that there's, a, there's been a great, um, you know, when you go to a doctor, you're, you're looking for medical attention, right? And right now, a huge amount of their attention is not actually focused on the practice of medicine, but is focused on a whole bunch of other work that they have to do that, that doesn't require the kind of uh, insights and care and connection the real practice of medicine does. And so I believe that machine learning and, and AI is going to come in to healthcare uh, through assistive technologies that help, help the doctors do, do what they want to do better. By understanding what they do in a system. No substitute for the human. No, the human. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No substitute. Speaking of human, uh, Feifei, do you want to talk a little bit about why um, you've been so you think this humanistic AI approach is so critical? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the history of AI, we've entered phase two. The first 60 years is AI as more or less a niche technical field where we're still laying down scientific foundations. But starting this point on, AI is one of the biggest drivers of societal changes to come. So. How do we think about AI in its next phase? What is the frame of mind that should be driving us has been on top of my mind. And I think deeply about the need for human-centered AI, which in my opinion uh, includes three elements to complete the human-centered AI uh, thinking. The first element is really advancing AI to the next stage, and here we bring our collective uh, background from neuroscience, cognitive science, you know, whether we're getting to AGI tomorrow or, or, or in 50 years, there's a need for AI to be a lot more uh, flexible, nuanced, uh, learn faster in more um, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, uh, one-shot learning ways uh, to be able to understand emotion, to be able to communicate with humans, so that is the more human-centered way of advancing AI science. The second part is the human-centered AI technology and application, is that I love what you're saying, that there's no substitute for humans. This technology, like all technology, is to enhance humans, to augment humans, not to replace humans, 
will replace certain tasks, will replace humans out of danger or our tasks that we cannot perform. But the bottom line is we can use AI to help our doctors, to help our disaster relief workers, to help decision makers. So there is a lot of technology in robotics, in design, in natural language processing that is centered around human-centered AI technology and application. The third element of human-centered AI is really to combine the thinking of AI as a technology as well as the societal impact. We are so nascent in seeing the impact of this technology, but already, like Diane said, that we are seeing the impact in different ways, ways that we might not even predict. So I think it's really important and it's a responsibility of everyone from academia to industry to government to bring social scientists, philosophers, law scholars, policy makers, ethicists, and, and historians at the table and to study more deeply about AI's social and humanistic impact. And that is the uh, three elements of human-centered AI. That's that's pretty wonderful, and, and I think we at Google here, Alphabet, are working as hard as we can to do humanistic AI. Um, you know, you mentioned, a, um, you know, what we need to be careful about out there with AI and regulatory. What are some of the barriers to, you know, I think every company in the world has a use for AI in many, many ways. I mean, it's just exploding in all the verticals. But there are some impediments to adoption. For example, in financial, the financial industry, they need to have something called explainable AI. And could you just talk about some of the different barriers you see to being able to take advantage of AI? We should start yeah. with healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that there are, there are a bunch of really important things to consider. So one of the things is, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, have have machine learning systems that are designed to fit the needs uh, of the folks that are using them and applying them. And that can often include not just giving me the answer, but telling me something about how that was um, derived. So some kind of explainability. So in the healthcare space, for example, um, we've been working on a bunch of things in medical imaging. And it's not acceptable to just tell the doctor that, oh, you know, something looks fishy in this x-ray or this pathology slide or this retinal scan. You have to tell them, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? But more importantly, you actually have to show them where in the image you think the evidence for that conclusion lies so that they can then look at it and decide whether they concur or they disagree or, oh, well, there's a speck of dust there and that's what the machine is picking up on. And the good news is that these things actually are possible. And uh, there, I think there's kind of been this unfortunate uh, mythology that AI and deep learning in particular is a, is a black box. And it really isn't. Um, uh, we didn't study how it worked because for a long time it really didn't work that well. But now that it's working well, there are a lot of tools and techniques that go into examining how these systems work. And I think explainability is a big part of it. Um, in, in terms of making these things uh, available for a bunch of applications. So, I, in addition to explainability, I would add bias. Um, I think bias is an issue we need to address in AI. And I see bias from where I, I said two major kind of bias we need to address. One is the pipeline of AI development, starting from the bias of the data, to the outcome of the bias. And we have here a lot, uh, heard a lot about if the machine learning algorithm is fed with data that does not represent the, 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 the problem domain in a fair way, we will introduce bias, uh, whether it's uh, missing a group of people's data or, or uh, biasing it to a skewed distribution. Um, this, these are things that would have deep consequences, whether you're in the healthcare domain or finance or legal decision making. So I think that is a huge issue. Uh, very nicely that Google is already addressing that. We have a whole team at Google working on bias yeah, in, in this. That's true. And, and another bias I think it's important is 
the people who are developing AI is the human yeah. bias. And, and the lack of diversity is also another it's bias. It's so important. And that kind of brings me to maybe our, some of our, we're getting close to the end, but um, if you, uh, you know, where is AI going? I mean, how prevalent is it going to be? I mean, we look at our universities and these machine learning classes have 800 people, 900 people. You know, there is such a demand. Every computer science graduate wants to know it. Where is it going? I mean, will every high school graduating senior be able to customize AI to their own purposes? Um, and, and how will, you know, how, wh what does it look like five, ten years from now? So, from a technology point of view, I think that the, because of the tremendous investment in resource, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector now, every, many countries are waking up to uh, invest in AI, we're going to see a huge continue um, development of AI technology. I'm mostly excited uh, either at cloud or seeing what Greg's team is doing, AI being delivered to the industries that really matter to people's lives and uh, work uh, quality and productivity. But Diane, I think you're also asking is, um, how are we educating more people in AI, right? So both making it easier to use and educating them, and, and what's it going to look like? I, you know, what do you predict? So, that's a really tough question because at the core of today's AI is still calculus, and that's not going to change. <laughs> so, so I, th I think that from the kind of from the the tech uh, the tech industry perspective or from the computer science education perspective, I think that we're going to see AI and ML become as essential as networking is, right? Like, no one really thinks about, oh, well, I'm going to write some software and it's going to be standalone on a box and it's not going to have a TCPI connection, right? Like, we all know that you're going to have a TCPI connection at the end of the day somewhere, and everyone understands the basics of the networking stack, and, and that's not just at the engineering of the level of engineers, that's at the level of designers, of, of, of executives, of, um, uh, of product developers and leaders. And the same, same thing I think is gonna happen with machine learning and AI, which is that designers are gonna start to understand how can I make a, a completely revolutionary kind of product that folds in machine learning the same way that we fold in networking and internet technologies into almost everything we build. So I think we're gonna see tremendous uptake and it becoming kind of a pervasive background part of the technologies. But I think that in that process, the ways that we use AI are going to evolve. So I think right now, you're seeing a lot of things where AI and machine learning adds some, some spice, some extra little coolness on a feature. And I think that what you're going to see um, over the next decade is you're going to see more of a core integration into what it means for the product to actually work. And I think that one of the great opportunities there is actually going to be the development of artificial emotional intelligence that allows products to actually have much more natural and much more fluid human interaction. We're beginning to see that in the assistant now with speech recognition, speech synthesis, understanding dialogues and exchanges. But I think that this is still in its, in its infancy. We're going to get to a point where uh, the products that we build, they interact with humans in the way that the humans find most useful, just out of the box. And I spend a lot of time with high schoolers, because I really believe in the future. You know, we always talk about AI changing the world, and I always say the question is who is changing AI? And to me, bringing more human mission thinking into technology development and thought leadership is really important. Not only important for the future of our technology and the value we instill in our technology, but also in bringing the diverse group of students and future leaders into the development of AI. So, you know, at Stanford, at Google, we all work um, a lot on this issue, and personally, I'm very involved with AI for All, which is a nonprofit that educates uh, high schoolers around the country from diverse backgrounds, whether they're uh, girls or, 
or students of underrepresented uh, minority groups, and we bring them onto AI, in, onto campus, university campus, and uh, work with them on um, AI thinking and AI yeah. studies. And, and at Google, we're just completely committed to bringing all our best technologies to everybody in the world, and we're doing that through the cloud, and we're bringing these tools, we're bringing these APIs, and the training, and the partnering, and the processors, and we're pretty excited to see what all you guys are gonna do with it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm at the Community Lounge. This is where anybody can swing by, meet up with old friends, or make new ones. I'm going to go find some certification alumni to talk to them about the program. Hey, Marga. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Doing good. How are you? Awesome. <laughs> really great. <laughs> I'm sitting here with Henry, Ashesh, and Somia, and they're all alumni in the certification program. I'd like to ask you just a few things about the program, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Let's start with, how did you get involved? Like, what made you want to get certified? Okay. So, actually, before in, in Indonesia, they have like a scholarship. So they, they give out the 500 scholarship for the people to take with the university and certifications. And I was, I, I registered on that one and I, I got it. Mm. And then after that, I, I tried the certifications and yeah. So your path was some scholarships to certification? Yes. Ashesh? Okay, so uh, if you see the reason I went for the certification, in our professional life, uh, we strive for a few things. One of them is uh, to prove the word to ourselves, and second is to prove our word to others. Like, so to proving word to ourselves, we go for a benchmark, right? We try to achieve it. So for me, that certification was a benchmark, a milestone achieved. And once I've achieved that, there's the only one way that is to go for something higher, right? So this was one reason to prove myself the worth so that I can, you know, go for more higher things. So certification was a commitment to me, to myself, to go for in search of more knowledge. And second thing is to prove worth to others. So if you see when you go for the job, uh, there are very various phases. There are interviews, there are tests and everything. But the first phase is always the qualification. What degrees do you hold? What certifications do you hold? If you don't cross that door, there's no point. I mean, you might be a very good programmer or something, but to have a certification, you are always have a key to open a door. 
So that was the other thing which I went certification for. So in short, to gain confidence and to be job ready. Right? Thank you. And Soumya? So I've been working on Android since 2010. What pushed me to do the certification was probably that, you know, like, like Ashish said, you know, there, there's a benchmark or there's a standard with a certification. And after working for so long in Android, worked on various kinds of applications, how do you differentiate yourself from the others? Thank you. Can you each tell me one thing that has been helpful in your career because of certification? Sure. So uh, actually, in my current organization, we now have a team of about 20 mobile developers, mobile team more, more or less. And uh, what, what I noticed was uh, we had the support of the management for conducting various certifications and things like that. But uh, when we did the certification and I told my team that, see, I did this and it was cool and it, it, you know, it gave a validation to the team also that how we are doing this. And after that, very quickly, we have almost 10 team members now who are certified already. So that was a big boost, uh, energizer to them too, you know, from a team lead to the rest of the team saying that, oh, you should do this. And then that has worked out very positively for them. I work for Paradise Publisher saying we're into ebook publishing. So we provide a platform to indie authors. For that, we have an app, Android app. So uh, the thing is that we had outsourced it to some other company. So when we outsource something, we have to uh, engage our resources. And not being a large company, this could be a problem, right? So we had to talk to them about exposing our internal APIs, and then our boss had to sit with them. So this was this was this was the one thing which motivated. Like when I was uh, uh, getting into Android. Uh, that th that point of time, I thought, okay, I will try to make the Android app in-house for my company. But the certification was not there, so I was also a little hesitant to ask my boss that to give this job to me. Because, you know, the app matters as such uh, financially. Once I got the certification and I told my boss, he was very happy about it. And, of course, he was quite confident. So, till now, I have developed two Android apps for my company that is in-house. So we have more control over the app, especially since I'm working already, I know the back end and everything. And our consumers also get a more robust and something, you know, more user friendly app. So this certification has helped me to gain the confidence with my boss and to move my career in Android app development. Before I took the certifications, it's like whenever I apply to a company, I always choose the Android developer job. And then they always give me the interview for iOS developer job. <laughs> so and then I, I try the certi certifications and then after I get certified, it's, it's naturally, they, it just knock them to their senses that, okay, I'm certified by Google. Uh -huh. So then they, they give me more chance. They give me chance for interview, for the test. Yeah. Otherwise before it, no one, they just give me the test for iOS. Thank you all so much for sharing your story with me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to learn more about certification, head on over to g.co slash dev slash certification. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Having a technical background or having technical knowledge, do you think that it can help um, make the creative process burgeon and grow, or do you think it can hinder the creative process? It can go both ways, um, but I've definitely found myself early in my career kind of uh, noticing that, yeah, I, I've started thinking about how to actually implement uh, a, a design, and that sometimes hindered my design process because I was thinking so much of how to actually make the solution happen. That's quite a challenging thing. So how did you manage to break through so it's not stopping you but maybe enhancing the stuff that you actually do. I think one of the things that I always struggled with is that uh, from a visual standpoint, like I'm not a super talented visual designer. I've seen some amazing visual designers that I'm just like, oh my goodness, like that is really, really slick and I love that and um, that's not like my strength. And so I was a, a lot, came back more from like the coding perspective, being able to actually implement some stuff in code, which they couldn't. Um, but, you know, there, there was this kind of this deciding factor of realizing Am I more of a designer or more of a, a developer? Like, you know, I'm not necessarily that great at the graphics, but there's still so many other ways of design that can kind of spread in. Uh, so really, like, doing some research and finding about more about UX design and realizing that is really kind of what, what I wanted to focus on yeah. um, is kind of what led me to that. So it's, 
it definitely was this, this kind of process of navigating through it. It's like, where do I fit? Am I a designer? Am I a developer? Where, you know, I, from the first projects that I started doing, um, you know, a lot of the time I did a lot of websites. And when people come to you, they go, hey, we need a website built. They don't necessarily say, <laughs> hey, we need a front end developer to come, <laughs> come, come do this, especially if you're working with uh, smaller businesses and clients. So you do take on the designer and developer hat um, to kind of make that happen. A lot of developers are very afraid to learn about design. It's like, because I get question, question like, if, if I was to, to write an article, the perfect article for the developers would be how to, be, how to learn to design, or how do you, you know, which makes no sense to me, because learning to design doesn't really mean anything. It's just like, what, what part of design, you know, what discipline of right. design? Um, but there's still that question of, okay, what is the first step that someone who wants to really, as someone who's gone through this process yourself, what was your first step to say, okay, that's it, I'm becoming a designer? Right. I think, you know, following a lot of design patterns, at that time I didn't really understand that they were called design patterns, right? You kind of, you implement them um, in the sites doing a lot of web work. You yeah. kind of take on, okay, the navigation uh, menu, where does that live? And you're following a lot of the patterns that have already been created, and so you kind of learn to explore through that and then, you know, testing out the site and realizing, oh, this doesn't feel right, like something's off, let's, let's work on how to make this better. Um, but I think one of the, the great things that can really help designer or developers wanting to go into design is looking at a lot of like the material spec guidelines are actually really, really helpful because not only does it actually tell you, hey, here's some guidelines of what to follow, but it actually does a really go a good job of explaining why you're doing that certain and the certain thing. rationale and logic. And yeah, exactly. So that actually is really helpful because then you're able to understand why was this created? Like what was the thought process behind um, adding potentially a, a bottom navigation, or why would you have a side uh, side nav? You know, it's it's really getting to kind of explaining that, so you're able to learn from learn from actually interacting with something and seeing how they're doing it, but also getting finding out why they decided to do that. Because I think so much of design is so much it's problem solving, right? Yeah. So. Um, so many people forget that when they think of design, they think of the finished product, but there's so many different stages of how you got to that finished product. Um, and so a lot of it, being able to understand how someone was thinking through that really, really helps you, um, from a development perspective, get into that design field of understanding, oh, okay, how do I get from thinking of how do I develop this versus how do I even arrive to the solution? I think that's, the, that's kind of the big difference there. As developers, you, know, you have something that's already uh, designed for you for the most part. I mean, some people get handed things. Some people get handed an iOS mock uh, and said, hey, make this, make this into Android. So then at that time, you kind of become an Android uh, designer yeah. in that aspect. What do you think is like the biggest thing that stops developers really understanding design? One of the things that we do at uh, Google is we do design sprints. So the design sprints are really great because it brings people from all the different disciplines and specialties together um, to work into solving a, a challenge that we have. You know, So you have product managers, engineers, designers, researchers, everyone um, in, in the room together and kind of thinking and working through a problem, which is really fantastic because you get all these different ideas. Um, and one of the things that I really notice is we're, as we're bringing in designers you know, and uh, engineers and all these people together, is that when we're walking through the challenge, the engineers are already thinking of the solution yeah. and already thinking about how to implement it. They go straight to that, which makes sense. That, that is their role, right? As they go straight to that, which makes sense. That, that is their role, right? As engineers, um, usually you are given something and you have to go, oh, how do I, how do I make this happen? How do I, like, thinking through problem solving, how to actually get to that solution? Whereas designers, we don't know what the solution necessarily is. So I think a lot of the blockers is automatically wanting to know the answer yeah. instead of being more aware and being okay with saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let's, let's explore it together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the biggest hindrance that can really stop developers into getting into design is wanting to have all the answers. It's, it's okay not to have them. I mean, and what do you think developers can actually do um, to get past that? I mean, because I find, like, for me, it's always sketching and just experimenting. Right. So I suppose it's how does the, the developer maintain that kind of playful space where they're not thinking, right, uh, here's the library we're going to use to do, like, a whatever widget or a fab or whatever, but what can they actually do that allows them to to not thinking about like the end result or breaking from that cycle. Yeah, you actually bring up a great point with sketching. That's probably one of my favorite exercises when I'm working with different people to get them thinking of, uh, of solutions. So it's particularly if you're developing an app or so is 
hey, let's get some sketches out there, get a Sharpie, and just start sketching out through some ideas. Um, because that really, that doesn't, you can really get some ideas on paper and not be uh, married to them, you know, and not feel like really connected because you spent all this time developing the solution and realizing, oh, it doesn't really work. Um, and so if you start really low f fidelity with some sketches, that can really open up your mind in terms of thinking about different solutions. Because as you're sketching through it, you're realizing, oh, like maybe I want to use this fab button or something, or everyone loves the fab, right? So <laughs> you want to incorporate it somewhere, and then you realize, hmm, maybe that's not the, the right thing to do. And I haven't spent all this energy developing or even designing this. So then I can kind of toss that and move on and create a different solution. So sketching, I think, is a great uh, resource instead of people go straight. A lot of people like to prototype in the code. Um, but I usually like to challenge people and go, hey, start sketching some ideas, and then once you've landed on something that you think you, you want to explore some more, then dive into code or dive into sketch or whatever you're, you're using. So I suppose um, for the engineer to really understand design is almost like, okay, just start sketching first um, and start thinking about the thing you're going to build and the possibilities rather than straight to the end solution.
Hi, everybody, and welcome to this session where we're going to talk about breakthroughs in machine learning. I'm Lawrence Moroni. I'm a developer advocate at uh, Google, I'm working on TensorFlow with the Google Brain team. Uh, we're here today to talk about the revolution that's going on in machine learning and how that revolution is transformative. Now, I come from a software development background. Any software developers here? Given that it's I.O., sure. And it, this, this, is, this transformation, this revolution, is uh, particularly from a developer's perspective, is really, really cool because it's giving us a whole new set of tools that we can use to build scenarios and to build solutions for problems that may have been too complex to even consider prior to this. It's also leading to massive advances in our understanding of things like the universe around us. It's opening up new fields in art. And it's impacting and revolutionizing things such as healthcare and so many more things. So should we take a look at some of these? So first of all, astronomy. Uh, at school, I studied physics. I wasn't a comp sci person, so I'm a physics and an astronomy geek. And it wasn't that long ago when we learned how to discover what new, how new planets around other stars in our galaxy. And it, the way that we discovered it was that sometimes we'd observe like a little wobble in the star. And that meant that there was a very large planet like Jupiter's size or even bigger orbiting that star very closely and causing a wobble because of the gravitational attraction. But of course, the kind of planets we want to find are the small rocky ones like Earth or Mars where you know, there's a chance of finding life on these planets. And finding those and discovering those was very, very difficult to do because small ones close to the star you just wouldn't see. But um, there's, with research that's been going on in the Kepler mission, they've actually recently discovered this planet called Kepler-90i by sifting through data and building models for using machine learning and using TensorFlow. And Kepler-90i is actually much closer to its host star than Earth is, so that its orbit is only 14 days instead of our 365 and a quarter and a bit. And not only that, which I find really cool, that they didn't just find this as a single planet around that star. They've actually mapped and modeled the entire solar system of eight planets that are there. So these are some of the advances. It's, it's, um, to me, I find it's just a wonderful time to be alive because technology is enabling us to discover these great new things. And even closer to home, we've also discovered that looking at scans of the human eye, as you would have seen in the keynote, you know, with machine learning trained models on this, we've been able to discover things such as blood pressure predictions or being able to assess a person's risk of a heart attack or a stroke. Now, just imagine if this screening can be done on a small mobile phone. Now, how profound is the effect going to be? Suddenly, the whole world is going to be able to access easy, rapid, affordable, and non-invasive screening for things such as heart diseases. It'll be saving many lives, but it'll also be improving the quality of many, many more lives. Now, these are just a few of the breakthroughs and advances that have been made because of TensorFlow. And TensorFlow, we've been working hard with the community, with all of you, to make this a machine learning platform for everybody. So today, I want, we want to share a few uh, of the new advances that have been working on this. So including, we'll be looking at robots. And Vincent's going to come out in a few moments to show us robots that learn and some of the work that they've been doing to improve how robots learn. And then Debbie is going to be from NERSC. She's uh, going to be showing us cosmology advancements, and including showing how building a simulation of the entire universe will help us understand the nature of the unknowns in our universe, like dark matter and dark energy. But first of all, I would love to welcome from the Magenta team, we have Doug, who's a principal scientist. Doug. Thanks, Lawrence. Hey, thanks, Doug. Thank you very much. All right. Day three, we're getting there. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug. Uh, I am a research scientist at Google working on a project called Magenta. And so before we talk about modeling the entire known universe, so we talk about robots, I want to talk to you a little bit about music and art and how to use uh, machine learning potentially for expressive purposes. So um, I want to talk uh, first about a drawing project called SketchRNN, where we trained a neural network to do something as important as draw the pig that you see on the right there. And uh, I want to use this as an example to actually highlight a few, I think, important uh, machine learning concepts that we're finding to be crucial for using machine learning in the context of art and music. So let's dive in. This is going to be, get a little technical, but uh, hopefully it'll be fun for you all. What we're going to do is try to learn to draw not by generating pixels, but actually by generating pen strokes. And I think this is a very interesting representation to use because it's very close to what we do when we draw. So specifically, we're going to take the data from the very popular quick draw game, 
playing Pictionary against a machine learning algorithm. And that was captured as delta x, delta y, movements of the pen. We also know when the pen is put down on the page and when the pen is lifted up. Okay? And we're going to treat that as our training domain. One thing what I would notice is that, um, or observe, is that we didn't necessarily need a lot of this data. What's nice about the data is that it fits the creative process. It's closer to drawing, I argue, than pixels are to drawing. It's actually modeling the movement of the pen. Now, what we're going to do with these drawings is we're going to push them through something called an autoencoder. What you're seeing on the left, the encoder network's job is to take those strokes of that cat and encode them in some way so that they can be stored as a latent vector, the yellow box in the middle. The job of the decoder is to decode that latent vector back into a generated sketch. And the very important point, in fact, the only point that you really need to take away from this talk is that that latent vector is worth everything to us. First, it's smaller in size than the encoded or decoded drawing, so it can't memorize everything. And because it can't memorize, we actually get some nice effects. For example, you might notice, if you look carefully, that the cat on the left, which is actual data, and has been pushed through the trained model and decoded, is not model and decoded, is not the same as the cat on the right. Right? The cat on the left has five whiskers, but the model regenerated the sketch with six whiskers. Why? Because that's what it usually sees. Six whiskers is general. It's normal to the model, whereas five whiskers is hard for the model to make sense of. So this idea of having a tight, uh, low-dimensional representation, this latent vector, that's been trained on lots of data, the goal is that this model might learn to find some of the generalities in a drawing, learn general strategies for creating something. So here's an example of starting each of the four corners with a drawing done by a human, David, the first author. And those are encoded in the corners. And now we just move linearly around the space, not the space of the strokes, but the space of the latent vector. And if you look closely, what I think you'll see is that the movements and the changes from these faces, say from left to right, are actually quite smooth. The model has dreamt up all of those faces in the middle, yet to my eye, they, they really do kind of fill the space of possible drawings. Finally, as I pointed out with the cat whiskers, these models generalize, not memorize. It's not that interesting to memorize a drawing. It's much more interesting to learn general strategies for drawing. And so we see that with the five to six whiskered cat. I think more interestingly, and I think it's also suggestive, we also see this with doing something like taking a model that's only seen pigs and giving it a picture of a truck. And what's that model going to do? It's going to find a pig truck, because that's all it knows about, right? And if that seems silly, which I grant it is, in your own mind, think about how, how hard it would be, at least for me, if someone says, draw a truck that looks like a pig. It's actually kind of hard to make that transformation, and uh, these models do it. Finally, um, <laughs> by the way, they, 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 I, I get paid to do this. I just want to point that out as an aside. So um, <laughs> I, you know, it's kind of nice. I said that last year. It's still true. Um, OK, so these latent space analogies, another example of what's happening in these latent spaces. Obviously, if you add and subtract pen strokes, you're not going to get far with making something that's, uh, that's recognizable. But if you have a look at the, uh, these latent space analogies, we take the latent vector for a cat head, and we add a pig body and we subtract the pig head. And of course, it stands to reason that you should get a cat body. And we can do the same thing in reverse. And this is real data. This actually works. And the reason I mention it is it shows that the, these latent space models are learning some of the geometric relations between uh, the forms that people draw. I'm going to switch gears now and move from uh, drawing to music uh, and talk a little bit about a model called nSynth, which is a neural network synthesizer that takes audio and learns to generalize in the space of music. You may have seen from the uh, beginning of uh, I.O. Uh, with bathing that uh, this has been put into a hardware unit called nSynth Super. How many people have heard of nSynth Super? How many people want an nSynth Super? Good. OK, well, that's possible, as you know. Um, OK, so I want to, for those of you that didn't see the opening, I, I have a short version of um, the making of the nSynth Super. I'd like to roll that now to give you guys a better idea of what this model is up to. Um, let's, let's roll it. That's like wild to me. Here's a flu. Here's a snare. I guess in the middle, this is what it sounds like. Now, it does feel like we're turning a corner of what could be new possibilities. It could generate a sound that might inspire us. Thank you. 
the fun part is like, even though you think you know what you're doing, there's some weird interaction happening that can give you something totally unexpected. Why? Wait, why did that happen that way? <laughs> okay, so what you see here, uh, by the way, the last person with the long hair was Jesse Engel, who was the, the main scientist on the Ensign project. This uh, grid that you're seeing, this uh, uh, square, where you can move around the space is exactly the same idea as we saw with those faces. So the idea is that you're moving around the latent space and you're able to discover sounds that hopefully have some similarity and because they're made up of um, learning what makes humans, you know, how sound works for us, in the same way as a pig truck, um, gives us maybe some new ideas about um, how sound works. And as you probably know, you can make these yourself, which I think is, in my, my mind, my favorite part about the Ensign Super Project is that this is uh, open source GitHub. Uh, for those of you who are makers and like to tinker, please give it a shot. If not, we'll see some coming uh, available um, from tons of people who are building them on their own. So I want to keep going with music, but I want to move away from audio. And I want to move now to uh, musical scores, you know, musical notes, something that, you know, think of last night with, with Justice driving a sequencer, um, and talk about basically the same idea, which is can we learn a latent space where we can move around what's possible in, in, in a musical note, or a musical score, rather. So what you see here is uh, some three-part musical thing on the top and some one-part musical thing on the bottom, and then finding in a latent space something that's in between. Okay? And now I put the faces underneath this. What you're looking at now is a, uh, a representation of a musical drum score where uh, time is passing left to right. And what we're going to see is we're going to start, I'm going to play this for you. It's, it's a little bit long, so I want to set this up. We're going to start with a drum beat, a, one measure of drums, and we're going to end with one measure of drums. And you're going to hear those first. You're going to hear A and B. And then you're going to hear this latent space model try to figure out how to get from A to B. And everything in between is made up by the model in exactly the same way that the faces in the middle are made up by the model. So as you're listening, basically listen for whether it makes musical sense or not, the, the intermediate drums. Let's give it a roll. There you have it. <laughs> Moving right along, uh, it turns out, uh, take a look at this command. Um, this makes sense to some of you, maybe. We were surprised to learn after a year of doing Magenta that this is not the right way to work with musicians and artists. Uh, I know, I laughed too, but we really thought, hey, it's a great idea, guys. It's like, paste this into terminal. And they're like, what's terminal? And then you know you're in trouble, right? Okay. So um, we've, we've moved quite a bit towards trying to build uh, tools that musicians can use. Uh, this is a drum machine, actually, that you can play with online, um, built around uh, tensorflow.js. And I have a short clip of, of this being used. What you're going to see is all the red is from you as a musician. You can play around with it. And then the blue is generated by the model. So let's give this a roll. This one's quite a bit shorter. So this is available for you as a code pen, which uh, allows you to play around with the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript. And 
really amazing. A huge shout out to Taro uh, Parviainen, who, who did this. He grabbed uh, one of our trained Magenta models, and he used TensorFlow.js, and he hacked a bunch of code to make it work, and he put it out on Twitter, and we had no idea this was happening. And then um, we reached out to him. I reached out to him on Twitter. I was like, Taro, you're my hero. This is awesome. And he's like, oh, you guys care about this? I'm like, yeah, of course we care about this. This is our dream, to have people, not just us, playing with this technology. So I love it that we've gotten there. Um, so part of what I want to talk about today, actually close with, um, we've cleaned up a lot of the code. In fact, Teru helped. And we've now, we're able to introduce Magenta.js, which is um, very tightly integrated with TensorFlow.js. And it allows you, for example, to grab a checkpointed model and set up a player and start sampling from it. So in three lines of code, you can set up a little drum machine or music sequencer. And we're also doing the same thing with SketchRNN, so we have the art side as well. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of demos driven by this, a lot of really interesting work, both by Googlers and by people from the outside. And I think it highly aligns well with what we're doing in Magenta. So to close, um, we're doing research in generative models. We're working to engage with musicians and artists. Um, very happy to see the JavaScript stuff come along, which is really seems to be the language for that. Um, hoping to see better tools come and heavy engagement with the open source community. Um, if you want to learn more, please uh, visit g.co slash magenta. Um, also, um, you can follow my Twitter account. I post regular updates and try to be a connector for that. So that's what I have for you. And now I'd like to switch gears and go to robots. Very exciting. Um, with my colleague from Google Brain, Vincent Vanuk. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Doug. So my name is Vincent, and I lead the um, um, Brain uh, Robotics Research Team, the robotics research team at Google. We, when you think about robots, uh, you may think about um, precision and control. You may think about robots you know, that live in factories. Um, they've got one very specific job to do, and they've got to do it over and over again. But as you saw in the keynote earlier, more and more robots are about people. Right? They're self-driving cars that are driving in our streets, interacting with people. They essentially now live in our world, not their world. And so they, they really have to adapt and perceive the world around them and learn how to operate in this human-centric environment. Right? So how do we get robots to learn instead of having to program them. Um, this is what we've been embarking on. And it turns out we can get robots to learn. It takes a lot of robots. It takes a lot of time. Um, and, but we can uh, actually improve on this if we teach robots how to behave collaboratively. So this is an example of a, a team of robots that are um, learning together how to do a very simple task, like grasping objects. Right? At, the at the beginning, they have no idea what they're doing. Um, they try and try and try, and sometimes they will grasp something. Every time they grasp something, we give them a reward. And over time, they get better and better at it. Of course, we use deep learning for this. Um, we basically have a convolutional network that maps those images that uh, the robots see of the workspace in front of them to actions and possible actions. And this collective learning of robots enables us to get to levels of performance that we haven't seen before. But it takes a lot of robots. And in fact, you know, this is Google. We would much rather use lots of computers if we could instead of lots of robots. And so the question becomes, could we actually use a lot of ro simulated robots, virtual robots, to do this kind of uh, task and teach those robots uh, to perform tasks? And would it actually matter in the real world? Would they, what, what they learn in simulation actually apply to real tasks? Um, and it turns out the key to making this work is to learn simulations that are more and more faithful to reality. So, on the right here, you see uh, what a typical simulation of a robot would look like. This is a virtual robot trying to grasp objects in simulation. What you see um, on the other side here may look like a real robot doing the same task. But in fact, it is completely simulated as well. We've learned a, a machine learning model that maps those simulated images to real images to real-looking images that are essentially indistinguishable from what a real 
uh, robot would see in the real world. And by using this kind of data in a simulated environment and training a simulated model to uh, accomplish tasks using those images, we can actually transfer that information and make it work in the real world as well. So there's lots of things we can do with uh, these kinds of simulated robots. Uh, this is Rainbow Dash, our favorite little pony. Um, and what you see here, here is him taking his very first steps, and, or very first hops, I should say. He's very good for somebody who's just starting to learn how to walk. And the way we accomplish this is by having a virtual Rainbow Dash running in simulation. We train it using deep reinforcement learning to uh, run around in the simulator. And then we can only basically download the model that we've learned in the simulation onto the real robot and actually make it work in the real world as well. There are many ways we can scale up robotics and robotic learning in this way. One of the key ingredients turns out to be learning by itself, self-supervision, self-learning. This is an example of, for example, um, what you see at the top here is somebody driving a car. And um, what we're trying to learn in this instance is the 3D structure of the world, the geometry of everything. The, the, what you see at the bottom here is um, a representation of how far things are from the car. Right? You probably are looking at avoiding obstacles and looking at uh, other cars uh, to not collide with them. And so you want to learn about the 3D geometry based on those videos. The traditional way that you would do this is uh, by involving, for example, a 3D camera or a LiDAR or something that gives you a sense of depth. Uh, here we're going to do none of that. We're going to simply look at the video and learn directly from the video the 3D structure of the world. And the way to do this is to look at the video and try to predict the future of this video. You can imagine that if you actually understand the 3D geometry of the world, you can do a pretty good job at predicting what's going to happen next in a video. So we're going to use that signal that tells us how well we're doing at predicting the future to learn what the 3G geometry of the world looks like. So at the end of the day, what we end up with is yet another big convolutional network that maps what you see at the top to what you see at the bottom without involving any 3D camera or anything like that. This idea of self-learning or just learning without any supervision directly from the data is really, really powerful. Um, another problem that we have when we're trying to teach robots how to do things is that we have to communicate to them what we want, what we care about. Right? And the best way you can do that is by simply showing them what you want them to perform. So here is an example of one of my colleagues basically doing the robot dance. And a robot that is just looking at uh, him performing those tasks and trying to imitate visually what he is doing. And what's remarkable here is that you know, even though the robot, for example, doesn't have legs, it tries to do this crouching motion as best it can, given the degrees of freedom that it has available. And all of this is learned entirely self-supervised. The way we go about this is that if you think about imitating somebody else, for example, somebody pouring a glass of uh, water or a can of Coke, um, it all relies on you being able to look at them from a third party view and picturing yourself doing the same thing from your point of view, what it would look like if you did the same thing yourself. Right? So we collected some of this data that looks like that, where you have somebody looking at somebody else do a task, and you end up with those two videos of one taken by the person doing the task and another one taken by another person. And what we want to teach the robots is that those two things are actually the same thing. So we're going to use, again, machine learning to perform this matchup. We're going to have a, a machine learning model that is going to tell us, OK, this image on the left is actually of the same task as this image on the right. And once we've learned that correspondence, there are lots of things we can do with this. One of them is just imitation like this. Imagine you have somebody pouring a glass of water. The robot sees them. 
They try to picture themselves doing the same task and try best they can to imitate what they're doing. And so using, again, deep reinforcement learning, we can train robots to learn those kinds of activities completely uh, based on visual observation without any programming of any kind. So I won't let that robot pour me a beer quite yet, but it's very encouraging that we can just look have robots that understand essentially what the nature, uh, what the fundamentals of the task is, regardless of whether they're pouring a liquid or they're pouring beads or whatever the uh, um, glasses look like or the containers. All of that is abstracted, and the robot actually really understands deeply what the task is about. So I'm very excited about this whole perspective on teaching robots how to learn instead of having to program them. Right? At some point, I would want to be able to tell my Google Assistant, hey, OK, Google, please go fold my laundry. Right? And for that to happen, we're going to have to uh, rebuild the science of robotics from the ground up. We're going to have to um, base it on understanding and machine learning and perception. And of course, we're going to have to do that uh, at Google scale. So with that, I'm going to give the stage to Debbie, who is going to talk to us about cosmology. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Debbie Bard. I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different uh, from what you've heard so far. Uh, so I lead the Data Science Engagement Group at NERSC. Now, NERSC is the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. Uh, we're a supercomputing center up at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just over the bay from here. Uh, we are the Mission Computing Center for the Department of Energy Office of Science. And what this means is that we have something like 7,000 scientists uh, using our supercomputers to work on some of the biggest questions in science today. Um, and what I think is really cool as well is that I get to work with some of the most powerful computers on the planet. Um, one of the things that we're noticing, especially in the last couple of years, is we've seen that uh, scientists are increasingly turning to deep learning and machine learning methods to solve some of these big questions that they're working on. And we're seeing these questions showing up um, in our workload on our supercomputers. So I want to focus on one uh, particular topic area. It's very close to my heart. Uh, which is cosmology, uh, because I'm a cosmologist by training. Uh, my background is in uh, cosmology research, because I've always been interested in the really the most fundamental questions that we have um, in science uh, about the nature of the universe. And perhaps one of the most uh, basic questions you can ask about the universe is, what is it made of? Um, and these days, we have a fairly good feel for um, how much dark energy there is in the universe, how much dark matter, how much regular matter there is in the universe. And there's only about 5% of regular matter, um, which is everything that you and I and all the stars and all the dust and all the gas and all the galaxies out there, they're made of regular matter. And that makes up a pretty tiny proportion um, of the contents of the universe. The thing that I find really interesting is um, we don't, just don't know what the rest of it is. Dark matter, um, we don't know um, what that's made of, but we see indirectly the gravitational effect it has. Dark energy, we don't know what that is at all. That was only recently discovered about 15 years ago. Um, and dark energy is just the name that we give to an observation, which is the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, and this is, I think, really exciting. The fact that um, there is so much that we have yet to discover means that there are tremendous possibilities for um, new ways for us to understand our universe. And uh, we are building a bigger and better telescopes. We're collecting data all the time, um, taking images and observations of the sky uh, to uh, get more data to help us understand this. Um, because we only have one universe to observe, so we need to be able to collect as much data as we can on that universe, and we need to be able to extract all the information we can uh, from our data, from our observations. And cosmologists are increasingly turning to deep learning uh, to extract meaning from our data, and I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways uh, that we're doing that. But first of all, I want to kind of ground this in the background of how we actually do um, 
experiments in cosmology, because cosmology is not an experimental science uh, in the way that many other physical sciences are, because there's not a lot we can do to experiment with the universe. We can't really do much uh, to change the nature of space-time, although it would be fun if we could. Uh, but instead, we have to run uh, simulations. So we run uh, simulations uh, in supercomputers of theoretical universes um, under different physical models, under different parameters that control those physical models. And that's how we experiment. We run these simulated universes, and then we compare the outputs of these simulations to our observations of the real universe around us. Um, so when we make this comparison, we're typically using uh, some statistical measure, some kind of reduced uh, statistic like the power spectrum. Um, which is uh, illustrated in this animation here. The power spectrum is a um, measure of how matter is distributed throughout the universe, uh, whether it's kind of distributed fairly evenly throughout space or whether it's clustered on small scales. And this is uh, illustrated in uh, this, uh, the images on the top of the slide here, which are snapshots of a simulated universe um, run in a, uh, a supercomputer. Um, and you can see that over time, gravity is pulling matter together. Um, so that's dark matter and regular matter. Gravity is acting upon that, collapsing the matter into um, these very typical cluster and filamentary type structures, whereas dark energy is expanding space itself, expanding the volume um, of, the, of this uh, miniature universe. And so by looking at the distribution of matter, um, we can start to learn something about the nature of the matter itself, um, how gravity is acting on that, and uh, what dark energy is doing. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, running these kinds of simulations is very computationally expensive. Even if you're only simulating a tiny universe, uh, it still requires a tremendous amount of compute power. And we uh, spend uh, billions of compute hours on supercomputers around the world on these kinds of simulations, including uh, the supercomputers that I work with. And one of the ways that we're using deep learning um, is to uh, reduce the need for such expensive simulations. Uh, similar to the previous speaker was talking about, Vincent's talking about with robotics, um, we're exploring using generative networks to produce, um, in this case, this example, uh, two-dimensional maps of the universe. So these are two-dimensional maps of the mass concentration of the universe. So you can imagine the three-dimensional volume uh, collapsed into a two-dimensional projection um, of the mass um, density in the universe as you're looking out at the sky. And we use a, a GAN, uh, which is based on a fairly standard uh, DC GAN uh, topology, to produce new maps um, of uh, these new mass maps based on uh, simulations. Uh, so this is an augmentation. We're using uh, this network to augment um, an existing simulation to produce new maps. Um, and we see that it's doing a pretty good job. So just by looking by eye at the generated images, they look pretty similar to the real input images, the real simulated images. But as a scientist, kind of squinting at something and saying, oh, yeah, that looks about right, is not good enough. Um, what I want is to be able to quantify this, to be able to quantify how well the network is working and quantify how um, like the real images our generated images are. And this is, I think, where scientific data has a real advantage compared to natural image data. Um, because uh, scientific data usually, uh, very often, has associated statistics with it. So statistics that you can use to evaluate the success uh, of your model. So in this case, um, we were looking at um, reduced statistics um, that describe the patterns in the, the maps, uh, like the power spectra and other measures of the uh, topology of the maps. And we see that um, not only do the maps look about right, but the, um, the statistics that are contained in those maps match those from the real simulations. So we can quantify the accuracy of our network. And this is something that potentially could be useful for the wider deep learning community. Um, using scientific data that has these associated statistics could be of real interest, I think, to deep learning practitioners um, in trying to quantify how well your networks are working. Uh, so I mentioned before that this is an augmentation uh, GAN that we've been working on so far. Um, it can produce new maps um, based on a physics model that it's already seen. And we're working at scaling this up and producing physics models uh, that the network has never seen before, so making this into a true emulator. Um, and this will uh, help reduce the need for these very uh, computationally expensive simulations and allow cosmologists to explore parameter space a bit more freely. Um, and I'd like to explore a little bit further what this network is actually learning. Um, I saw a really interesting talk this morning here um, that was touching on this kind of thing, how we can use um, 
uh, machine learning to gain insights into the nature of the data that we're working with. Um, so in the work that I'm showing here, we were looking at uh, which structures in our mass maps are contributing to the model, and most strongly contributing to the model, by looking at a quantity called saliency. Um, and so by, uh, if you look at the map of saliency, which is the black and white image here, you can see that the peaks in the saliency map correspond to peaks in the mass map. Um, and so these peaks in the mass map, these are concentrations of matter, and these correspond to galaxy clusters, typically, uh, in the real universe. And this isn't news to cosmologists. Um, we've known for decades that galaxy clusters are a really good way of exploring cosmology. Um, but the shapes of the features that this network have learned are not you know, nice round Gaussian balls. They are irregular, and they're showing some structure. And this is something that's really interesting to me. And there's also um, indications that some of the smaller mass concentrations are showing up as important features in this network. And that's perhaps a little bit unexpected. Um, so by taking this kind of introspection into the features that our network is learning, we can start to learn something about the data and get insight into some of the physical um, processes that are going on um, in our data and learn what kind of structures perhaps are most sensitive to the interplay of gravity and dark energy. I think this is something that's a real, uh, a real strong point of deep learning when you are allowing the network to learn features for itself rather than imposing features, doing feature engineering, or telling it any particular statistics. You can allow the, the network to tell you something about your data that might surprise you. So far, um, that was looking at two-dimensional maps. Um, but of course, the universe is not a two-dimensional place. Um, it's at least four dimensions. Uh, perhaps many more dimensions, depending on your favorite model of string theory. Um, but we've been looking at three dimensions as scaling this up another, another level. Um, and what, the reason why three dimensions are interesting from us from a computational point of view, because in a three-dimensional data volume, you're looking at three-dimensional matrices, three-dimensional convolutions. This is something that's computationally expensive, and it's something that can run really well on a supercomputing architecture. So a team at CMU recently demonstrated for the first time uh, that deep learning can be used to determine the physical model of the universe from three-dimensional simulations of the full matter distribution. So this is um, the full uh, three-dimensional matter rather than a two-dimensional projection of the matter density. Um, and this work showed uh, that the network was able to make significantly better estimates of the parameters that describe the physics of uh, the simulated universe compared to traditional methods. Um, where you might be looking at one of these statistics like the power spectrum. Um, and so uh, this is a really nice example of how the network was able to learn um, what structures in this three-dimensional um, matter volume were important rather than just looking at uh, statistics that we in advance thought was going to be useful. So we're working on scaling this up at the moment in collaboration with NERSC, uh, UC Berkeley, Intel, and Cray, who are our industry partners at NERSC. Um, we're using larger simulation volumes, uh, even more data, and we're using uh, TensorFlow running on thousands of CPU nodes, um, achieving several petabytes, uh, petaflops of performance on Cori, which is our flagship supercomputer. But perhaps the most important part of this is that we're able to predict more physical parameters with even greater accuracy by scaling up the training of this. And this is something that we're really excited about. Um, and I think it's worth talking a little bit more in technical detail about how we achieve this performance, how we are using TensorFlow on our supercomputers to get this kind of performance and get this kind of insight into our data and into our science. Now, supercomputers are fairly specialized. Um, we have uh, specialized hardware uh, to allow the tens of thousands of compute nodes we have on these supercomputers to act together as one compute machine. We want to use this machine as efficiently as possible to train our network. We have a lot of performance available to us. And we want to be able to take advantage of that when we're running uh, TensorFlow. So the approach we take uh, is using a fully synchronous uh, data parallel approach, where each node is training on a subset of the data. Uh, and we started off, as many people do, using uh, gRPC for this, where um, each compute node is communicating with a parameter server um, to send their parameter updates and, and have that sent back and forward. But uh, like many other people have noted, uh, this is not a very efficient way to run at scale. Um, we found that if we were running beyond 100 nodes or so, um, then we had a real communication bottleneck between the compute nodes and the parameter servers. 
So instead, um, we use MPI, which is a message passing interface, to allow our compute nodes to communicate with each other directly, so removing the need for parameter servers. Um, and um, this is also has the advantage that it can really take advantage of our high-speed interconnect, um, the specialized hardware that connects our compute nodes. Um, so we use, uh, for gradient aggregation, for this we use a specialized uh, MPI Collective All Reduce, which is designed by Cray, um, who are um, our partners with our supercomputers. Um, and this uh, uh, MPI All Reduce um, is, is, is pretty neat. It's able to avoid imbalances in node performance, the straggler effect that some of you might run into. Um, it's overlapping communication and compute in a way that um, allows very effective scaling. And we've seen that we're able to run TensorFlow on thousands of compute nodes with very little drop in efficiency. And something that I've uh, been really excited to see here is that um, MPI All Reduce um, is coming soon in TensorFlow. And we're excited to see how this is going to work in the larger community. So the three things I'd like you to take away from this talk, the first is that cosmology has some really cool science problems and some really cool deep learning problems. The second is that scientific data is different from natural image data. Um, and so these well-understood statistics that we often have associated with the scientific data could be of real use, I think, in the deep learning community. And the third thing is that MPI All Reduce, in uh, our experience, is the optimal strategy for scaling TensorFlow up to multiple nodes. And we're looking forward to seeing how the rest of the community is going to work with this. Uh, so now I'm turn things back to Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Great stuff, actually simulating universes. So uh, we're running very short on time, so I just want to share. These are like just three great stories, but there are countless more stories out there. This is a map that I created of people who've starred TensorFlow and GitHub and who've shared their location. And we have people from the outback of Australia to the green fields of Ireland, to, from the North uh, Arctic Circle in, in Norway all the way down to Deception Island in Antarctica. There are countless stories being created, countless great new things being done with TensorFlow and with machine learning. We think some of those stories are yours. And if they are, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear them and we'd love to share them. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much for attending today. Day. Enjoy what's left of I.O. and have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session.
Hey there everybody, Todd Kerpelman here at the accessibility section of the Sandbox and I am joined by Patrick Clary who is a product manager here at Google. Hi Patrick. Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty well. So um, tell us what's going on here at the accessibility Sandbox. Yeah, so in the Sandbox we're doing various things. Um, we're showing demos of liftware, we're showing off some of our wheelchair accessible transit directions we have in Google Maps, we're showing off our automated captioning for YouTube, we're doing accessibility design reviews over here, and we're also showing a brand new product which we announced yesterday called Lookout. Oh, and, and what is Lookout? Tell me more about that. So Lookout is a product for users who are blind and low vision, and the goal is to help them become aware of physical objects and the space around them. For example, people that might be present, uh, text in their environment, and also physical objects or products. Can we, can we see a demo of Lookout uh, telling us what's in our environment? Yeah, let's, let's do that. So I have the app here, and I'll go ahead and select the icon. And then for this, I'll, expect, I'll select an experimental mode, because that's kind of fun, right? And we'll see what it shows. Drink with text NB18 NOND. ISVO I'm on. So it detected some text on that and it read it out. As you can see, it said Murphy, which is the brand of wine we have here. Let me point it at this glass and see what it does. Wine glass at 12 o'clock. So what else can you do with Lookout? Well, one interesting about Lookout is it's designed to basically be worn. So we can put it in a lanyard like this. And this allows the user to be hands-free and just engage in their activity. Um, and there's controls that facilitate this. So for example, if I want to start recognition, I can knock on the device. And then if I want to pause recognition, I can cover the camera. There we go. And uh, if, if I'm interested in trying Lookout, where would I be able to get it? Yeah, so we'll be rolling out to trusted testers uh, pretty soon here. And you can go to google.com slash accessibility uh, to sign up for a trusted tester spot. And then later this year, we'll be pushing it to the Play Store. All right, so uh, be on the lookout. Ha, see what I did there? Uh, be on the lookout for Lookout coming soon to a Play Store near you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the tour. Yeah, my pleasure. Welcome to Google I.O.'s Main Street. I'm Timothy. I'm Florina. I'm still Todd. And <laughs> we're going to go have some fun. Fun! So how's your I.O. been? Amazing. What's been the favorite, your favorite thing you've seen so far? Uh, I think that the session on artificial intelligence and creativity. Flow.js, TensorFlow.js, and Node.js, which has been launched today. Awesome stuff. You're a JavaScript programmer, I take it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. <laughs> I actually run and organ, uh, organize a uh, meetup in Bucharest, Bucharest.js. Awesome, that's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. So that's super exciting for us. What about you? Uh, I think the Future of AI session this morning it was uh, very interesting. What's been your favorite session so far? session on MLKit. I'm over the moon excited about this um, for our product, which is called NativeScript. So building mobile apps with JavaScript and using ML on device, unbelievable. I think the, the one that I just saw with Progressive Web Starter Kit on Polymer, uh, it was given by uh, Monica. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. She had like a game in the presentation and you had to go up a level and really cool graphics. Uh, so I have been following John Maida for like the longest time ever and I had no idea, no, I mean kind of creepily, and I had no idea that he was going to be here and I saw on the schedule that he was here and I immediately went and he talked about um, designing towards inclusion and how important um, bringing technology to the remote sectors and having remote workers is and it was extremely uh, exciting and um, I was very happy to see him here so that was fantastic. That's why in Batman v Superman, Batman's always going to win. Because brains always breeds brawn. Is that true? I think so. generally true. My favorite thing? This right here. Because I think my favorite thing about Google I.O. is when people from around the world gather in a single place with shared interests and get to talk about the future. There's a lot of focus on like diversity. I mean, even the speakers and the audience, like it's a really diverse audience, it's great. I, I think I never saw 
an audience so diverse at the conference, so it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I think we all agree that it looks like a festival with programmers. Not necessarily a conference, but a festival, right? What was your favorite non-session thing? Uh, the, the, the arcade night. Yeah, definitely the arcade last night. Did home. you see the the pinball machine yeah. made out of balloons? Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. There was like a balloon animal dude, and he made a pinball machine. Yeah, that's that's good. So, what is your favorite non-session thing about I/O this year? Yeah, it's it's this hanging out with people that we like, you know, sitting in on the lawn and just chatting. Yeah, so we have a huge community of GDEs and we had a really unique opportunity to see kind of a bunch of them in one place. So it was really awesome. Experimental music was pretty awesome. Crazy. The future music? Yeah, the one right here. Awesome. That's where I was. But my favorite thing was the bouncy world. You know, like the Andrea Andre suits fighting. Like, it was hilarious. Oh. It was like those yeah, sumo, like suits. sumo suits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're androids. It was crazy. I mean, I think I left for about half an hour. Yeah. So are you all going to come back next year? Definitely. Awesome. Well, we'll see you then. Thank you so much. We hope that you've had just as much fun as we had. And uh, we'll see you in either the next video or right back here at Google I.O. 2019. Bye. Bye. It's been a fun three days with all of you here at Shoreline Amphitheater for Google I.O. 2018. We've checked out a lot of really cool in-person experiences that you might have missed if you just tuned in for the session videos. If you want to experience all the fun again or for the first time and at your own speed, go to g.co slash io slash guide. To learn more about Google Developer Products, make sure to fill out a form at g.co slash dev slash form. I look forward to seeing you all next year on site and online for Google I.O. 2019. Until then, make good things together. I'm Timothy Jordan. From all of us here at Google, goodbye from I.O. 2018.